in the evening. And the first session that we are beginning with, which I think is very close to my heart and Dr. Uh, Khatib's heart as well, is about neurotech uh, in uh, our field of neuroscience. I'm coming from neurosurgery, so obviously I'll be talking about use of neurotech uh, in neurosurgery. So I'll be kicking off this session with my talk first, followed by my good friend Giuseppe, who will be going next. Um, so, uh, as you can see on the screen, uh, my talk is on the validation of mixed reality for use in neurosurgery. Uh, I'm Swati, as I said, I'm currently going to start as an associate consultant in neurosurgery in Singapore, but currently I'm based in UK as a clinical fellow in neurotrauma uh, at Cambridge in Addenbrooke's Hospital. Uh, just to introduce everybody, I do have given part of this talk before in sessions of SBMT, but I think just to get everybody on board, I'll go through what mixed reality actually means. Um, so just to give you guys a bit of a background, especially for people who are, aren't from neurosurgery, so basically, as you know, uh, we use GPS navigation to do a lot of our work, and for better part of my life as a trainee, and I think for the last 20 years, nothing actually has changed where neural navigation is concerned. It has been about 2D projection of images, as you can see on the screen. So we as neurosurgeons look on a different screen while we are operating on the patients to make sure we get the location of the tumor or get the location of the pathology absolutely correct. I think mixed reality is something very exciting. The pictures look very interesting. You know, it's like playing Pokemon Go on your phone if you know what about that game. But basically, it's been mostly used for education, but not so much in the operating theater. Some of the studies have assessed its accuracy, but I think it's still up for debate. Um, the background, so basically it first started with virtual reality, which was in the 1990s. We started having augmented reality, but this was mainly for gaming purposes. And it's not until more recently where we have combined the two to give us this concept of mixed reality. So basically mixed reality, this definition is actually taken up from Wikipedia, so which says that it's merging of the real and the virtual world to produce new environments and visualization where the physical and the digital objects actually coexist and interact in real time. So it's not about looking at your phone, it's not about looking on a screen, but it's actually looking through your eyes where you see the mixed reality image and at the same time you're interacting in the real world. Um, so I'm, I'm very glad that I've actually worked with some of the pioneers in mixed reality in neurosurgery. And uh, as you can see, the third name on this, um, this paper that was published very early on in the early 2000s is Prof Yo, which is my head of the department back in Singapore. But obviously, you know, it was the same thing. It picked up, people got very excited, but nothing came out of it and everything kind of died down. So this was one of the first systems that was first used in neurosurgery, which was called the Virtual Intracranial Visualization of Visualization and Navigation, and they named it Vivian. I'm not sure why they chose Vivian, but, uh, but that was the very first system that came up. So this was some of the first images of Vivian. So as you can see, this was, this was purely a virtual reality system. This looks like the current robotics, but it was a dextroscope that was being developed based on this Vivian system. And it went up to Dextray, which was augmented reality, which obviously you had a device that helped you see a, a holographic image on a real patient. Um, this is some of the work that was done where they tried to use a mixed reality image of this sort, and this was the navigation tool that was being used. Uh, finally, this is where I come in, and, um, and I've been very, very glad and privileged that I have got the chance to work with mixed reality in neurosurgery. And the very first systems of mixed reality actually came from Microsoft, and it was the HoloLens first generation. Surprisingly, a lot of work was actually published, but it has since been discontinued because people just didn't pick it up. They didn't think that there was a need to use mixed reality in neurosurgery. But I think Microsoft didn't give up, which I think has been the theme of SBMT all this while, that you just push through. So they came up with Holo, uh, HoloLens 2, which is the second version where I have been involved in. And basically, it has been a new portable unit, and it allows a very easy mixed reality rendering. And basically, we have assessed it's used in surgical resection of supratentorial tumors. Um, just to give you guys a bit of an idea, I'm sorry I don't have the actual lens with me, but I could only come up with pictures. So this is how the lens actually looks like. Um, 
as you can see, this is me wearing the lens during a surgery. This surgery took about three hours and I wore the lens throughout the surgery. It just felt like wearing a piece of sunglasses, to be honest. Um, just to give you guys a bit of an idea, this is the tumor that we were targeting and very small, very deep-seated tumor. And what we did was to project the image onto the patient. So this is me looking at the patient with the HoloLens. And you can see the image of the patient over here with, uh, with the, the, the brain scan is being shown here. And to give you guys a bit more idea of how it looks like when I'm looking through the scans, I'm not sure if you guys can play the video for me. Yeah, okay, it works. So you can see what, this is my colleague wearing, uh, just using a normal neuro navigation pointer. And what I'm asking him to do is to point where he thinks where the tumor is. And I'm trying to see whether he's pointing at the correct tumor or not. And it's actually quite accurate. Sorry, the contrast is not the best. But basically his tip is right where the tumor is. And this is what I'm seeing through the scan. Uh, so it was the first, you know, very first case that I did. And I thought, you know, surface matching, it's pretty much accurate. But obviously, the localization depends upon what kind of surface matching we are dealing with. It was quite a light gear to wear. And I thought, you know, it was quite exciting to use. So I went ahead and tried to do a bit more cases. So as you can see, much larger tumor right on the surface of the brain. And we went ahead. So this is, again, me projecting onto the patient, as you can see. I can see the patient very well at the same time I see the tumor and this is the rest of the head being projected onto the patient. And as you can see, this is just the video again. The videos are a bit more exciting than just looking at the static image and I can slice the, I can slice the brain, sorry for the words, but that's the best I can use. Slice the brain in whichever way I want. I tried using it on spine, but obviously there was an issue with how the, brain, how the spine is scanned when the patient is in the scanner versus how the patient is actually positioned when the patient is actually in the theater. But you can see the rendering of the spine is pretty, pretty nice. You, know? you can see all the different vertebral bodies. You can see part of the ribs as well. And this was basically a 3D projection. Yeah? And I can, I'm trying to do the same thing, trying to look through the spine through different sides. And this is me trying to use trying to pick up the model of the spine to move it away. But as you can see, there's quite a bit of difficulty when it comes to spine. Okay, so I think that like we were talking about mental illness yesterday and patient education. And like I think Giuseppe mentioned that we have problems breaking news to patient and how can we get the patients involved in various aspects of neurosurgery. So this was where I got the patient to wear a HoloLens and try to get the patient to understand what it means having a vascular malformation in the patient. So as you can see, this is a big, what we call an arteriovenous malformation. And what I did, so this was in the theater where you can see I basically projected the image onto the patient and I was looking through the HoloLens to see how the vascular malformation actually looks like. And even for the patient, it was a very short learning curve. The patient actually told me that amongst all the discussions she has had with the neurosurgeons, this was the first time she actually understood what we were talking about because most of the time we are just showing them 2D images and it just doesn't make sense to them. And I personally felt there was very minimal fatigue when I used it for long hours during the surgery. But obviously the next case was whether we can validate its accuracy in use of neural navigation, which is where I wanted to uh, you know, talk about this uh, talk in this um, particular conference. So the software that I use is what we call the VSI software or the Virtual Surgery Intelligence. You have, the, you, know, you have the option of using any kind of software on the HoloLens uh, as long as it allows you to render the 3D images. And um, the other thing that I used is what we call the Rovina model, which is where I tried to see how accurate the rendering and the navigation is. So basically, I scanned the Rovina model, which is basically a hit that is used for teaching neurosurgical trainees. And we uploaded onto the current gold standard navigation system as well as the HoloLens. Uh, I'll show you some of the pictures. So this is how a scanned Rovina model looks like. This is what I did in the room where I clamped the model itself. This was in a supine position. This was in a lateral position because I wanted to verify in both um, uh, positionings. And this is how it looks like on the stealth. So this is me just putting the images on the stuff. This was a CT, this, sorry, this was a CT and this was an MRI. 
and this is me registering. So you can see the accuracy on the current gold standard systems is very high, only about an error of 0.9 millimeters. And this is what we want to achieve with the current neural navigation softwares. And just to, I, this graph is a bit hard to understand, but basically what I'm telling you guys is that this is when I assess the accuracy in a supine position using the CT. So this is what the accuracy of the CT scan was, like I showed you, 0.9 millimeters. This is what literature considers as acceptable, which is five millimeters. And you can see this was the difference when we even compared the current gold standard systems at different anatomical landmarks using the stealth. And the dotted line is actually the HoloLens comparing to the stealth system. So there's still a bit of error. And this is where we think is the, you know, it's still a question needs to be answered whether we can further improve the accuracy of HoloLens in using for neural navigation. I repeated the same things in lateral position using MR in the supine position. And just to let you know, at these landmarks where the error margin is a lot higher is the internal landmarks. And again, this was the MR in the lateral position. So in conclusion, so I don't delay the rest of the session with just HoloLens alone. So mixed reality, I feel in my mind, will eventually replace the neural navigation in the neurosurgical OR. It's excellent for education. As you can see, the videos look excellent. The videos are very beautiful, and it's very nice to study anatomy in a three-dimensional way rather than just the 2D way or even one-dimensional when you look on your textbooks. I think definitely further work is required to ensure its accuracy is similar to the current neural navigation systems. And I think one of the main roles where this will come into play is when we are talking about using in underdeveloped or developing countries where they do not have the funding to spend one million, two million US dollars to buy this very expensive neural navigation systems. The each HoloLens unit can be between 3,000 to 5,000 US dollars. You know, it's customizable, and obviously the cost will basically come from software, which I assume as the market gets more and more saturated with more people coming up with neural navigation softwares for HoloLens and mixed reality, the cost will continue to go down. And I think uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, my professor Yo, who has been my head during my entire neurosurgical trainee. Uh, definitely Prof. Adele Helmi, who has helped me with the neural navigation and the validation in Cambridge while I've been here. Uh, Prof. Niam and Yujia, who unfortunately couldn't be here due to manpower crunch back in Singapore, have been the one who gave me the first opportunity to use HoloLens in neurosurgery and let me lead this program in Singapore. I think that's my last slide. Thank you. And I think without delaying it further, I would like to invite the next person for the talk, uh, Dr. Giuseppe Omana, who I had the fortunate to meet him through the HoloLens and SVMT as well. And I'm looking forward to his talk on mixed reality in neurosurgery. Well, uh, good morning all, and first of all, I want to thank you to Dr. Tarker and to Uskwala University for this opportunity, and for sure, I want to thank to Dr. Kateb and also to Dr. Yamamoto for this incredible opportunity to share our ideas and projects in our uh, multi-specialty society and environment. So now I want to <clears throat> share with you our uh, experience in mixed reality neurosurgery that uh, was um, a journey um, that I really appreciate and that is never ending. And uh, today I want to show you about um, our uh, initial experience with uh, brain tumor and brain trauma and spine navigation that are the um, uh, the, the most uh, suitable uh, option for uh, mixed reality at the moment, <clears throat> and also of the future projects that I'm working with and uh, that I will be very happy to share with the SBNT family. And for sure, uh, our activity uh, has been and will be uh, the object of uh, congresses, publications, and editorial projects as well. Um, could you please start the, the videos, or four videos? So, uh, where is the pointer? Anyways.
Could you start the video? If possible. Next. Yeah, okay. Yes, uh, in these two videos uh, uh, above, uh, we have the uh, very uh, initial test with the <coughs> brain tumor navigation. Uh, as you can see here, there is the comparison between uh, the uh, mixed reality navigation using uh, CT scan and uh, MRI scan, and also the uh, standard navigation with the optical uh, brain lab navigation system. <clears throat> the, the difference, as uh, has been shown by Swati before, is basically uh, the familiarity that you can have with your data set because you can um, look at the, the patient and uh, you can appreciate what is inside uh, the tissue, uh, like a ghost. And also, uh, in this uh, video below, uh, you can see that uh, is green colored and this because in uh, the first uh, Holo Medicine Summit, um, Professor Baia, that is a general surgeon, showed that uh, using uh, a green or blue light environment, the quality of the image is much, um, much def uh, defined. So I started to use the green light that is available in our OR, and I confirmed that also in neurosurgery there is, there is this option, and also interestingly, it's possible to continue the, uh, to do uh, your surgery because it's possible to appreciate uh, the um, anatomic details intraoperatively and also the blood that, is, that assumes a uh, dark color but is still visible so you can continue you to perform your surgery in uh, the <clears throat> macroscopic uh, steps of the uh, approach, for example. And I think that is very sensitive, uh, even because um, uh, we have to be careful when we, we use um, uh, mixed reality uh, because the, at the moment uh, the hologram is not visible when the, the light is projected uh, in the same direction of the hologram. While in this way, using green light is still visible and is much uh, defined. Uh, mixed reality um, uh, was used in my experience also during my PhD program in uh, innovative technology for craniofacial surgery. And in particular, I uh, tried to um, show uh, the classification of Archer for anterior skull based fractures uh, with mixed reality rendering. Uh, you can see uh, in this video the rendering of, for the bone. Uh, with different kind of renderings and also uh, the um, uh, standard uh, CT scan data set that, that can be scrolled in all directions. And also uh, for the classification, as I mentioned, is more um, familiar, more um, clear to understand. Uh, in this video uh, on the right and above, uh, you can see the fracture of the frontal sinus that is possible to navigate, to go through it, and to understand the relation of the fractures with the healthy bone tissue and also uh, the, the, uh, the anatomical um, landmarks that you have to use to reconstruct the fracture. And about uh, head trauma, uh, I used mixed reality for uh, craniopathy planning. It was quite funny uh, because uh, I had also to acquire the data set of the uh, prosthesis. It was not so easy in the initial step, so I tried to fix the, the prosthesis somehow, but it didn't work. Uh, finally, I got a good result with silk wires that are not visible during scanning, so uh, I could obtain these results. Uh, this is uh, craniopathy for a young male <clears throat> after a car, um, uh, car accident. And I used uh, mixed reality to uh, have a good feeling of the perfect fitting of this custom-made, custom-bone craniopathy uh, with his anatomy. Um, mixed reality offers several uh, information additional to the standard um, protocols. For example, here you can appreciate this mixed reality rendering where are visible also the soft tissue, in particular the skin, the muscle, but also the scar. You can see uh, here the standard CT scan where 
you can only appreciate the fitting of the craniooplasty with the, with the bone. Um, for spine navigation, is a bit more complex because you have no surface landmarks. Um, while in the brain uh, navigation, you can use the nose, the ears, to have the correct overlapping. Uh, that is, anyways, a limitation because it's operator de dependent, so we have to improve this. But for spine navigation, is much uh, harder to find the correct overlapping of the patient. I try to uh, put a reference and acquire intraoperative x-rays of all cars. But also for this, we have to work to uh, merge the intraoperative images directly with the, uh, with the cloud that we use to create the hologram. And these are two videos more. But uh, anyways, OK. Um, this um, kind of navigation for spine surgery is uh, suitable, especially for complex procedures uh, where you have to be really familiar with the, the anatomy of the patient that is sometimes very hard to understand. Uh, this was a case of a patient with a cervical spondylodicitis and a previous surgery that was performed at another institution uh, that failed and with a spinal deformity. So we performed two more surgeries, anterior and posterior, with a four-level corpectomy. And we uh, had the opportunity to share this project uh, at the Well Cornell, and we got the second position as pe best, pe best paper award. And this was like uh, motivation to continue on this path. Uh, another important project that is ongoing and that I, that I for sure uh, will be happy to share with SBNTs uh, about informed consent. Uh, let me spend a few words about this because I really think that is very important um, because uh, uh, at least in many countries, uh, including Italy, uh, the medical issues, medical uh, liaison are mainly based on the a wrong informed consent. If you can prove to provide a, a comprehensive uh, informed consent, uh, the only uh, weakness uh, for you will be uh, malpractice. Uh, this means that if you can prove uh, to have a comprehensive informed consent, the costs of the insurance and all all the rest will be reduced sensitively. So we got uh, an ethical committee approval in Canada, thanks to the cooperation with uh, my dear friend, uh, Stefano Priola. And in the next months, we will start collecting data about this. Um, basically, we will share uh, the data set with the patient and family members. We will record all the video of this discussion. Uh, video and audio as well, and this file will be recorded uh, as long with the, the other clinical file of the patients and can be used during trials is, uh, if required. Um, uh, the informed consent has also the um, possibility to reduce the anxiety and, and the concern of, of the patient, and it's also another important point to be addressed. Uh, about neuroanatomy, this is another great and difficult, hard uh, project that uh, I, um, I already involved Dr. Kateb with. And this is about the use of hierarchical to, uh, CT scan. Uh, there is a great job of the team of Professor Lee about this. Uh, you can see that this, this is not an MRI, this is a CT scan with a cellular detail. Uh, the file is uh, so huge, we have to reduce it and to make it suitable for the, holo uh, the hologram rendering. And this will be uh, for sure a great option to create an holographic atlas of the neuroanatomy. It's not use f uh, suitable for uh, living patients uh, because the amount of dose is too high. But for sure, for educational purposes, we could have a tremendous impact, I think. Um, the, about the, the actual si uh, situation, the future goals, as uh, I mentioned before, 
at the moment we have the limitation of a um, operator dependent procedure because is, you have to manually uh, overlap the hologram of uh, the patient. Um, this could be also time consuming sometimes. It's not so reliable because it depends on your training with, um, with, the, with the HoloLens. So uh, in our OR, if you have a um, neural navigation system, it, most of us are, are confident with the, its use. While with mixed reality, you have to be trained with, but it's, I think is normal. And also we need uh, references for spine surgery, for our tools, and also for brain surgery, especially because after, because after draping are not uh, visible the cranial landmarks, so it's hard to check if the accuracy is, st is still there. About future goals, we have to increase the accuracy, the reproducibility, the integration with interoperative imaging, the use of references, and also uh, we uh, definitely need a dedicated clinical device. We cannot use this device for neurosurgery and also to appreciate our pictures at the seaside. Uh, this is another project that mm, with the, the use of multiple objects. I use this usually for one-step procedures for tumors invading the, the skull. Um, in this kind of procedure, we have to perform a craniotomy that is exactly the same of the prosthesis that we will put over the bone defect. And this is uh, an initial, uh, you know, uh, test. But uh, thanks to this, I uh, understood that we have to use this kind of option of multiple object visualization also for publishing, for example. And this is the other project ongoing about a full holographic paper that we'll try to publish soon, uh, where you can appreciate all the PDF file, the tables, pictures, and videos only using your, your HoloLens or other uh, mixed reality devices. And I think that could be uh, very interesting also for uh, the, every platform, every journal, to offer this option because it's very um, immersive when you have to uh, you learn new data, for example. Uh, of course, we try to publish something uh, to also uh, manage editorial projects about mixed reality in the several subspecialty on neurosurgery. And this is my email address, so if you have some ideas we can work together on, yeah, it's my pleasure. So, thank you. Thanks to uh, Dr. Giuseppe for the excellent talk. Uh, I think we'll reserve the questions towards the end of the talk. Uh, I'm very pleased to invite our next speaker, uh, Dr. Alwyn Sipsi. Uh, apologize if I don't pronounce it correctly. She's a medical doctor with the university, and her interests are bipolar disorder, TBI, neuroscience, and AI. And I think her topic is precision medicine, use of AI in neuromodulation. Dr. Alwyn, please. Falcon uh, Sorkin. <laughs> Uh, welcome, Sorke. I'm working in our hospital and uh, affiliated with Iskadar University. I will just try to um, introduce some perspective related to neuromodulation. We are actually using uh, TMS and deep TMS in our uh, hospital, and also we are using TDGS. Uh, and here I will just try to uh, give a perspective what's going on, uh, what will happen. Uh, this is actually a direction for us. Uh, for the far future. Um, neuromodulation is alteration of nerve activity through a targeted delivery of stimulus, uh, such as electric stimulation or chemical agents, to specific neurological sites in the body. Uh, for the future, um, it's expected as said as five to ten years. Integration of adaptive network neuromodulation with predictive artificial intelligence and automatically adjusted by brain and external um, and these are will be controlled by closed based applications and 
They will be just done by face approach, culminate in a fully autonomous brain simulator close interface. Um, here we will just accept that these brain disorders will be the consequence of the altered connection within and between brain networks. Uh, we gain um, many knowledge from the fMRI studies uh, and the neurologic and psychiatric disorders treatments are slowed down since 2011 and um, we have some treatment way for the uh, for treatments um, for the new drugs for brain disorders so we have just go through the, the neurostimulation side to be able to make much more uh, good uh, consequences for the treatments um, basically we have triple network model these are as I said Gain from the fMRI studies, perceptual, emotional, and behavior processing, and as well as we have, these are as a metacognition, I can say, introspection, theory of mind, and self-awareness. Uh, these are is a conscious brain, and we are all conscious. And the uh, for the feature, uh, <laughs> it's maybe a bit different, but uh, for AI, it says can it get. Does it gain a conscious level or, or not? Uh, three networks, uh, silence network, encoded behavioral levels, and central executive neutral. These are, uh, it will just make an, just relax, silence, make an behavior, think and behave, and uh, all will be done under the central executive network, and uh, also, we have self-referential default mode network. Uh, we ha can, this is most related to self network. We can just think about ourselves and give to ourselves feedback. What's going on from our, the past going to the future. Uh, if we just look at here, um, it's based on the brain disorders, but I can't just say it to you. Uh, it is just saying that if we are just in this loop, uh, but if, our, if we are stimulating to the um, another point, it is not related with our loop, uh, the treatment will not be beneficial. But if we just make an, uh, if we just make an uh, stimulation to do this loop, so we can just make the, uh, make the stimulation. I can just give an example from the OCD. Uh, deep uh, it is approved by the FDA as well. Uh, we are just uh, simulating with deep TMS to the uh, one point, and actually it is related with the uh, cortical stroma, thalama cortical tract is working in OCD, and we are just giving to the uh, ACC, as I remember, and it is just uh, trying to simulate one point of the loop, and from that point, we are just provoking patients and so that they are just, um, uh, this is something like a virtual reality, but we are just provoking with some imaginary things. They are just thinking about their um, uh, obsessions and they are just trying to uh, pass and uh, it's something like an exposure and with the uh, images later on, they are just trying to do these obsessions with deep TMS under stimulation with something like a imagination. And from this point, we are just trying to do, go to the reality and easily use uh, them so that we are just decreasing their uh, obsessions level. Uh, I will just pass to the closed loop uh, here. Uh, the point is a bit different. Uh, we are using open stimulation. Uh, and open loop. We are using from the um, a part of brain. Here, uh, we will. Uh, the point is that we will just uh, we will just make an feedback uh, between the symptoms and the consequences. And here, it says an antihabian stimulation. Uh, there will be two targets, um, and it is accepted as uh, there are noises uh, related with the. Um, disorder and uh, with this antihabian stimulation, they will just try to prevent face synchronization. And 
it is actually a mechanism for functional connectivity. They are just thinking three different noise stimulation design, infraslow stimulation, and pseudo random burst stimuli. Uh, if you just look at here, uh, one, one is the, uh, it is trying to treat hyperconnectivity, and the, another one to treat hyperconnectivity. And uh, first one, as I said, anti habion stimulation, and the second uh, part is for the habion stimulation. Uh, the, um, there are, for the closed loop signals, uh, there are actually uh, some FDA approved closed loop signals. They are mostly used in epilepsy because epilepsy is easier to do, uh, see the consequences. But the psychiatric disorders, uh, I hope with the AI, uh, we can. We can make much more, um, we can see the consequences more easily, I hope. Uh, with synchronized habion stimulation, uh, it will just try to treat deficient connectivity because uh, if we just think from the fMRI again, uh, there are some hypoactive uh, and there are some hyperconnect, hyperactive sites, and with stimulation, actually, if you just think from depression, uh, we are just trying to increase to the uh, right uh, dorsolateral peripheral cortex with high stimulation. And, uh, but if we use from the, uh, sorry, for right, we are just using inf uh, infra stimulation. From left, we are just using high uh, frequency so that we are just trying to do, treat the def uh, depression. Uh, with this synchronized habion stimulation, uh, they will just uh, target the uh, rhythmic burst uh, with infraslow stimulations are provided with in time. Um, it gives an example for the closed lip signal. Uh, it will take the input and insight to the uh, internal force generation. Uh, they will uh, gain some integration adaptive nerves work neuromodulation and with predictive artificial intelligence they will just make the output and uh, it, uh, they will try to uh, they, it will just try to make contact with brain and the external centers um, it is from closed loop adaptive systems um, for it will uh, take some, uh, uh, this is actually uh, for the stimulation side to be able to, uh, much more physics maybe, uh, but I just want to put it to easier. Stimulation mediated predictable changes will be uh, fine. Later on, um, this will gain from the brain. Later on, the uh, main part will be taken and we, it will just try to stimulate that side, and uh, the consequences will come with the, the feedback modulation, so that closed loop will try to make stimulation to the, with the targeted points and the gain to the feedback system. Uh, as I said, uh, we are using in psychiatry right now with open loop designs. We are giving TMO and deep TMS, but these are not uh, closed loop. But uh, most of it is epilepsy, as I said. There are FDA closed loop nerve stimulation systems. Um, it's something like it. Uh, it will just refer, refer on system and with the feedback. Uh, and with this decoding controller, we will just try to control the symptoms. Um, we are trying to go to the uh, biomarker-based stimulations with AI and trying to find some biomarkers in our brains. And uh, during this uh, conference, you will just hear uh, some of our studies, maybe uh, trying to find some specific points and um, trying to find the difference between bipolar or health control. This is something like it. And we will just try to directly address patients' clinical needs and increase their positive quality of life. And uh, with 
uh, with this um, closed loop system, it will just prevent over treating. Uh, this is something like it. if you start to treat a patient with depression, uh, I can say, uh, if you uh, if you cannot control, you can go to the mania as well. We are just seeing in this this ones in clinic, and when we just see this uh, clinical thing, we are just stopping to the CME, or sometimes we are just changing or um, or uh, treatment modality. Um, for psychiatry, I, uh, affective decoding. We are working with emotions, and the emotions are not easy to classify, and uh, psychiatric disorders are highly heterogeneous. And uh, here in our hospital as well, we are, we are using QEEG, and this QEEG have identified candidate markers for treatment response. And uh, to be able to find suitable biomarkers, um, uh, it needs to be uh, uh, much work. Will, uh, much work will be need to done. Um, we are with DSM. We are using uh, Redox. These are for the uh, symptom clusters, assessment of those functional domains and neuromodulation to domain specific symptoms and circuits. And uh, in psychiatry, in each of the disorders, there are many overlaps between them. And actually the brain uh, working with the uh, loops and they are also making many contact with each other. And domain oriented approach we might address the diagnostic overlap issue and further help biomarker identification. Uh, I will just give an example here. This is with PTSD and MDD. There are some uh, common deficit in emotion regulation, but actually there are th two different clinical entities. Uh, here, um, in this study, they have just uh, all inter. If we just look at the RUDOC, they um, find the intersection between negative valence and cognitive, and uh, regulation is link between the prefrontal cortex and amygdala. Our brain is the same, but the uh, consequences of the uh, life uh, effect is maybe changing, and this is with resilience as well, and maybe the same trauma uh, for two different patients. One, when one comes with the depression, one comes with the PTSD. It is something like a resilience and uh, maybe adaptive uh, capacity of the patient. Uh, with big data, uh, with, we have massive computer, computational power and we can extract neuronal signatures for a given hypothesis. And machine learning um, a powerful tool and uh, we can relate uh, large scale observations in brain to behavior. And they can be done by multiple supervised approaches uh, in large scales. Uh, and they are used in PSA. We are just trying to extract the same common features or uh, to be able to go to the networks. Uh, and brain wide generative networks, uh, we, they are related with stress pathology. Um, I will just give uh, some examples. Uh, and mostly we are in psychiatric disorders, we are just first going from the neurology because it is much more uh, absolute uh, and we are just going to the psychiatry. Uh, this is easier to control the neurologic disorders. Their consequences are easier to uh, scale. But psychiatry is a bit um, not easy to scale and many overlaps seen. And we have many also, um, as I say, MS, uh, multiple sclerosis or epilep and epilepsy. We have common uh, problems with psychiatry and neurology. Uh, this is from DBS Think Tank uh, 9. Uh, it is done in Orlando and they have started to do, make some DBS technologies and the consensus right now just trying to uh, scope multiple brain disorders uh, in an effort to modulate neural psychiatry and uh, DBS, another form of neurostimulation, and yeah, it is just put inside the brain. And um, mo mostly in our, in our country, they are used 
by the neurosurgery. Um, for the psychiatry, uh, it is really a field, I can say. And uh, if we go uh, from this side, maybe um, with each development, we can go through the psychiatric disorders. Uh, this is another example from traumatic brain injury. Uh, they use a brain machine interface neuromodulation and uh, with stimulation, uh, they have just found axonal spreading and enhanced connectivity. Uh, we are just saying that neurons cannot regenerate. Actually, the regeneration capacity of the brain is very low. We can see them mostly in the hippocampus, in the dentate gyrus area. Uh, and uh, maybe what we can do for the patients is just increase their uh, live neurons, external supporting, and make good connections and increase the healthy level of the brain. And this uh, traumatic brain injury, uh, this brain machine interface involves constant interplay between outputs from brain and inputs again. And uh, they are just trying to enhance, and they have seen, connectivity and rewriting of the direct action stimulation. Um, neuromodulatory systems in biological brains may play an important role in learning and adaptive behavior. Because in psychiatry, if you are just changing something, you need to continue doing the same behavior to be able to settle down. This is something like a long-term potentiation. Uh, and, um, I can give an example from the, the um, substance use disorder. We call it as a 21 day because for one behavior, if you uh, if you are not using substance, uh, you will start from the, the decreasing uh, of the substance from your body, and your brain is also making another uh, adaptation, and the behavior will need to change, and your uh, learning and memory. The, um, uh, the point you are remembering the substance, uh, the places, the uh, events, the people, they need to be changed uh, and you need to make another contact to be able to make an another healthy uh, environment for your life, uh, for a substance-free environment. Um, and the first neuromodulator operates on spectrum of spatial temporal scales in tandem and opposition to reconfigurate functions of the local neural networks to regulate global cognitive states. And um, neural modulators are important for general cognition, and their phenomenology is yet to be fully realized in deep neural networks and has so far been mostly limited to the implementations of reinforcement learning models. This is, these reinforcement learning models are similar to our feedback uh, models. They are just giving some feedback and you are just changing your learning modality and uh, actually you are just making much more connections and so that uh, you gain uh, much more performance. Um, okay, thanks. <laughs> okay. Okay. Hmm? I think I'll probably have a lot of questions for you after we finish. Um, so before, uh, and I think we have one more speaker for this uh, session, sorry. Uh, we are starting with Dr. Ihab Ilaf, uh, who is uh, from Egypt, as I understand. Uh, he obtained his PhD in 2009 from the University of Salford in UK, and both his MSc and BSc were from the Arab Academy for Science and Technology and Maritime Transport. His research interests are particularly in intelligent robotic system designs, analysis, and implementation in addition to biomedical and signal processing. And today he's going to talk about uh, the use of TDCS device design and implementation. The Thank mic you. is all yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, let's start by Prinatika. Uh, uh, we start, I definitely, I'm just a representative of um, my big family of Prenatica family, which is first of all, Jum Dr. Jumurtash, who is Professor Jumurtash now. He's the originator of the idea. And Professor Nawzat Tarhan, our uh, university director, who is just uh, motivate our idea to just make it some kind of converted from uh, 
scientific idea to a real implementation, in addition to Mr. Fukan Tarhan, who just uh, find us the way to create this, uh, this device to become the real product that is being sold. We are selling this device actually now. Definitely behind us, there is a Utrecht University and Prime Park. Actually, we are we are just actually a big family that produced this device, and I'm just representing uh, this family. Now, for our human, uh, we say that this human is our concern, number one concern, and the most important organ in the human is the brain itself. So we say that is why we don't think about how to find solution for the brain disorders, especially that is if it was not invasive problems like a, something like. Um, like uh, things related to uh, electrical disorder, brain electrical disorder. So, um, um, so what we are planning to do is trying to do uh, difficulty with not solving all disorders. We try to solve part of the disorders. Uh, one of the things is the targeting to, to, develop, to develop a device that is non-invasive and affordable and reliable and, and, and it has all the features of a real uh, working device. Okay, and it would be Turkish made from zero, from scratch. So this is, uh, was our target to, to do it in this way. So, um, so uh, we find, we explore some kind of, um, uh, yani, the, the, some brain disorder that can be solved with a, with a non-invasive way, not, not like a tumor, like a, other colleagues just represent this, okay? And we say that like Alzheimer, epilepsy, so this will find a solution for many people having these difficulties in their life. So, um, so we started by thinking about CDCS devices, and we explore these things in, in different perspectives. See, we see real product that is, has been developed by other people, and in addition to that, to um, to see how we can find a way to develop our own uh, TDCS. So. We put just kind of uh, milestones to see that with what we can do and what should we do. So first of all, we want to develop the TDCS device and it should be reliable and affordable as well as uh, with a high level of safety to protect human as we are dealing with a human. And it should be portable as everything life and now is becomes portable like our cell phones, smartphones. Okay, in addition to be user friendly without, without complicated procedure to run it. So, uh, and definitely it should be advanced and more, okay? Now, uh, I, I'm just, uh, uh, inshallah today, I will uh, pr yeah, just uh, interview, interview them the version one. Now we are working in version two, which is way advanced than what you can see. It's a complete system, and yeah, we just complete the system. Here we go, this is the device. We chose the, the name, actually, um, first of all, and we find the domain, which is www.prenatica.com. After that, we name it after this one. So we want to make the name with um, like a brain and uh, like, a, like, a, yeah, like a encyclopedia or something like this. So this is the first device, inshallah, in this way. So uh, as you can see, it's as small as you can see. And we, when we develop this device, we go back to the system science and engineering um, Actually, this is a huge textbook to, to tell you about how to develop a real life system with all those features, affordability, reliability, portability, disposability, all of those things. Thanks to Professor Benjamin Blanche for this, um, this wonderful book, actually. I studied this book since 2001 or something. So uh, it's very easy to use. Start the device and adjust the settings. After that, just press that button to start and stimulation will go with no, no complication, no other things. Uh, this device has some kind of a built-in Bluetooth module as well. So imagine that we can connect this to the, the cell phone and smartphone. So we can, with a smartphone, we can reach everything. Yani, now, this really device is ready for doing this. Uh, for protection, for safety, definitely, uh, as we are dealing with the human, so we have to take care of the safety of the human. So we have, we produce in this device three levels of safety. Okay, one of them is um, software, using software, and the second one is using the hardware that is that circuit them, them, themselves. Uh, there is a current limiter that is cannot make the current exceed the 2.1 milliampers. Okay, the, the maximum working uh, operation uh, current is 2 milliampers until now. Okay, definitely we can go more than this, but this is what, what is, uh, has been stated in the literature that is safe for the human. And the circuit uh, hardware, this is the last level, cannot produce more than 2.3 uh, milliampers. It's, this is the maximum. So definitely the, this device is 100% uh, safe for the human. Actually, we've never this, uh, find any problem that is, cannot be solved by software. 
Um, and now here's the response of the real measurements of the human, okay? So by time, you'd find that the, the connectivity of the skin, human skin is just variating. So according to that, we're just uh, trying to make some kind of some, something called a Kalman filter, if you are aware about this term, okay? Try to, uh, uh, to try to compensate all the variations of the current and make it all the time almost stable, so not to avoid any applying uh, at an AC signal, it, to, to, it has to be the DC, not an AC, okay? So this is what we do with the software. And uh, when I say software, so all the software we are using, we are using I mean, uh, uh, general public license software, so this is, will not make um, an overhead for the cost of the, of the device. So the device is, uh, with, according to this thing, if you just run it in a normal mode with a screen uh, uh, lid 100% all the time, so it lasts for 40, 45 minutes and about 300 minutes if it's in a, in, in a screen um, um, in a screen saving mode. And it's a very light and very small. You can put it in your pocket even, okay? It has a high resolution touch screen. In addition, it can, uh, can be charged by any USB charger. So, and it uh, has a built-in Bluetooth module. So with the built-in Bluetooth module, we are developing some kind of mobile application. We, we finished the Android and we are going to the iOS now to just make it things. Okay, now until the moment, this is what we have developed for version number one. Version number one is an open loop, not a closed loop. So, uh, and we are trying, uh, oh, it's partially closed loop actually because it's making the, the trying to compensate the, um, the, the variation of the skin uh, resistivity. So uh, version two is a complete system that read EEGs and according to that uh, decide which is proper stimulation. We get a certification, see, we, this device is certified and we start to produce it. And this is, I think, this is a testing, hopefully, you know, just uh, switching on the device. And uh, here we go. And we just adjust it to, uh, with a touch screen. Okay, we adjust um, the duration and the required uh, current. And after that, press on the start. And once it's those tickles attached to the brain, so it starts to stimulate and start to build up the current for some time. And after that, uh, after we reach a certain point, uh, this is actually, I'm, I'm testing this in, on my head actually. So, um, uh, so it started to make the stimulation and after that you can press the stop to stop it right up. So here we go. Now, uh, we start the production. We produce like 20 devices now, and we sold so far until the moment five devices like last two months. So hopefully, inshallah, we will do things uh, in a better way, and version two, inshallah, would be, as I told you, that it would be a closed loop and the entire system with database with everything. Anyway, thank you very much for your listening, and thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Um, before I start asking questions, any questions from the audience? Can we pass a mic, please? Yeah. I think there are two questions in the audience. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I am Fahmi from Indonesia. I, want, I have uh, two questions, one from, uh, for Dr. Ihab and one for Dr. Uh, Giuseppe. Uh, for Dr. Giuseppe, if we know for the mixed serality, uh, sometimes we difficult to extract from MRI, inside of the MRI structure. How do you divide between uh, like globus pallidus and thalamus? How to extract that? Because uh, usually we, if we do the 3D model, there is empty inside, but we can just uh, make a surface, surface, surface, uh, surface mark. We can do, but we are difficult to do the. Uh, to extract the 3D of the inside of the brain. How, do you have any tips or how to do that? And for Dr. Ihab, uh, how you maintain the accuracy and precise precision about uh, the TDSC yeah, to, to stimulate? How you maintain the accuracy and pre precision? Because we know there is a structure in the brain different between for uh, movement disorder and epilepsy how you maintain the accuracy and how millimeters the stimulation that uh, can make by this uh, equipment. Thank you very much.
I think we can pass the mic to Dr. Giuseppe right in front row. And uh, I think another one for Dr. Ehaf in the front row as well, please. Well, I think that you are <clears throat> asking uh, how we could highlight the uh, deep nuclei, okay, for deep brain stimulation, for example, with mixed reality, okay. <clears throat> yes, uh, this depends on the uh, type of MRI scan that you are going to perform, uh, but it's also possible to highlight the, some region with mixed reality platform because we have the, uh, all the data set that we, we, that we use are elaborated in a cloud platform where, where you have some tools to work on well, with, on your data set. And also uh, this for the data set of the patients, of course. Uh, for in general, for the neuroanatomy of the patient, we are working about this project with the hierarchical uh, tomography that will be certainly uh, uh, uh, will certainly allow us to highlight any region of, of the brain as a, an atlas. For, but for clinical use, you can use the cloud platform. Okay. I think I can add a bit more to that as well. So, with regards to your question as to how how about visualizing the deep nuclei or even things like the thalamus or for example if you're going down to as much as looking at the SDN or the GPI for DBS targeting so the thing about mixed reality or HoloLens in particular it doesn't really matter because the HoloLens doesn't specify you give them a CTTAP of the entire body it will reconstruct the entire body in a three-dimensional space for you because it is not making the decision to decide what it's rendering. So it depends upon what kind of images you're feeding in. So obviously, if you want to use a MR-guided targeting of DBS, usually you use a higher Tesla MR, which gives you a very fine cut, like you use a 0.6 mm cut or a 1 mm cut scan of your MR, and that will be how good the rendering will be based on the images you feed into the system. If you give like a 3 mm or a 5 mm, you know, like a DWI or an ADC sequence, your rendering will be absolutely terrible because you are giving a very thick slice scan. So for mixed reality, it totally depends upon the kind of imaging you're feeding in. Uh, like G Dr. Giuseppe mentioned, there are quite a number of softwares that are available now that allow you to highlight the, like for example, whether the ventricles, whether the thalamus on the computer first before you actually feed into the HoloLens. But the problem is once you have done that, I can't move the slicer box to get the slices of the image because the, the, the, the extracted image becomes a fixed image rather than an image that you can modify. And I think that's where a bit more research is still required. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Heba, please, thank you. Okay, about the answer of your question is that is, um, there are some kind of fixed points that you can just put those electrodes here and there. So these, if we talk about uh, dual uh, electrodes, one of the anode and one of the cathode. So this is, we are the fixed places somehow. Yani, yani, yani, I think this is, I, I'm a computer engineer, so my, uh, my colleague, Vimur Tash, he knows where, uh, exactly where are those, the, uh, stick, uh, those badges supposed to be inserted in the, in the frame. And uh, uh, the the way that we are thinking about is just to try to um, keep the device uh, supplying the brain with a 2 milliampers or 1.5 milliampers, 1.7 milliampers, according to what is described for a certain patient, for a certain, um, for, for just keeping this level all the time constant and avoid any uh, alternate color current uh, stimulation. This is why we are trying to filter the signal, keep it all the time at a certain level. This is, this is, this is actually what I'm doing. But the location of, of, of, of stickers, according to my knowledge, is they are, um, according to literature, they are fixed in some certain spots here and there. Okay, a little bit up, a little bit down, something like this. Okay, thank you. I think Dr. Giuseppe has something to add as well, uh, yes. then Dr. Uh, Nami. The one last thing is that you can use also uh, online free software for segmentation. You can create your object and then you can merge or uh, use it with your data set and uh, elaborate it with the cloud. So there are several options for that, okay? Like 3D slicer, for example. 
Ya, ya, ya. I think there was a question in the back, and there's another question from Thank Dr. You. Nami. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> My question is that we have been using a stereotactic device for brain, deep brain stimulation for more than years, 10 years, and also this, this fluoroscope that we used in with integrated CT scan. And now you are trying to mix this one with laser and uh, with your uh, D3 and maybe uh, replace the serotactic device with your holographic system? Is that your trying? Uh, thank you for the question. I think, I think what you've asked is, um, I, think a lo I think you're not the very first person who has asked me, and I'm sure Dr. Giuseppe would have heard the same questions uh, multiple times. Um, I think my, my, my personal experience with using the current neural navigation or the stereotactic systems has always been that uh, it has been a system that has been developed by non-neurosurgeons, by companies who are literally charging millions of dollars or millions of pounds, for me it's millions of Singapore dollars, to get the system into a hospital. And that has become kind of a gold standard system in our theater, operating theatres. The problem with these systems, which I have found on a regular basis, is that every time I want a modification to the system, every time I want to introduce something new, for example, I try to get connectomics or the white matter fiber tracks to be incorporated into the stuff system and basically the representative from the company said this can't be done because the images are restricted and you need to pay this much amount of money for us to allow you to modify the software. What I feel is what I put on the slide and what I didn't put on the slide. So the first thing is I think this being an open hardware platform, it's like HoloLens is basically like a laptop everybody can carry and basically you are free to utilize the way you want because it's literally developing an app for your phone, it's developing an app for HoloLens and you know like I think Dr. Ihab said it's a you know public use kind of software kind of system which I think reduces the cost a lot more as compared to the current navigation systems. I think that's the first thing. The second thing which I think I personally feel very strongly about is because my interests are in awake and neuro-oncology. And a lot of times when I hear people from like, for example, you know, um, um, sub-Saharan sub Africa for that matter, you know, or people even who come over from like, um, you know, Indonesia, Malaysia, from the far, far off where they do not have anesthetists who can actually support awake, support neuro-navigation. I always feel that, you know, we, we shouldn't be limited by not having enough money yet pushing patient care, which is why I feel this HoloLens or any other kind of mixed reality device might give us just enough information that you need, may not be to that level of accuracy. I think it, if it doesn't replace, at least it will be something that can kind of support the current systems that are available. Um, with regards to deep brain stimulation, which is, I think, Dr. Fahim uh, also asked in terms of very accurate targeting, I think we are still very far away from that. I can tell you no neurosurgeon, including myself, would be convinced that I'm going to throw away the neural navigation and just use the HoloLens because I think we have not shown the accuracy. So I think we still have a long way to go where, where, where this it is. And I'm, I'm very mindful of that. But I think, I think I feel that when I have, since the time I've started doing research and since I've actually met Dr. Giuseppe as well, I think the amount of literature is really minimal because nobody is ready to push the boundaries of using mixed reality because they're scared to change the current thinking patterns. So I think, I think that's where probably our work will come in. Yeah. Thank you so much. I have another question. Yeah. And, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Baba. Uh, I mean, just um, Eva, comment Eta, Eta. Can I, Eta. Um, in our World Congress in Los Angeles, we had a company called Novarad, uh, who got uh, FDA approval for uh, use uh, mixed reality uh, for neurosurgery. I think if you look at the trend in neurotech in uh, neurosurgery, uh, from neuromodulation to uh, image-guided therapy, you will see 
a bit reduction of bulkiness, increased precision, mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, you'll see more and more, uh, you know, mixed reality plays a role in intraoperative frame mapping. Yes. So, um, and I, I think, uh, you know, with Novarat being in the market already and FDA approved, uh, that's basically is a game changing for uh, exoscopes and microscopes and now, uh, you know, like Medtronic stealth navigation and so on. So that's one point. Uh, the other point is that for br deep brain stimulators, uh, you know, the next generation of stimulators are cortical stimulators and, and uh, uh, you know, skull sensors mm -hmm. that are very, very non-invasive that are coming to market. So. So again, uh, to answer your question, or uh, so these are new trends in neurosurgery. Future. So this, Future. yeah, coming up. Thank you. I, I think I'm a bit mindful of time. So as I understand, there'll be a coffee break, and the next session is at 10. Um, so I think it's uh, 9.55. Maybe we can take the coffee break, and I think we'll have the rest of the time to discuss any further questions that the rest of you have. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think um, some remarks from Dr. Baba. Yeah. Oh. Mr. President, you are protected, sir. You are not sir. President of the United States. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, so the, the next session will start at 10.10, 10, so you have about 15 minutes of coffee break. Thank you. Sokrates'in dediği gibi, kendini tanı, yolculuğun burada başlıyor. Okumak, sorgulamak, araştırmakla donandığın dört yılın sonunda akademisyenlik, çeşitli şirketlerde felsefi danışmanlık, basın yayın organlarında ve yayın evlerinde editörlük, yazarlık, eleştirmenlik, reklamcılık yapabiliyorsun. Kamu ve özel sektörde, sivil toplum kuruluşlarında, hukuk, finans, tıp, medya, sanat gibi çeşitli alanların toplumsal hizmet projelerinde ve etik danışma kurullarında çalışabiliyorsun. Her şeyden önce yüzün burada hep gülüyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra felsefe okumak istiyorsan bize katıl. Merhaba, ben Ahmet Arslan, Sosyoloji Bölümü öğrencisiyim. Hayatım boyunca önce mutlu olmak, sonra sosyoloji okumak istedim hep. Aldığım sosyoloji eğitimim sayesinde her ikisinin de özdeş kavramlar olduğunu fark ettim. Şimdi size neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'nin sosyoloji bölümünü tercih ettiğimi anlatayım. Bölümdeki dersler 
toplumsal olaylara açıklama, yorumlama, eleştirme ve çözme ihtiyaçlarına karşılık vermeye yardımcı olan bir içeriğe sahip. Bu ihtiyacı karşılamak için gerekli olan temel kuramsal konular ve araştırma yöntemleri kapsamlı bir sosyolojik literatür çerçevesinde alanında deneyimli hocalar tarafından aktarılıyor. İstanbul gibi bir metropolde sağ çalışmaları vasıtasıyla pratiğe geçirme olanını sunuyor. Bu da bana mutlu bir toplumun nasıl inşa edileceği hususunda vizyon ve misyon kazandırıyor. Her şeyden önce hep yüzün gülüyor burada. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra sosyolog olmak istiyorsan bize katıl. Merhaba, ben yeni medya gazetecilik bölümünden Burak. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra gazeteci olmak istedim ben. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir gazeteci olmak için neden üstün üniversitesini tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Hepimizin gözlemlediği gibi internetle birlikte medya ve gazetecilik alanında çok radikal, yapısal ve işlevsel dönüşüm süreçleri başladı. Yazılı basın, görsel, işitsel medya gibi ayrımlar ortadan kalkarak bütünleşik dijital yeni medya yapılanması ortaya çıktı. İşte burada yeni medya ve gazetecilik alanındaki bu yeni duruma uygun bir profesyonel olmalı odaklı eğitim alıyorsun. Dijital içerik üretebilen ve yönetebilen, yeni medyanın tüm özelliklerini kullanabilen bir profesyonel olma hedefleniyor. Ayrıca yeni medya okuryazarı direklerine sahip olarak medya içeriklerini eleştirel bakabilme öğreniyorsun. Mesleki etik değerlere uygun davranmanın gazetecilik mesleği açısından ne kadar önemli olduğunu kavruyorsun. Her şeyden önce burada yüzün hep gülüyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra gazeteci olmak için bize katıl. Reklam tasarımı ve iletişim öğrencisi Zehra Güneş. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra reklamcı olmak istedim hep. Mutlu olmadan olduğu şeyin önemi yok çünkü. Ben de mutlu bir reklamcı olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğinden bahsedeyim size. Nitelikli bir akademisyen kadrodan 4 yıl boyunca eğlenerek, keyif alarak eğitim görüyorsun. İlgi ve yönelimlerine yanıt vermeye elverişli bir ders programın oluyor sektörle işbirliği içinde hazırlanan bir eğitim öğretim programı oluyor. Bu eğitim kapsamında hem reklam sektörüne hem de akademik çalışma yapmakta olan kurumlara profesyonel bir iletişimci olmaya hazırlanıyorsun. Her şeyden önce yüzün burada hep gülüyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra reklamcı olmak istiyorsan size katıl. Merhaba, ben Eylül. Üsküdar Üniversitesi Halkla İlişkiler Bölümü öğrencisiyim. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra haklı ilişkiler uzmanı olmak istedim hep. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir haklı ilişkiler uzmanı olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Bölümde insanların neden ve nasıl iletişim kurduklarından başlayarak medyanın insan ve toplumlara etkisini, devletlerin, kurumların ve markaların işleyişini ve dev haklı ilişkiler kampanyalarının nasıl yapıldığını öğreniyorsunuz. Yıl boyu düzenlenen etkinlikler sayesinde sektörün önde gelen isimleriyle birlikte çalışma imkanı yakalıyorsun. Her şeyden önce burada hep yüzün gülüyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra haklı işleri uzmanı olmak için bize katıl. Merhaba ben Sezer, radyo, televizyon ve sinema öğrencisiyim. Önce mutlu olmak istedim. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir radyo, televizyon ve sinema mezunu olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Nitelikli bir akademik kadrodan ders alıyorsun. Ders gördüğün alanlar fiziki ve teknik donanımlı mekanlardan, laboratuvarlardan oluşuyor. Radyo ve televizyon stüdyolarında teorik ve uygulamalı eğitimi bir arada görüyorsun. Yalnızca bugün değil, geleceği de dikkate alarak hazırlanmış bir müfredatın var. Kalifiye meslek insanları olarak yetiştirildiğini her an hissediyorsun. Yıl boyu düzenlenen etkinliklerde sektörün önde gelen isimleriyle bir araya gelme imkanı buluyorsun. Ü TV ve Ü Radyo stüdyolarında pratik imkanı oluyor. Her şeyden önce burada yüzün hep gülüyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra radyocu, televizyoncu veya sinemacı olmak istiyorsan bize katıl. Merhaba arkadaşlar, ben Nur. Üsküdar Üniversitesi Görsel İletişim Tasarım Öğrencisi. Her şeyden önce mutlu olmak ve iyi bir görsel iletişimci olmak istedim. Çünkü mutlu olmadan yaptığımız için hiçbir önemi yok. O zaman neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi Görsel İletişim Tasarım Öğrencisi tercihinden size birazcık bahsedeyim. Sıkılmadan eğlene eğlene 4 yıl genelden özele, kurumsaldan uygulamaya, birbirini tamamlayan dersler görüyorsun. İkinci sınıftan itibaren genelde mek laboratuvarında oluyorsun. Alanında uzman, kalifiye meslek insanı olarak yetiştirildiğini her an hissediyorsun. Yalnızca bugünü değil, geleceği de dikkate alarak hazırlanmış bir müfredatın var. Mezuniyetten sonra artık sen ne istersen, ajans, medya, kurumsal. Her şeyden önce burada yüzün hep gülüyor. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra da iyi bir görsel iletişimci olmak istiyorsan bize katılın. 
İstanbul'un kalbi Üsküdar'da Türkiye'nin beyin üstünü kurmak ve dünya çapında bir üniversite olabilmek için kolları sıvadığımızda her şeyi insanı anlamakla başlar dedik ve bu gayeyle çıktık yola. Sağlık alanındaki çeyrek asırlık tecrübeyle Türkiye'nin ilk ve tek davranış bilimleri ve sağlık temalı üniversitesi unvanına kavuşmamıza uzanan yolculuğumuz böyle başladı. Kısa zamanda çok büyük mesafeler kat ederek ülkemizi bilimin ışığında parlak yarınlara taşıyacak gençler yetiştirmiş olmanın mutluluğunu yaşıyoruz. İnanıyoruz ki ulusal ve uluslararası ölçekte çağdaş, donanımlı, sorgulayan, araştıran, bilim üreten gençlerimiz de global platformlarda daha birçok başarımız, gururumuz olacak. Biz hayatın içinde bir üniversiteyiz. Bir üniversite beş yerleşke anlayışıyla İstanbul'un farklı noktalarından kolaylıkla ulaşılabilen yerleşkelerimizde öğrencilerimizin kampüs deneyimini şehrin dinamik temposundan kopmadan yaşamasını sağlıyor, onların hayata her an bağlı kalmalarına olarak tanıyoruz. Öğrencilerimize teorik ve pratik bilgiyi bir bütün olarak sunduğumuz, yapay zekadan farmakogenetiğe kadar pek çok farklı alana yönelik 70'i aşkın laboratuvarımız, televizyon ve radyo stüdyolarımız, ileri teknolojiye sahip dersliklerimiz ve daha birçok modern altyapı özelliğimizle dünya standartlarında bir üniversiteyiz. 6 fakülte, 1 sağlık hizmetleri meslek yüksekokulu ve 5 enstitümüzde hepsi alanlarında yetkin, bini aşkın güçlü akademik ve idari kadromuzla 4 temel ilkemiz olan eleştirilebilirlik, özgürlükçülük, çoğulculuk ve katılımcılığı yüksek öğretimin her alanında uyguluyoruz. Tıp, diş, mühendislik ve doğa bilimleri, iletişim, sağlık bilimleri, insan ve toplum bilimleri alanlarındaki lisans ve sağlık hizmetleri meslek yüksekokulu ön lisans programlarımızın yanı sıra bağımlılık ve adli bilimlerden tasavvuf araştırmalarına kadar farklı branşlara yönelik yüksek lisans ve doktora programlarımızla birlikte toplamda 22 bine aşkın öğrencimizde yüksek öğretimde çığır açmaya devam ediyor, 10. yılımızı geride bırakırken verdiğimiz 23 bin mezunumuzla da gurur duyuyoruz. Girişimcilik, üniversite kültürü ve yurt dışındaki birçok saygın üniversiteden önce dünyada ilk kez hayata geçirdiğimiz pozitif psikoloji gibi derslerin yanı sıra yüzlerce ulusal ve uluslararası çapta etkinlikle öğrencilerimizin iyi birer dünya vatandaşı olmalarını amaçlıyoruz. Türkiye'nin ilk bilim ve fikir festivali ve yüksek insani değerler ödülleri gibi geleneksel hale getirdiğimiz geniş kapsamlı etkinlikler ve sosyal sorumluluk projeleriyle kurumsal çalışmalarımızı sosyo-kültürel alanlara da yayıyoruz. Mutlu Yuva, Haydi Tut Elimi Derneği gibi sivil toplum kuruluşlarıyla sevgi ve güven dolu bir geleceğe katkıda bulunurken, bilim ve uygulama ortağımız NP İstanbul Beyin Hastanesi uzmanlarının desteği sayesinde başarıyla sürdürdüğümüz Aileler Üniversitede Projesi ve benzeri çalışmalarla yarınlarımız için sağlam temeller inşa ediyoruz. Arge odaklarımızın yanı sıra Brain Park Teknoloji Transfer Ofisi, Silikon Türk Teknopark gibi teknolojik inovasyonlarla bilimsel çalışmalarda öncü rol üstleniyoruz. Dünyanın 80 ülkesinden 3 bine aşkın uluslararası öğrencimizle farklı medeniyetleri Üsküdar'ın bilim çatısı altında buluşturuyoruz. Yüksek öğretimde uluslararası kalite standartlarına büyük önem veriyoruz. Bu yöndeki tüm çalışmalarımızı Pearson, FEDEC, ILAT, ISO 9001 gibi akreditasyonlarla belgeliyoruz. Kurucu rektörümüz Profesör Doktor Nevzat Tarhan'ın öncülüğünde G20 zirvesine ev sahipliği yapan ilk ve tek Türk üniversitesi olarak beyin konusundaki çalışmalarımıza küresel çapta devam ediyoruz. Geleceğin bilgili ve donanımlı hekimlerini yetiştirdiğimiz tıp fakültemizde afiliye hastanemiz NP İstanbul Beyin Hastanesi ile sürekli işbirliği içindeyiz. Ayrıca sağlık ve uygulama merkezlerimiz olan NP Fener Yolu ve NP Etiler Tıp Merkezimizde de geniş uygulama ve staj olanakları sunuyoruz. Üniversite tercihi gelecek tercihidir. Tercihini iyi bir gelecekten yana kullananlar Üsküdar Üniversitesi'nde buluşuyor, parlak yarınlara emin adımlarla yürüyorlar. Çünkü Üsküdar gerçek bir üniversite. Türkiye'nin beyin üssü Üsküdar Üniversitesi. Merhaba ben Asena. Herkes gibi ben de mutlu olmak istiyorum. Mutlu olmak için önce sevdiğim ve istediğim bölümde olmam gerektiğini biliyorum. Mutluyum çünkü Üsküdar Üniversitesi'nde tarih bölümü öğrencisiyim. Mutlu bir öğrenci olarak sizlere neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimi anlatayım. Bizde Türkiye'de tarih eğitiminde ilkleri yaşamanız mümkün. Bütün bir yıl sadece ders dinlemiyor, pek çok tarihi mekana, arşivlere, müzelere gidiyoruz. Ödevlerimizi sadece evde değil, bizzat sınıflarda, hocalarımız danışmanlığında yapıyoruz. Tarih öğrenimi için çok önemli olan Osmanlıca eğitimini oldukça yoğun alıyoruz. Derslerimizi grup çalışmaları eşliğinde sorgulayarak işliyoruz. Bu fakültede bulunan sosyoloji, felsefe, siyaset bilimi ve uluslararası ilişkileri bölümleri ile birlikte karşılıklı etkileşimle ders görüyoruz. 
Bir yandan tarih öğrenirken, diğer yandan multidisipliner bir bakış açısıyla hayata hazırlanıyoruz. Her şeyden önemlisi burada yüzün hep gülüyor. Sen de hem mutlu olmak hem de tarih okumak istiyorsan bize katıl. Merhaba, medya ve iletişimden Sude ben. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra medya ve iletişim uzmanı olmak istedim. Mutlu olmadan olduğu şeyin bir önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir medya iletişim uzmanı olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğinden bahsedeyim size. Bölümde akademik ve bilimsel anlayış üzerine odaklanıyoruz. Bu nedenle daha çok alana akademisyen, araştırmacı ve bilim insanı yetiştirme misyonu etrafında biçimlenebiliyoruz. Üsküdar Üniversitesi Televizyonu, Radyosu ve Üsküdar Haber Ajansı gibi üniversitemizin medya organlarında görev alarak daha okul yıllarında medya ile iç içe oluyoruz. Bunun dışında yıl boyu düzenlenen etkinliklerde sektörün önde gelen isimleriyle bir araya gelme imkanı oluyor. Her şeyden önce burada yüzün hep gülüyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra medya ve iletişim uzmanı olmak istiyorsan bize katıl. Merhaba, ben Elif Nur, psikoloji bölümü öğrencisiyim. Hem mutlu olmak hem de psikolog olmak istedim hep. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir psikolog olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ne tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Davranış ve sağlık bilimlerinde Türkiye'nin ilk ve tek tematik üniversitesinden mezun oluyorsun. Pozitif psikoloji dersiyle hayata bambaşka pencereden bakma fırsatı yakalıyorsun. Üniversite hastane işbirliği modeliyle akademik ve klinik eğitimin iç içe olduğu bir lisans tecrübesi elde ediyorsun. Multidisipliner eğitim kültürünü oluşturma idealiyle dünya standartlarının üstünde bilim üretme hedefini bizzat hissediyor ve görüyorsun. Türkçe ve İngilizce eğitim olanağı var. Kurucu rektörümüz Profesör Doktor Nevzat Tarhan Endüriyündeki güçlü akademik kadro ile seni kariyer hayatına en iyi şekilde hazırlıyor. Her şeyden önce burada yüzüm hep gidiyor. Ee, hem mutlu olmak hem psikolog olmak istiyorsan bize katıl. Merhaba, ben felsefe 3. sınıf öğrencisi Öznur Aynural. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra felsefe okumak istedim hep. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir felsefe mezunu olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Sokrates'in dediği gibi, kendini tanı, yolculuğun burada başlıyor. Okumak, sorgulamak, araştırmakla donandığın 4 yılın sonunda akademisyenlik, çeşitli şirketlerde felsefe danışmanlık, basın yayın organlarında ve yayın evlerinde editörlük, yazarlık, eleştirmenlik, reklamcılık yapabiliyorsun. Kamu ve özel sektörde, sivil toplum kuruluşlarında, hukuk, finans, tıp, medya, sanat gibi çeşitli alanların toplumsal hizmet projelerinde ve etik danışma kurullarında çalışabiliyorsun. Her şeyden önce yüzün burada hep gülüyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, Sonra felsefe okumak istiyorsan bize katı. Merhaba, ben Ahmet Arslan. Sosyoloji bölümü öğrencisiyim. Hayatım boyunca önce mutlu olmak, sonra sosyoloji okumak istedim hep. Aldığım sosyoloji eğitim sayesinde her ikisinin de özdeş kavramlar olduğunu fark ettim. Şimdi size neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'nin sosyoloji bölümünü tercih ettiğimi anlatayım. Bölümdeki dersler toplumsal olayları açıklama, yorumlama, eleştirme ve çözme ihtiyaçlarına karşılık vermeye yardımcı olan bir içeriğe sahip. Bu ihtiyacı karşılamak için gerekli olan temel kuramsal konular ve araştırma yöntemleri kapsamlı bir sosyolojik literatür çerçevesinde alanında deneyimli hocalar tarafından aktarılıyor. İstanbul gibi bir metropolde sağ çalışmaları vasıtasıyla pratiğe geçirme olanağı da sunuyor. Bu da bana mutlu bir toplumun nasıl inşa edileceği hususunda vizyon ve misyon kazandırıyor. Her şeyden önce hep yüzün gülüyor burada. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra sosyolog olmak istiyorsan bize katıl. Merhaba, ben Yeni Medya Gazetecilik bölümünden Burak. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra gazeteci olmak istedim ben. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir gazeteci olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Hepimizin gözlemlediği gibi internetle birlikte medya ve gazetecilik alanında çok radikal, yapısal ve işlevsel dönüşüm süreçleri başladı. Yazılı basın, görsel, işitsel medya gibi ayrımlar ortadan kalkarak bütünleşik dijital yeni medya yapılanması ortaya çıktı. 
İşte burada yeni medya ve gazetecilik alanındaki bu yeni duruma uygun bir profesyonel olmalı odaklı eğitim alıyorsun. Dijital içerik üretebilen ve yönetebilen, yeni medyanın tüm özelliklerini kullanabilen bir profesyonel olma hedefleniyor. Ayrıca yeni medya okuryazarı direklerine sahip olarak medya içeriklerini eleştiren bakabilmeyi öğreniyorsun. Mesleki etik değerlere uygun davranmanın gazetecilik mesleği açısından ne kadar önemli olduğunu kavruyorsun. Her şey dönünce burada yüzün hep gidiyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra gazeteci olmak için bize katıl. Reklam tasarımı ve iletişimi öğrencisi Zehra Güneş. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra reklamcı olmak istedim hep. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. Ben de mutlu bir reklamcı olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğinden bahsedeyim size. Nitelikli bir akademisyen kadrodan 4 yıl boyunca eğlenerek, keyif alarak eğitim görüyorsun. İlgi ve yönelimlerine yanıt vermeye elverişli bir ders programın oluyor. Sektörle işbirliği içinde hazırlanan bir eğitim öğretim programı oluyor. Bu eğitim kapsamında hem reklam sektörüne hem de akademik çalışma yapmakta olan kurumlara profesyonel bir iletişimci olmaya hazırlanıyorsun. Her şeyden önce yüzün burada hep gülüyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra reklamcı olmak istiyorsan size katıl. Ben Eylül, Üsküdar Üniversitesi Halkla İlişkiler Bölümü öğrencisiyim. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra halkla ilişkiler uzmanı olmak istedim hep. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir halkla ilişkiler uzmanı olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Bölümde insanların neden ve nasıl iletişim kurduklarından başlayarak medyanın insan ve toplumlara etkisini, devletlerin, kurumların ve markaların işleyişini ve dev halkla ilişkiler kampanyalarının nasıl yapıldığını öğreniyorsunuz. Yıl boyu düzenlenen etkinlikler sayesinde sektörün önde gelen isimleriyle birlikte çalışma imkanı yakalıyorsun. Her şeyden önce burada hep yüzün gülüyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra halkla ilişkileri uzmanı olmak için bize katıl. Merhaba ben Sezer, radyo, televizyon ve sinema öğrencisiyim. Önce mutlu olmak istedim. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir radyo, televizyon ve sinema mezunu olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Nitelikli bir akademik kadrodan ders alıyorsun. Ders gördüğün alanlar fiziki ve teknik donanımlı mekanlardan, laboratuvarlardan oluşuyor. Radyo ve televizyon stüdyolarında teorik ve uygulamalı eğitimi bir arada görüyorsun. Yalnızca bugün değil, geleceğe de dikkate alarak hazırlanmış bir müfredatın var. Kalifiye meslek insanları olarak yetiştirildiğini her an hissediyorsun. Yıl boyu düzenlenen etkinliklerde sektörün önde gelen isimleriyle bir araya gelme imkanı buluyorsun. Ü TV ve Ü Radyo stüdyolarında pratik imkanı oluyor. Her şeyden önce burada yüzün hep gülüyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra radyocu, televizyoncu veya sinemacı olmak istiyorsan bize katıl. Merhaba arkadaşlar, ben Nur. Üsküdar Üniversitesi Görsel İletişim Tasarımı Öğrencisi. Her şeyden önce mutlu olmak ve iyi bir görsel iletişimci olmak istedim. Çünkü mutlu olmadan yaptığımız için hiçbir önemi yok. O zaman neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi Görsel İletişim Tasarımı Öğrencisi Üniversitesi Tasarımı Öğrencisi'nden size birazcık bahsedeyim. Sıkılmadan, eğlene eğlene, 4 yıl genelden özele, kurumsaldan uygulamaya, birbirini tamamlayan dersler görüyorsun. İkinci sınıftan itibaren genelde mek laboratuvarında oluyorsun. Alanında uzman, kaliteli meslek insanı olarak yetiştirildiğini her an hissediyorsun. Yalnızca bugünü değil, geleceği de dikkate alarak hazırlanmış bir müfredatın var. Mezuniyetten sonra artık sen ne istersen, ajans, medya, kurumsal. Her şeyden önce burada yüzün hep gülüyor. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra iyi bir görsel iletişimci olmak istiyorsan bize kalın. İstanbul'un kalbi Üsküdar'da Türkiye'nin beyin üssünü kurmak ve dünya çapında bir üniversite olabilmek için kolları sıvadığımızda her şeyi insanı anlamakla başlar dedik ve bu gayeyle çıktık yola. Sağlık alanındaki çeyrek asırlık tecrübeyle Türkiye'nin ilk ve tek davranış bilimleri ve sağlık temalı üniversitesi ünvanına kavuşmamıza uzanan yolculuğumuz böyle başladı. Kısa zamanda çok büyük mesafeler kat ederek ülkemizi bilimin ışığında parlak yarınlara taşıyacak gençler yetiştirmiş olmanın mutluluğunu yaşıyoruz. İnanıyoruz ki ulusal ve uluslararası ölçekte çağdaş, donanımlı, sorgulayan, araştıran, bilim üreten gençlerimiz de global platformlarda daha birçok başarımız, gururumuz olacak. Biz hayatın içinde bir üniversiteyiz. Bir üniversite beş yerleşke anlayışıyla İstanbul'un farklı noktalarından kolaylıkla ulaşılabilen yerleşkelerimizde öğrencilerimizin kampüs deneyimini şehrin dinamik temposundan kopmadan yaşamasını sağlıyor, onların hayata her an bağlı kalmalarına olarak tanıyoruz. 
Öğrencilerimize teorik ve pratik bilgiyi bir bütün olarak sunduğumuz yapay zekadan farmakogenetiğe kadar pek çok farklı alana yönelik 70'i aşkın laboratuvarımız, televizyon ve radyo stüdyolarımız, ileri teknolojiye sahip dersliklerimiz ve daha birçok modern altyapı özelliğimizle dünya standartlarında bir üniversiteyiz. 6 fakülte, 1 sağlık hizmetleri meslek yüksekokulu ve 5 enstitümüzde hepsi alanlarında yetkin, bini aşkın güçlü akademik ve idari kadromuzla 4 temel ilkemiz olan eleştirilebilirlik, özgürlükçülük, çoğulculuk ve katılımcılığı yüksek öğretimin her alanında uyguluyoruz. Tıp, diş, mühendislik ve doğa bilimleri, iletişim, sağlık bilimleri, insan ve toplum bilimleri alanlarındaki lisans ve sağlık hizmetleri meslek yüksekokulu ön lisans programlarımızın yanı sıra bağımlılık ve adli bilimlerden tasavvuf araştırmalarına kadar farklı branşlara yönelik yüksek lisans ve doktora programlarımızla birlikte Toplamda 22 bine aşkın öğrencimiz de yüksek öğretimde çığır açmaya devam ediyor. 10. yılımızı geride bırakırken verdiğimiz 23 bin mezunumuzla da gurur duyuyoruz. Girişimcilik, üniversite kültürü ve yurt dışındaki birçok saygın üniversiteden önce dünyada ilk kez hayata geçirdiğimiz pozitif psikoloji gibi derslerin yanı sıra yüzlerce ulusal ve uluslararası çapta etkinlikle öğrencilerimizin iyi birer dünya vatandaşı olmalarını amaçlıyoruz. Türkiye'nin ilk bilim ve fikir festivali ve yüksek insani değerler ödülleri gibi geleneksel hale getirdiğimiz geniş kapsamlı etkinlikler ve sosyal sorumluluk projeleriyle kurumsal çalışmalarımızı sosyo-kültürel alanlara da yayıyoruz. Mutlu Yuva, Haydi Tut Elimi Derneği gibi sivil toplum kuruluşlarıyla sevgi ve güven dolu bir geleceğe katkıda bulunurken, bilim ve uygulama ortağımız NP İstanbul Beyin Hastanesi uzmanlarının desteği sayesinde başarıyla sürdürdüğümüz Aileler Üniversitede Projesi ve benzeri çalışmalarla yarınlarımız için sağlam temeller inşa ediyoruz. Arge odaklarımızın yanı sıra Brain Park Teknoloji Transfer Ofisi, Silikon Türk Teknopark gibi teknolojik inovasyonlarla bilimsel çalışmalarda öncü rol üstleniyoruz. Dünyanın 80 ülkesinden 3000'e aşkın uluslararası öğrencimizle farklı medeniyetleri Üsküdar'ın bilim çatısı altında buluşturuyoruz. Yüksek öğretimde uluslararası kalite standartlarına büyük önem veriyoruz. Bu yöndeki tüm çalışmalarımızı Pearson, FEDEC, ILAT, ISO 9001 gibi akreditasyonlarla belgeliyoruz. Kurucu rektörümüz Profesör Doktor Nevzat Tarhan'ın öncülüğünde G20 zirvesine ev sahipliği yapan ilk ve tek Türk üniversitesi olarak beyin konusundaki çalışmalarımıza küresel çapta devam ediyoruz. Geleceğin bilgili ve donanımlı hekimlerini yetiştirdiğimiz tıp fakültemizde afiliye hastanemiz NP İstanbul Beyin Hastanesi ile sürekli işbirliği içindeyiz. Ayrıca sağlık ve uygulama merkezlerimiz olan NP Fener Yolu ve NP Etiler Tıp Merkezimizde de geniş uygulama ve staj olanakları sunuyoruz. Üniversite tercihi gelecek tercihidir. Tercihini iyi bir gelecekten yana kullananlar Üsküdar Üniversitesi'nde buluşuyor, parlak yarınlara emin adımlarla yürüyorlar. Çünkü Üsküdar gerçek bir üniversite. Türkiye'nin beyin üssü Üsküdar Üniversitesi. Merhaba ben Asena. Herkes gibi ben de mutlu olmak istiyorum. Mutlu olmak için önce sevdiğim ve istediğim bölümde olmam gerektiğini biliyorum. Mutluyum çünkü Üsküdar Üniversitesi'nde tarih bölümü öğrencisiyim. Mutlu bir öğrenci olarak sizlere neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimi anlatayım. Bizde Türkiye'de tarih eğitiminde ilkleri yaşamanız mümkün. Bütün bir yıl sadece ders dinlemiyor, pek çok tarihi mekana, arşivlere, müzelere gidiyoruz. Ödevlerimizi sadece evde değil, bizzat sınıflarda, hocalarımız danışmanlığında yapıyoruz. Tarih öğrenimi için çok önemli olan Osmanlıca eğitimini oldukça yoğun alıyoruz. Derslerimizi grup çalışmaları eşliğinde sorgulayarak işliyoruz. Bu fakültede bulunan sosyoloji, felsefe, siyaset bilimi ve uluslararası ilişkileri bölümleri ile birlikte karşılıklı etkileşimle ders görüyoruz. Bir yandan tarih öğrenirken, diğer yandan multidisipliner bir bakış açısıyla hayata hazırlanıyoruz. Her şeyden önemlisi burada yüzün hep gülüyor. Sen de hem mutlu olmak hem de tarih okumak istiyorsan bize katıl. Medya ve iletişimden Sude ben. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra medya ve iletişim uzmanı olmak istedim. Mutlu olmadan olduğu şeyin bir önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir medya iletişim uzmanı olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'nin tercih ettiğinden bahsedeyim size. Bölümde akademik ve bilimsel anlayış üzerine odaklanıyorsunuz. Bu nedenle daha çok alana akademisyen, araştırmacı ve bilim insanı yetiştirme misyonu etrafında biçimlenebiliyorsunuz. Üsküdar Üniversitesi Televizyonu, Radyosu ve Üsküdar Haber Ajansı gibi üniversitemizin medya organlarında görev alarak daha okul yıllarında medya ile iç içe oluyorsunuz. 
Bunun dışında yıl boyu düzenlenen etkinliklerde sektörün önde gelen isimleriyle bir araya gelme imkanı oluyor. Her şeyden önce burada yüzün hep biliyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra medya ve iletişim uzmanı olmak istiyorsan bize katıl. Merhaba, ben Elif Nur, psikoloji bölümü öğrencisiyim. Hem mutlu olmak hem de psikolog olmak istedim hep. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir psikolog olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ne tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Davranış ve sağlık bilimlerinde Türkiye'nin ilk ve tek tematik üniversitesinden mezun oluyorsun. Pozitif psikoloji dersiyle hayata bambaşka pencereden bakma fırsatı yakalıyorsun. Üniversite Hastane İşbirliği modeliyle akademik ve klinik eğitimin iç içe olduğu bir lisans tecrübesi elde ediyorsun. Multidisipliner eğitim kültürünü oluşturma idealiyle dünya standartlarının üstünde bilim üretme hedefini bizzat hissediyor ve görüyorsun. Türkçe ve İngilizce eğitim olanağın var. Kurucu rektörümüz Profesör Doktor Nevzat Tarhan Endüriyündeki güçlü akademik kadro ile seni kariyer hayatına en iyi şekilde hazırlıyor. Her şeyden önce burada yüzüm hep gidiyor. Ee, hem mutlu olmak hem psikolog olmak istiyorsan bize katıl. Merhaba, ben felsefe 3. sınıf öğrencisi Öznur Aynural. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra felsefe okumak istedim hep. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir felsefe mezunu olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Sokrates'in dediği gibi, kendini tanı, yolculuğun burada başlıyor. Okumak, sorgulamak, araştırmakla donandığın 4 yılın sonunda akademisyenlik, çeşitli şirketlerde felsefe danışmanlık, basın yayın organlarında ve yayın evlerinde editörlük, yazarlık, eleştirmenlik, reklamcılık yapabiliyorsun. Kamu ve özel sektörde, sivil toplum kuruluşlarında, hukuk, finans, tıp, medya, sanat gibi çeşitli alanların toplumsal hizmet projelerinde ve etik danışma kurullarında çalışabiliyorsun. Her şeyden önce yüzün burada hep gülüyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, Sonra felsefe okumak istiyorsan bize katı. Merhaba, ben Ahmet Arslan. Sosyoloji bölümü öğrencisiyim. Hayatım boyunca önce mutlu olmak, sonra sosyoloji okumak istedim hep. Aldığım sosyoloji eğitimim sayesinde her ikisinin de özdeş kavramlar olduğunu fark ettim. Şimdi size neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'nin sosyoloji bölümünü tercih ettiğimi anlatayım. Bölümdeki dersler toplumsal olaylar açıklama, yorumlama, eleştirme ve çözme ihtiyaçlarına karşılık vermeye yardımcı olan bir içeriğe sahip. Bu ihtiyacı karşılamak için gerekli olan temel kuramsal konular ve araştırma yöntemleri kapsamlı bir sosyolojik literatür çerçevesinde alanında deneyimli hocalar tarafından aktarılıyor. İstanbul gibi bir metropolde sağ çalışmaları vasıtasıyla pratiğe geçirme olanağı da sunuyor. Bu da bana mutlu bir toplumun nasıl inşa edileceği hususunda vizyon ve misyon kazandırıyor. Her şeyden önce hep yüzün gülüyor burada. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra sosyolog olmak istiyorsan bize katıl. Merhaba, ben yeni medya gazetecilik bölümünden Burak. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra gazeteci olmak istedim ben. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir gazeteci olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Hepimizin gözlemlediği gibi internetle birlikte medya ve gazetecilik alanında çok radikal, yapısal ve işlevsel dönüşüm süreçleri başladı. Yazılı basın, görsel, işitsel medya gibi ayrımlar ortadan kalkarak bütünleşik dijital yeni medya yapılanması ortaya çıktı. İşte burada yeni medya ve gazetecilik alanındaki bu yeni duruma uygun bir profesyonel olmalı odaklı eğitim alıyorsun. Dijital içerik üretebilen ve yönetebilen, yeni medyanın tüm özelliklerini kullanabilen bir profesyonel olma hedefleniyor. Ayrıca yeni medya okuryazarı direklerine sahip olarak medya içeriklerini eleştirel bakabilmeyi öğreniyorsun. Mesleki etik değerlere uygun davranmanın gazetecilik mesleği açısından ne kadar önemli olduğunu kavruyorsun. Her şeyden önce burada yüzün hep biliyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra gazeteci olmak için bize katıl. Reklam tasarımı ve iletişim öğrencisi Zehra Güneş. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra reklamcı olmak istedim hep. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. Ben de mutlu bir reklamcı olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğinden bahsedeyim size. Nitelikli bir akademisyen kadrodan 4 yıl boyunca eğlenerek, keyif alarak eğitim görüyorsun. İlgi ve yönelimlerine yanıt vermeye elverişli bir ders programın oluyor. Sektörle işbirliği içinde hazırlanan bir eğitim öğretim programı oluyor. Bu eğitim kapsamında hem reklam sektörüne hem de akademik çalışma yapmakta olan kurumlara profesyonel bir iletişimci olmaya hazırlanıyorsun. Her şeyden önce yüzün burada hep gülüyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, 
sonra reklamcı olmak istiyorsan size katıl. Ben Eylül, Üsküdar Üniversitesi Halkla İlişkiler Bölümü öğrencisiyim. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra halkla ilişkiler uzmanı olmak istedim hep. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir halkla ilişkiler uzmanı olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Bölümde insanların neden ve nasıl iletişim kurduklarından başlayarak medyanın insan ve toplumlara etkisini, devletlerin, kurumların ve markaların işleyişini ve dev halkla ilişkiler kampanyalarının nasıl yapıldığını öğreniyorsunuz. Yıl boyu düzenlenen etkinlikler sayesinde sektörün önde gelen isimleriyle birlikte çalışma imkanı yakalıyorsun. Her şeyden önce burada hep yüzün gülüyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra halkla ilişkileri uzmanı olmak için bize katıl. Merhaba ben Sezer, radyo, televizyon ve sinema öğrencisiyim. Önce mutlu olmak istedim. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir radyo, televizyon ve sinema mezunu olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Nitelikli bir akademik kadrodan ders alıyorsun. Ders gördüğün alanlar fiziki ve teknik donanımlı mekanlardan, laboratuvarlardan oluşuyor. Radyo ve televizyon stüdyolarında teorik ve uygulamalı eğitimi bir arada görüyorsun. Yalnızca bugün değil, geleceği de dikkate alarak hazırlanmış bir müfredatın var. Kalifiye meslek insanları olarak yetiştirildiğini her an hissediyorsun. Yıl boyu düzenlenen etkinliklerde sektörün önde gelen isimleriyle bir araya gelme imkanı buluyorsun. Ü TV ve Ü Radyo stüdyolarında pratik imkanı oluyor. Her şeyden önce burada yüzün hep gülüyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra radyocu, televizyoncu veya sinemacı olmak istiyorsan bize katıl. Merhaba arkadaşlar, ben Nur. Üsküdar Üniversitesi Görsel İletişim Tasarımı Öğrencisi. Her şeyden önce mutlu olmak ve iyi bir görsel iletişimci olmak istedim. Çünkü mutlu olmadan yaptığımız için hiçbir önemi yok. O zaman neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi Görsel İletişim Tasarımı Bölümü tercih ettiğinden size birazcık bahsedeyim. Sıkılmadan eğlene eğlene, 4 yıl genelden ödeler. Kurumsaldan uygulamaya, birbirini tamamlayan dersler görüyorsun. İkinci sınıftan itibaren genelde mek laboratuvarında oluyorsun. Alanında uzman, kalifiye meslek insanı olarak yetiştirildiğini her an hissediyorsun. Yalnızca bugünü değil, geleceği de dikkate alarak hazırlanmış bir müfredatın var. Mezuniyetten sonra artık sen ne istersen. Ajans, medya, kurumsal. Her şeyden önce burada yüzüne kuruyor. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra da iyi bir görsel iletişimci olmak istiyorsan bize kat. İstanbul'un kalbi Üsküdar'da Türkiye'nin beyin üssünü kurmak ve dünya çapında bir üniversite olabilmek için kolları sıvadığımızda her şeyi insanı anlamakla başlar dedik ve bu gayeyle çıktık yola. Sağlık alanındaki çeyrek asırlık tecrübeyle Türkiye'nin ilk ve tek davranış bilimleri ve sağlık temalı üniversitesi ünvanına kavuşmamıza uzanan yolculuğumuz böyle başladı. Kısa zamanda çok büyük mesafeler kat ederek ülkemizi bilimin ışığında parlak yarınlara taşıyacak gençler yetiştirmiş olmanın mutluluğunu yaşıyoruz. İnanıyoruz ki ulusal ve uluslararası ölçekte çağdaş, donanımlı, sorgulayan, Uh, structural brain alterations in bipolar disorders, as well as the use of artificial intelligence in neuropsychiatry and cognitive impairments in uh, major depressive disorders, and uh, as well as uh, uh, neuroplasticity. So, 
as the first speaker, I would like to introduce you, uh, Hojat uh, Azatbach. So hi everyone, uh, my name is Hojat Azadbach and I'm the CEO of a company called AI Gnostics based in the UK and an already professor of biomedical imaging at the University of Manchester. So the talk today is on uh, dementia and uh, we probably all know why dementia because it, uh, every three seconds a person is diagnosed with dementia yet uh, we, we still don't have a proven diagnostic test for dementia let alone a test that can predict who's going to develop dementia in the future. And this has obviously led to aspiring costs for healthcare providers uh, and poor outcomes for patients, and also failures for pharma companies because they can't accurately and confidently recruit to, into the trials by pharma companies. So yet uh, you see many scientific works showing that simply using by deep learning, they can achieve very high accuracies for predicting who's going to develop dementia using standard clinical outcomes. But when you take these methods into clinical practice and expose it to real life data, the performance drops uh, to around 80%. Uh, and that's generally the case. If you look at the literature, there are loads of studies showing the use of AI and machine learning in dementia. But in real world applications, the, uh, because of the lack of generalizability of the AI models, you have issues uh, of performance. This is why at Aenostics we've developed a groundbreaking AI engine called IQ. And IQ is uh, dedicated to neuropathologies, and it's the world's first multi-parametric AI engine purely for neurodiagnostics. And it can seamlessly combine information from sources such as medical images, patient records, blood and fluid biomarkers, genetic tests, and wearables to allow for the earlier and much more accurate diagnosis of these conditions. So IQ is a platform technology. To achieve this multimodal and multi-parametric approach, it combines information from and technologies in areas such as image acquisition, data pre-processing, AI, data visualization and standardization, and big data. And it allows IQ to be able to diagnose various neurological pathologies, such as chronic headaches, schizophrenia, stroke, dementia, tumors, and MS. Uh, and today, I'm going to focus on this application in dementia in uh, particular. So our dementia processing pipeline for IQ is fully automated. So it can take pretty much any type of imaging modality uh, like CT, MR, uh, and contrast enhanced imaging and patient derived information such as uh, cognitive assessment scores uh, and perform fully automated analysis within less than a minute of all of this data uh, versus traditional volumetric analysis methods that would take uh, usually hours uh, to achieve this uh, sort of analysis. And uh, so it, from the time data is acquired on the scanner all the way to diagnosis is a matter of minutes. And it incorporates various uh, kind of uh, USBs and modules. But the main ones that I'm going to talk about today is around data pre-processing and the application of AI on data pre-processing, not inference, and why that is important. So in IQ, we have uh, an array of proprietary technologies such as image tagging, quality control, artifact detection and removal, and data harmonization, which actually matter a lot and people usually ignore and don't really use AI for these applications. And I'm going to talk about why that is important. So when you apply IQ for dementia diagnosis and looking at data from sources such as ADNI, so the Alzheimer's Disease uh, Neuroimaging Initiative data set, which is a very well-known study uh, data set in this area, we took only the T1 structural scans from uh, 1.5 and 3 Tesla scanners in the ADNI cohort and the age and gender of the cohort uh, from 209 healthy controls, 209 subjects with confirmed Alzheimer's disease and 209 MCI subjects that never developed Alzheimer's disease and 209 which went on to develop Alzheimer's disease. And we exposed this to the IQ and we showed that IQ can very accurately diagnose people with Alzheimer's disease with a very high accuracy of 97% compared to neurologists, which generally have an accuracy of around 75 at, or at best 80%, or best competitors that use volumetric analysis, which give you around 86% performance. But more impressively, IQ can predict who is going to develop dementia, so the MCI cohort, who is going to develop dementia up to seven years earlier before they had the diagnosis of dementia. And this is using data from a single visit and non-invasive MRI scans. So, but how is this achieved? So, as I said, we can get 92% accuracy, 
but usually people just use AI for inference and pattern recognition, but if you switch off all the pre-processing components, the accuracy drops to 83%. So it actually shows the importance of data cleaning and uh, quality control for this sort of analysis. So let's look at that. So quality control, what, what I mean by that, I'm going to describe it, it gives us 2% increase in accuracy by simply performing tasks like using a deep learning engine uh, to tag your imaging data. So usually in trials and uh, in studies, you have different acquisitions. So you might have uh, structural MRI scans, you might have flare imaging, diff diffusion-weighted imaging. And if you look at, for example, a pharma trial where you have uh, more than 1,000 data sets. So we have had pharma trials data with 10,000 images. You can't manually uh, label those images. So we've trained the artificial intelligence engine that can accurately uh, tag imaging data from various modalities with an accuracy of 99%. So it automates the subsequent processing tasks, so there's no human error there. And then it can also detect artifacts. So for example, when you're dealing with uh, diffusion data, it can accurately uh, identify artifacts such as motion in the scanner and report it in real time to the radiologist. So if there's motion in the scanner, it will tell the radiologist that the scan needs to be repeated. Whereas if you don't do this and perform analysis, your performance drops. So this is fully automated as well as part of the pipeline. So you could see based on this, IQ can actually tag and triage pretty much any modality going from CT, MRI, PET imaging, and contrast enhanced imaging as well. So it makes it a multi-parametric and multimodal engine. The second module is data harmonization, and that gives you around 2.5% increase in accuracy. And what I mean by harmonization is that usually you have data from various scanners. So let's say hospital A has data from a GE scanner, and in hospital B you have data from a Philips scanner. And even if it's in the same field of strength, the data is looking different. And if you train your AI algorithm on data from hospital A and apply it to data from hospital B, the, the results would not look the same. And you have to use some sort of data harmonization to adjust the quality and the SNR of the signal of the scans, but re retain any detail of the brain, including pathological features in your image. And we do this quite accurately. So as you can see here, the input, the original data, uh, and input references, it matches the output data to look and uh, feel like the same reference data for your AI training and inference. So that's quite important as well. The next module is quality enhancement. So when you have data, and that gives you another improvement in accuracy. But quality enhancement is, for example, if you have in clinical settings, we usually have 1.5 or 3 Tesla scan, uh, scanners, whereas in research, you might have 7 Tesla uh, scanners. But if you perform something like diffusion-weighted imaging, the uh, quality in terms of SNR and your resolution is going to look very different to your 7 Tesla data. But you can use AI to enhance your quality of your 3T data to look almost identical, on identical to your 7 Tesla data. And it actually improves the 7 Tesla data as well. So you're getting rid of a lot of uh, noise in your data sets as well. And when you do something like this, then you can take your, if you do things like tractography, this is data from a 3T scanner, and the same subject is scanned on a 7 Tesla scan on the same day. And this is upsampled data, and you look, it's almost identical in kind of to the naked eye. It looks diff exactly the same. And this kind of technology allows us to take the state of the art in scientific research and apply it into clinical practice. So the, the scan, an, another important thing is that the 7 Tesla scan took an hour to acquire because SNR drops when you have increase in field strength. But this scan, the 3T scan, took only 12 minutes. So it means we can do this kind of analysis, but in clinical practice. So that's another important step. So the last thing is, macrostructural features, because in diseases like dementia, you have uh, features such as wide matter lesions, uh, and that is also the, the case in MS. Uh, so we have an AI engine that simply segments the MS lesions with a very high accuracy compared to human raises and ne neurologists, but it also encodes information around where the MS lesion is in the brain. So for example, in every lobe, where is it uh, in kind of reference to the corpus callosum? Because the location of the appearance of, of the MS lesion really matters around uh, when it comes to subtyping pathologies and the subsequent progression of the uh, disease. And we then feed this information into the artificial intelligence engine, and it shows that there's a kind of increase in accuracy, and we, reach, we go from 83% now to 92%. 
And this shows the importance of good pre-processing and cleaning of the data. So you, sh you can't just simply use black box AI models and th uh, throw data at it and think that the data is going to give, uh, it's going to give you good performance. Another important feature of IQ is uh, interpretability because most AI algorithms are black box models. You don't know what is happening inside the model. You can have a guess and try to decode it, but usually you have an input and you have an output. Whereas with IQ, it's using deep learning, but it's fully interpretable. So when it analyzes the image, it tells you where in the imaging data it found differences for that subject. Uh, that it's, it's, probability as a, as it's probably due to pathology. And this allows the user, the human user, to interrogate and be confident about the outcomes of the model. And another important thing is that it's, uh, conditions like dementia have various subtypes. So you have dementia, MS, schizophrenia, which have subtypes. And subtyping is very important. So IQ using the same structural scan, it can accurately subtype uh, pathologies like dementia and tell you what subtype of uh, dementia the subject has. And this is achieved uh, in a data-driven way. So what we do is we give IQ, let's say, 1,000 images from uh, kind of people with dementia. And it can then build a model of how disease progression occurs in a subtype which it finds to be Alzheimer's disease and in a subtype which is frontotemporal dementia. And in Alzheimer's disease, it tells you that, for example, the disease starts in areas such as the hippocampus and amygdala, and automatically it identifies that in frontotemporal dementia, actually hippocampus is later down the list, but you start off with frontal lobe and temporal lobe atrophy. And this is fully data-driven, and it, this allows us to then take a new subject's data and say IQ will tell you actually with a high accuracy that this subject belongs to subtype A of dementia, and what a stage of progression they're at. So it can tell you how far away they are from developing dementia, Alzheimer's disease. So for example, is it going to be in one year's time or two years' time that they're likely to develop dementia? So it gives you that temporal as aspect as well. Another important thing with dementia is that uh, you would want to characterize the biological drivers of disease. Usually dementia is thought of uh, kind of uh, being driven by biological drivers such as the presence of amyloid and tau plaques and proteins in the brain. And usually to quantify amyloid and tau, you have to perform PET imaging, which is very expensive. It exposes the patients to ionizing radiation, and it's not generally available in most clinical practice settings. Or you have to have a lumbar puncture, which is invasive as well. But using standard T1 structural scans with IQ, we can actually predict very accurately if someone's dementia is driven by tau or amyloid pathology. And this is very promising because in the future when there is a disease modifying treatment, it's likely to be targeting amyloid or tau. So it means that using standard clinical non-invasive scans, we could predict who's going to develop dementia and if the dementia is, for example, driven by amyloid pathology and can they benefit from a disease modifying treatment that targets amyloid in the future. And this is very cheap because it's using a standard MRI scans from 1.5 and 3 Tesla scanners. Another thing as well, I'm not going to go to, into too much detail on this, but given other types of data, such as diffusion, uh, fMRI, or EEG, we could also construct uh, connectivity matrices, uh, so uh, functional and structural connectivity, which is obviously very important for uh, looking at pathology, such as autism, schizophrenia, and also dementia as well. So all of this technology that I described, and IQ is driving our first product pipeline, which is called BRAIN. BRAIN is targeting imaging departments and radiologists, and has already, uh, last month, it achieved FDA breakthrough device designation in the US, and is also ad already adhering to C uh, standards in Europe. And brain analyzes, fully automated and analyzes brain scans, and it tells you about disease features such as uh, white matter, hypo, and hyper intensities on T1 and flare images, uh, the disease probability map, and also kind of tells you, for example, the likelihood of someone being uh, a subtype of dementia and how far they're, they're away from developing Alzheimer's disease and what's the diagnostic confidence. So finally, I, I'd like to thank our team at Aeronostics, uh, which uh, includes a lot of uh, kind of uh, bright talent in areas such as AI and machine learning, and our various collaborators uh, and scientific partners uh, around the world, uh, which are helping us accelerate this technology. Thank you very much. Uh, where is the doctor? I need to just uh, add uh, more inquiry. Where our doctor here for the last uh, lecture? Yeah. 
Sorry. Uh, actually, uh, it is very important and uh, interesting result, especially okay. for me, like a neurosurgeon. Uh, I think you. this is open a book for diagnosis of psychiatric disease, like bipolar and the schizophrenia. I think yes, we sir. are going. We are going to a new era. Psychiatric disease, as we all know, we don't have investigation by lab to differentiate between bipolar, for example, and schizophrenia. We don't have a lab or radiological study. This is highly important. So uh, your result is of utmost important. Thank you very so, much. Thank you for your work and you. uh, also for your spectacular result. Thank you. Second, uh, this is not an inquiry. You can take it as, are you ready to deliver this speech next year with a recent advance in Egypt? So we are already working in other territories, uh, and we are quite interested in exploring the deployment of this technology in other regions as well. So for example, we are exploring the same in Iran as well to deploy this technology in those regions. And we anticipate that the product launch will happen in autumn this year. So you next- Do they still answer my inquiry? Second, you yeah. are ready yeah. to next year, 2023? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we are. We you are, are ready? Yes. So it's already got the regulatory okay. approval as a medical device. So and it's going so to be launched this year. So you can consider an invitation for me to deliver this, especially on Alexandria, in or around, like we're talking on a scientific term. Thank you. Sure, sure. I'll be Thank glad you. to discuss this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Rajat, for uh, presenting us this wonderful software and work. I would like to have a question to you. And uh, can you please uh, talk a little bit more about the features that can distinguish uh, the amyloid pathology on T1 images? I mean, what kind of features uh, does the artificial intelligence use to detect presence of tau? Is it reliable? Is it generalizable? Yeah, so uh, the way that we train this algorithm to be able to detect tau amyloid on PET imaging is uh, it has data from a large number of, is it okay? A large number of subjects who've had structural MRI scans and PET imaging, and it's learned the relationship between M MRI scans and PET imaging. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's able to simulate the outcomes of PET imaging using MRI scans. So we're taking uh, the T1 scans as a label, uh, but training it to predict PET imaging outcomes from the, uh, so it's almost like a GAN network. Uh, so it's learning to simulate MRI scans. And in terms of uh, then validating this result, we've had uh, some uh, histology also, uh, scans on in vitro scans in subjects who've had in vivo images before they've passed away and we've performed histology to see the sites where we predict there's tau amyloid, for example, a tau, tau amyloid pathology. In histology, look, uh, it's, it's, you can see actually the presence of uh, amyloid uh, and tau proteins and tangles as well. So we've done histology validation of this as well. And also the goal of the standard biomarker is the PET imaging, and as I showed, it has a very high correlation of uh, up to 0.9 uh, with the tau outcomes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next presenter is Ra Zahra Amjadi Goigi, and uh, she is going to talk about cognitive impairments and brain imaging findings in el elderly patients with major depressive disorders. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm follow up neuropsychiatry from Tehran University of Medical Sciences, and today I'm speaking about um, cognitive impairment and neuroimaging findings in elderly patients with late life depression. This review is done by uh, 
supervis supervision of my dear professor, Dr. Oh, louder, okay. Okay. And uh, the main question is, how does it matter? Why, uh, we, uh, why do we care about uh, depression in late life and in elderly patients? Because depression is uh, one of the most common psychiatric disorder with a um, huge economic burden. And like dementia, it causes uh, increased disability in this uh, population and uh, it causes high healthcare utilization and cognitive decline and premature mortality. And another, uh, on the other hand, uh, depression in late life could be uh, differentiated by other conditions like CNS disorder, uh, for example, Parkinson's disease or neuroplastic lesions, uh, and other um, system disorder like endocrine and um, some pharmacological agents like beta blocker or steroids. And uh, we know in elderly patients, uh, multi-drug uh, treatment is very usual. Uh, so it is uh, complicating the condition in senior citizens. About a statistic uh, for late life depression, a uh, study uh, um, called Global Burden of Disease by Foundation of Bill Gates uh, ran uh, uh, till to 2019, and uh, it shows prevalence of major depression in elderly about 13.3%, uh, the highest prevalence in Australia, 20%, 20 uh, which followed by Europe, about 12%. And about regional prevalence, uh, I found uh, this data about Middle East and Eastern Mediterranean region, uh, which uh, shows about 20% prevalence during uh, population in this region. And about Iran, 2004, um, run a study by Dr. Nurbala, professor in neurology, uh, psychiatry in Tehran University, and it shows uh, estimation about 34% uh, depression in uh, Iranian patients. Uh, some uh, study uh, run about um, addressing uh, elderly people and showed about 23% uh, uh, of subjects uh, got diagnosis of uh, depression and in minority uh, Turk as very older adults. This prevalence is about um, up to a severity of depression is about uh, 28, 10, and 3 percent, respectively about minor, moderate, and severe depression. About pathophysiology, I skip this slide. Uh, I, I'm trying to restrict it, the data just to category neurocognition and neuroimaging. Neurocognition in uh, normal body aging and MDD and LLD. I try to uh, summarize the data. Uh, composite concepts uh, about con cognitive functioning is a model to explain about neurocognition. And it has three domains, memory, executive function, and attention, which uh, have several aspects. And we, uh, I, I know uh, all of us uh, are familiar with the neuropsychological batteries and questionnaires to assess these aspects of neuropsychological functions. Uh, in this uh, diagram, we can see uh, all neurocognitive functions are decreasing during aging, except word knowledge uh, is called crystallized intelligence. And uh, it's the same slide. And uh, by aging, uh, brain structural changing could be led in, leading in uh, some changing in neurocognitive functioning of brain. For example, uh, white matter loss could uh, lead in uh, slowing in information processing and uh, mediotemporal dysfunctioning uh, could lead in uh, long-term memory dysfunction. 
about sensory cortex, uh, yet mm, there isn't enough uh, data, solid um, results, but uh, some recently studies um, running about sensory cortex and showed the uh, visual associative area dysfunction is associated with depression in late life depression. And because of time limitation, I have to skip. And about neurocognition in MDD, findings about neurocognitive uh, impairment in MDD is so far uh, divergent and non-conclusive. It may be because of um, non-homogeneous population and uh, inclusion exclusion criteria and the measures to assess the neurocognitive uh, function in patients. But uh, there are three, uh, three models for explain a major neurocognitive profile. The first one is a state hypothesis. It explains how neurocognitive impairment could be affected by uh, depressive symptoms in patient and treatment uh, can impact on the, this state in per, uh, patients. The second one is a SCAR hypothesis, and it says about how depression uh, and depressive episodes could be um, uh, harmful and change permanently uh, in uh, brain structure. And the third hypothesis is trait hypothesis, which explain without uh, regard, uh, regarding uh, depressive symptoms, peop, uh, patients could be, uh, have some trait to uh, show impairment in neurocognitive. For example, uh, studies showed first degree relative in MDD patients have uh, impairment in memory without uh, suffering depression. And this image uh, explains this theory about neurocognitive profile, uh, a state, a SCAR and trait hypothesis, and uh, it's about normal aging and depression, which coexisting of these two states uh, we, um, is a higher risk factor for uh, progression to dementia. It causes uh, changing in information processing, attention uh, control, inhibition monitoring, encoding, updating, and task shifting, learning memory, and cognitive planning. Uh, in LL, uh, LLD, to be exact, cognitive impairment is a key feature uh, of this patient and it's uh, not clear that depression in old people is a prodrome of AD or uh, is a very distinct symptom uh, in people, maybe afterwards uh, complicated by dementia. And uh, in assessment for neurocognitive functioning, there are some tips to differentiate dif uh, dementia and depression in elderly people. For example, at least one low score, uh, it could um, cause false positive uh, in uh, healthy people control. Two low scores uh, seems to be a more reliable uh, criterion to identifying impairment in LLD. And three low memory scores is uh, associated with dementia in comparison with LLD, and it could be a promising criterion to differentiate between patients. And about severity of depression was associated with the subnetworks. It's another uh, model to explain how depression is developed in elderly patients. Uh, it's lately uh, designed studies to show uh, how changing a network, for example, default mode network, salient network, uh, could be affect the uh, vulnerab uh, vulnerability of patients to depression. Uh, 
Uh, and in some other studies, APOE4 genotype was associated with worse performance memory. About neuroimaging in these patients, in uh, brain networks uh, appear disruption and in, uh, in this uh, network, this network which are involved in emotion regulation, motivational behavior, cognitive control, executive function, and self-referential uh, thinking, which is strongly associated with pathophysiology of depression. In this diagram, uh, it is uh, depicts, it, it, it depicts the uh, interaction between this network and uh, recently applying resting state functional MR, connectivity MRI is focused on uh, searching for disruption in network, brain network, uh, which involved in uh, dep uh, depressive elderly people. And uh, it shows decreased internet network connectivity between bilateral executive control network and a default mode network like thalamus, basal ganglia, and ventral estereotome. And uh, insula component, we increase internet network connection and in compensatory manner, uh, it could show uh, fewer or increased activity in this network. And uh, it's another promising uh, idea to uh, research to differentiate uh, the course of disease, the trajectory of depression between younger people and older people. And in the uh, study, uh, one study shows um, so, uh, there are some criteria to estimate uh, brain age. Uh, and maybe in young people, uh, older brain age uh, could be risk factor for developing depression. Okay, okay, thank you. I skip this one. And it's about um, summarizing some uh, key findings of neuroimaging, which is about um, preventricular and deep uh, white matter hyperintensity, white matter integrity, and gray matter thinning, and uh, about how these changes in a brain structure could be uh, effective on uh, response to treatment. And I uh, skip vascular dementia. About treatment, uh, Association between cognitive residual symptoms and the relapse of, uh, risk of relapse uh, should be a target for treatment because in elderly people, the response to treatment is very different from younger people. And uh, about, I skip this one, and in conclusion, future research is recommended to be aimed to evaluate whether basic uh, biomedical knowledge uh, can be successfully translated into enhanced health outcomes via the implementation of early uh, intervention paradigm biomarkers with good productive power to uh, useful to tailoring uh, tailored treatment to individuals to precision uh, treatment predictive and uh, preventive uh, should be the aim of future uh, research. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Or okay. Uh, are there any questions, please? So, congratulations for your talk. Uh, I wanted to ask if you have uh, any uh, data about uh, how these networks can change after treatment. How, how the networks that you refer to that are disrupted or not 
normal functioning, how they can uh, okay. change after I, I, treatment and how long after the treatment. Thank you. Uh, I, Uh, I didn't find any study about how uh, disruption in brain network can affect uh, treatment, but I think it's about um, new technology to depressive uh, symptoms. For example, um, DBS or RTMS or TTCS can be focused on the circuits um, are distinguishing by uh, this disruptive uh, network. And about how long? I don't know, because it's in a research I, level. I think you it's mean, not uh, my dear, is uh, after three months or six months or one year, the control to take a baseline before the treatment, this is highly important. And then, uh, I mean, after how long of continuous uh, regular treatment? Six months, one okay. year? Thanks. Okay, it, it's about late life depression and the scope of uh, investigation uh, is, um, is halted our, um, us to, uh, to suggest the time course for uh, response, to re response to treatment. And um, I, I couldn't find any research about this matter. Okay. Yes, because. Yeah, it's a new, and it's not so practical yet. What we should do right now is a follow-up research after treatment. But on the protocol of the upcoming research after your result, in the protocol, after one year or two years... Sorry, year. we have another question up from there. Okay, I, I didn't finish. <laughs> okay. Uh -uh. After how long? No question, just uh, I want to say a comment. Okay? okay. Uh, pardon? Yeah, uh, I'm not sure about TDCS or uh, I'm sure about the medication, uh, about the changing the, the potential to change the network of the brain. But there is good evidence that CBT, cognitive behavioral treatment, at least six months, can change the frontal networks. So uh, it is strongly recommended that the patient with depression, if, yeah, with CBT, uh, can be uh, even without medications. Okay. Maybe there is a, a proposal. Maybe there yeah. could be a proposal. Yeah, at least six months. Okay. Yeah. Could right. Be. Yeah. Okay. Very nice discussion. Thank you for all contributions. Can I, but we have to move, move on. Could we, be a proposal to check the patients with resting state fMRI before and after treatment. Yeah. Uh, the study that I talked about them uh, have uh, proven this fact with functional MRI. Okay. Uh, thank you for your wonderful talk, and uh, we have to move to the next speakers. Excuse me, I uh, think I, uh, I will explain. There is a um, promising treatment, cognitive enhancement therapy, which is offered to uh, addressing the neurocognitive symptoms in this patient in late life depression, and this review is about neurocognitive features in depression. And CBT, uh, okay. it, that's, I guess, at least six months. To Thank be. you. Uh, we have to move to the next speakers. Who Thank is? You. <laughs> Thank you for your nice talk and also nice contribu contributions from the audience. Yes. And this and the next speaker is me. I would like to introduce myself. Okay, uh, I'll talk about structural brain alterations in bipolar disorder patients. Uh, I have introduced already myself uh, yesterday. I'm a neurologist uh, and I work mostly on neuroimaging in neuropsychiatric disorders at, here at Iskudar University. And, uh, 
Uh, yesterday, I presented the results about uh, use of artificial intelligence for uh, identification, so identification of individuals with bipolar disorders. Today, I will talk about structural uh, alterations in their brains. Uh, this study also included uh, the same, more or less, the same subjects that I presented the results yesterday. Uh, so bipolar disorder is, as you will uh, all know, it's characterized by depression and mania or depression and hypomania, and it's associated with a number of neuropsychological deficits, such as uh, impulsiv impulsivity and uh, lack of motivation, and uh, but we uh, we have several studies in the literature. Uh, about the structural alterations in the brains of these individuals that may result in uh, such neuropsychological deficits. And uh, these studies suggest that these individuals with bipolar disorder, of course these results may depend on the phase of the disease because uh, these patients can be in the manic stage or hypomanic stage or in depressed stage and the neuropsychological deficits may differ among those stages but generally we see a, a slowing of psychomotor speed and uh, we have impairments in attention, working memory, cognitive flexibility and response inhibition and, uh, and but not only in attention and uh, psychomotor speeds, there is also an evidence of large effect size, for example, in some areas that we do not expect a major alteration, such as verbal learning, verbal and nonverbal memory, which suggests that the neuropsychological deficits in bipolar disorders are highly generalized. Multi network scale uh, neuropsychological deficits are present, uh, are present in this disorder. And as well as uh, problems with social cognitive uh, processing, such as lack of inhibition in uh, social uh, life, in social relationships, is also well described in bipolar disorders, particularly in uh, manic and hypomanic stages. Uh, so we have attention, working memory, long-term memory, inhibition uh, problems. These deficits might be inherent, might be specific to the bipolar disorders and might be related to the psychopathology, but we are not sure. It may also be due to medications, for example, and also electroconvulsive therapy, which these patients frequently receive, and uh, substance abuse, which is highly comorbid with bipolar disorder and uh, may also change according to the phase of the disorder, depression, mania, etc. So, to be more specific about which systems in the brain, which neuropsychological systems, which networks are impaired in bipolar disorders, it may be safer to look at the stru structural alterations rather than neuropsychological de deficits, which are less affected than, for example, uh, the medication that the person is using or the phase of the illness or, for example, the substances. Uh, so a lot of studies agree on that the ventral prefrontal cortex, particularly insula, as well as temporal cortex, are decreased in terms of gray matter density in these individuals. And mainly we found deficits in insula and inferior frontal gyres, which is a well-known area for uh, restricting unwanted behavior. I mean, it's uh, a key area involved in behavioral in inhibition, as well as anterior cingulate cortex. Insula and anterior, anterior cingulate cortex are uh, together known as the key nodes in the salience network, uh, which is a network the brain uses to ad identify salient or important stimuli from the environment. And so from the bipolar disorder, we can go jump to the structural brain alterations and from structural brain alterations, we can uh, identify which cognitive deficits are inherent 
uh, to the bipolar disorders and which cognitive deficits are secondary. And in this study, we identify 37 individuals with bipolars and 27 controls from MP Istanbul uh, neuropsychiatry hospital databases and there were no significant differences between groups for age and gender. Uh, so we also had extensive cognitive batteries of these individuals. Just I would like to present this before I present the results of the structural MRI comparisons. They had several, imp they had uh, very huge impairments in working memory, Stroop test, which is a test used for uh, inhibition and face recognition, verbal or and nonverbal memory. So I can guess that our sample uh, is uh, matching beautifully uh, to other samples in the literature sh and showing that our sample has wide uh, widespread neurocognitive deficits in several domains. And uh, we identify when we apply very strict Bonferroni corrections, I mean corrections for multiple comparisons. We identify mainly deficits in bilateral anterior insula and right, uh, left supramarginal gyrus in the left hemisphere. So we see that these individuals with bipolar disorder have deficits in gray matter in bilateral anterior insulas. And this is a very huge deficit. Uh, it's, it was very highly significant, very resistant to uh, com uh, corrections for multiple comparisons. And insula is uh, uh, an enigmatic area of our brain whose function is, was not entirely known, is not entirely, no, uh, entirely no, known also by now. And, but mainly we know that the anterior portion is related to social emotional processing. So it's related to social cognition and emotional uh, inhibition, emotional processing. And the posterior part is not that social emotional. It's more related to somatic processing and pain. And uh, it's related to empathy, social con cognition, risky decision making. For example, during fMRI studies, when the subjects play gambling tasks and when they have to really make a risky decision on gambling they activate this insula so it's like a risk taking evaluation hub in the brain and uh, it's related of course to attention and salience processing therefore it's called the key hub of the salience network so left submarginal gyrus is involved in executive functions. In a lot of studies have shown that, but it's also related to a mirror neuron system in the left hemisphere. So it's also highly related to social cognition. It's a part of, key part of left hemisphere mirror neuron system. Mirror neuron system, as you will all know, related to understanding the actions and emotions of other people. And, uh, Yes, here we see Broadman 40, which we found the deficits. It's a part of the left hemisphere mirror neuron system. And so, anterior insula is smaller in bipolar disorder patients, and their left supramarginal gyrus is highly, very, to a large extent, smaller. And these may be associated with empathy uh, problems in bipolar disorders as they are characterized by disinhibition in social decision making and also deficits in social cognition and it may also explain how these people for example make very risky decision makings and thank you for your attention please Very nice presentation, congratulations. Mm -hmm. uh, have you done any correlation also with uh, tractography DTI? Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have tractography data from these individuals. Okay. It's Thanks. very, yes, I would like to have tra tractography data from all neuropsychiatric patients, but as you know, tractography is a very lengthy sequence in MRI. We cannot ob obtain it from all individuals, especially we, uh, from database, we cannot uh, obtain it, uh, but 
for example, we have to design a specific study to mm. uh, have the tractography seconds of these individuals. If I can add my, our experience, uh, we have done in about 50 bipolar patient disorders, and we have seen mainly, it depends on the grade of the bipolar disorder, yeah. and we see mainly a disruption of corpus callosum yes. fibers. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's another field of research. I mean, we here in this study examined gray matter, not white matter. Of course, for white matter study, we have to obtain a DTI sequence. Okay. Uh, I don't have, as a neurosurgeon, a very uh, good background about the pathophysiology, about the bipolar. But I have an inquiry, not a definite uh, Question, uh, is the disturbance in the bipolar starting on the ultrastructure level inside the cell or starting on the bioneurotransmitter uh, on the synapse between the cell? You get what I mean? the change on the basopsychic disorder, the starting of the disturbance is the starting yes. again on the transmitter, neurotransmitter yes. disturbance or starting on the cell. What this mean after your answer? Is that denoting on the tractography would be changing after treatment or not? You get okay. what I mean? These are, I understand clearly your question, but my data is not suitable to answer your question. Okay. In that, because <laughs> these are all linked, so any deficit in neurotransmitter system will also produce deficits in the gray matter and will also produce deficits in the white matter. So it's like a chicken and egg problem. So is it, I mean, which one is coming from the other one? I mean the starting yes. of disturbance, mm -hmm. starting of yes. basophysiology. Yes. Thanks. Uh, I don't know. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, mm -hmm. I uh, don't know if your um, study have, um, I mean, uh, did with this question, but I wanted to know because you have um, shown that there are several neuropsychological uh, testing have been done in the participants. Um, I don't know if you have any data showing that which one of these tests or these cognitive functions predict, um, uh, you know, co converting to um, uh, long-term cognitive impairment or dementia, or can we can we say that these yes. kind of tests? Uh, yes, that's also another issue that is not frequently examined in the literature. Yeah. We, for example, in the hospital see that a lot of patients with bipolar disorder in the long run, they turn to dementia. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they already have deficits when they are really young. Yeah. And these deficits accumulate, become more and more. And they, for example, when they age, they become dementia. Yes. And we don't know, for example, if the bipolar disorder, dementia is a specific type of dementia or for example, if this disorder is associated with a higher incidence of Alzheimer's disorder yeah. or another uh, type of dementia. Yeah, it's, it's so very, yeah, it's a very important. Neuropsychologically, my opinion is that it's a different profile of neuropsychological functioning than Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. I mean, w when you examine the neuropsychological test results, we see that it is not Alzheimer's, it's completely different. Yeah. So yeah. it should be the, psycho the neuropathology and the affected brain regions should also be different. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think it's another type of dementia, I mean, as a continuum of bipolar disorder yeah. in the old age. That's mm -hmm. my opinion. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Okay, now I would like to introduce our last speaker, who is uh, Brihastami Savitri. And he will talk about neuroplasticity and psychotherapy.
So is there any pointers? The pointers? The pointers? It's for the slide? That's it. Uh, good afternoon. Yeah, I thought I was uh, going to talk uh, later in the afternoon, but apparently uh, today. So uh, first, I would like to thank uh, Uskudar University and also the um, ME Plus Brain Initiative uh, for inviting me to talk over here. Um, the title of the talk would be The Understanding of the Perceptions on the Link Between Brain and Mental Disorder, A Road for Destigmatization in Indonesia. My name is Bria Stamis Hawitri, but you can call me Mia because it's easier. I am um, a psychiatrist from the Erlangga Universitas um, Erlangga in Surabaya, uh, and also from Dr. Stomo General Teaching Hospital in Surabaya, uh, which is the largest hospital in Indonesia. Uh, and I'm also currently learning more about um, psychotherapy in the Universitas Indonesia, uh, but I am also interested in uh, community psychiatry and also cultural psychiatry. So, um, actually, uh, calling mental illness as a brain disease is not a new thing, right? Um, but uh, I remember from our, from our first day here, there's a video from Uskuda University. Everything starts from understanding the people in the video. So by uh, hoping in understanding the people, we can do better strategies, how to raise more awareness on mental illness. Uh, that's a very basic question that we all also had uh, on our discussion yesterday. And also how to give better psychoeducation for better uh, health-seeking behavior for the patients and also improve compliance and adherence and also better decision making because we all know that there are so many uh, new development in psycho uh, in, th uh, in therapy for mental illness but not a very uh, well developed in Indonesia okay so as a preliminary study uh, we have a uh, oh, like over a hundred participant already actually right now but uh, these are the uh, people who participate they consider themselves patients uh, and also other lay people are the, most of them and from the demographic um, uh, patterns most of them um, uh, are female and then uh, because the age of consent over there is 17 we found that most of the respondents are from young uh, people young adult and um, probably because uh, we do a lot of uh, our survey uh, uh, com uh, on mobile phone based on online, so uh, probably explains about the demographic patterns. And on knowledge, we found that uh, this is a huge homework for us too, because maybe we are very limited uh, in time. There are only about 600 to 800 psychiatrists for 260 million uh, people in Indonesia. So we probably are very limited in giving proper psychoeducation uh, to our patients. Uh, for example, uh, I also practice in a uh, suburb area, like two hours and a half from Surabaya. Uh, there, I practice uh, one to two days a week. And I, in a day, I, I have to see 100 patients. So you can see it's not very ideal to give a proper psychoeducation or psychotherapy for 100 patients a day. So um, uh, very, very huge homework for them. So. Apparently, not every patient know their own diagnosis or their family doesn't even know their diagnosis. So it's a huge homework for us. And also, um, these are the, uh, the patterns of um, diagnosis that they already know. Uh, of course, uh, probably uh, this explains why most of them doesn't really understand about their diagnosis first because uh, they have been treated less than a year for the people who consider themselves as patient, and also for their families as well. Um, when we ask about the awareness that their mental disorder, their mental symptoms have any correlation with their brain conditions, apparently, uh, most people are not really aware about that. So uh, this is uh, probably a, an opportunity on how we educate 
uh, other people and our patient as well uh, to hope for a better compliance and adherence. And uh, when asked further, uh, most of them only knew that mental disorders are caused by disturbed feeling, not brain, or life trauma, or thinking of or using your head too much, thinking with your brain too much. That's uh, how they explain um, on uh, most of their knowledge about uh, their mental symptoms. We asked them about the stigma around mental disorder, and they agree that there are very strong stigma uh, around mental disorder up until now. And uh, maybe we found much similar to countries in, uh, in your country, but I, uh, uh, most of them consider all mental disorders are the same. Uh, we call them crazy, and uh, mental disorders are always about angry uncontrollably, love uncontrollably, and uh, people who are wandering, and most are considered taboo or a disgrace to their family. Uh, some even consider mental disorders are non-existent, they're just seeking for attention, uh, and some other, uh, because of being woke, <laughs> they consider uh, uh, most of them are either self-diagnosed or judgmental towards other people, you know, diagnosing other people even though they're not um, a mental practitioner. And uh, even most people do not care about their own mental health. Uh, they consider mental illness as not a serious illness or related to spirit possession. Uh, they relate it to karma or committed big sin in the past, that, so that's why they are um, having mental disorder. And uh, some or most consider it um, have correlation with a lack of faith or not close enough to God. Uh, and therefore, mental disorder can be cured with prayers and being thankful enough, etc. And around people with mental disorder, uh, there are still, they feel very strong stigma as well. Um, they found that, uh, uh, they have stigma that people with mental illness are scary and dangerous or weird or weak, unstable, lacking of faith or ungrateful. Uh, we should stay away because they are public enemy and some of them are beyond help and have negative impact to its surroundings, so therefore they should be hidden from the society. Uh, they usually mocked or made fun of. It, uh, it's often discriminated, and also there are still incarceration in several parts in, of Indonesia, unfortunately. Uh, a, uh, a good news is <laughs> the getting help from psychiatrists is getting better because uh, we found that less stigma around go getting to psychiatrists. So uh, probably because uh, we found from the demographic uh, people who are doing the survey are from younger people generation, so uh, it's a good news. Um, although some still found it shameful only for crazy people, and if we go to a psychiatrist, they have bad track records for their um, occupation and, other, uh, and education, and uh, some still hide the fact that they are seeing psychiatrists. Uh, some still think that we should go to a shaman first before we go to a psychiatrist, or some consider it excessive because you look fine, and also expensive, uh, they consider it expensive and also a sign of weakness. On taking psychiatric medication, uh, we've actually found that a stronger stigma actually comes from fellow um, uh, physician or fellow, um, uh, or fellow health workers. Um, some think that um, um, the psychopharmaceutical, uh, uh, um, farm, uh, psychother uh, non psychotherapy, I mean, I mean the uh, uh, pharmacy on, psych on psychiatric drugs are cause addiction and equals to illegal drugs and dangerous for your body. Uh, some are still expensive because we haven't even produced our, not many uh, drugs are produced in Indonesia, so that's why some are still expensive. And uh, consider it shameful to um, take uh, psycho uh, medication, so therefore sometimes they put it in um, a supplement uh, bottle, so they don't, other people don't know that they're taking medication, and some still think that prayer should be enough to cure other than taking drugs. And we asked them, do you agree that stigma will be reduced by increasing awareness that the mental disorders are related to brain condition? Most of them agree that uh, it will affect the stigma on mental disorder and also around people with mental disorder. 
as well as going to psychiatrists and also taking psychiatric medication. On psychotherapy, because we found that uh, part of we are lacking of the time to do the psychotherapy, uh, but we are also lacking of the compliances for people to go to see a psychiatrist to do the psychotherapy. Um, but uh, lucky for us, uh, most still think that psychotherapy can help alleviate mental disorders, although less people uh, believe that psychotherapy can also alter your brain condition. On brain surgery, this is, uh, we found it really, um, I'm really eager to know what they think about brain surgery on, uh, psycho uh, on uh, mental disorder, because as the biggest hospital in Indonesia, we haven't even, uh, I've, I learned that from my colleagues from the brain surgeon, we haven't done any brain surgery on a mental condition. Uh, not any uh, deep brain stimulation or whatsoever, right? So it's, it's a huge opportunity to develop. Uh, so we want to know how they feel about um, brain surgery on certain uh, symptoms on mental disorder. And mostly, like, 73% uh, have no idea that certain brain surgery may alleviate certain symptoms of brain disorder. And it will be very interesting to know what the psychiatrists know about that, because maybe not even uh, enough psychoeducation are given about that from the psychiatrists as well. And will you consider brain surgery as an option for mental disorder for you or your family? Um, well, as we see that there are um, uh, possibilities for them to consider. We want to know what are the considerations. Uh, of course, the risk and benefit, and of course, some still, if it's the last option and the only way, and they would consider if it's a permanent result, and if it's suggested by the doctors or considered best option by the doctors, they would consider it. So that's why the role of psychiatrists is very, very important on that matter. And also, they would, uh, they would hoping for a quicker response, because uh, if uh, some medications are not uh, uh, they don't respond well with certain medication, and they would uh, com uh, they would uh, definitely consider it if it may uh, help them if it means for them to return or improve quality of life, even though adverse effect also cost and uh, uh, chance for improvement also uh, apart from them uh, because our culture. Being agreed by all family member apparently is an important equation too for them. So because we're um, still uh, not a nuclear family, a standard family. So in some families, uh, everybody has to be has to agree on that matter. Their grandparents, their cousins, etc. Okay. So for a discussion, uh, apparently there are still gaps on knowledge of mental disorders from cost to treatment and also stigma around mental disorder that affected are very still high, even though uh, for psychiatrists and medication prescribed by psychiatrists are far better from the previous um, years, because um, especially among younger generation. And uh, most respondents agree that raising awareness on mental disorder linked to brain condition will further reduce the stigma. And by understanding patient and family's perception, better strategies can be taken to empower them. Of course, there are several limitations to this uh, pre uh, preliminary study. And also, uh, we hope that by improving psychoeducation and raising awareness strategies, we may contribute towards better destigmatization effort. And less stigma leads to better stig health seeking behavior, uh, because we know that uh, longer duration of untreated uh, psychosis and other conditions uh, uh, correlated with uh, worse um, prognosis and better adherence and improved shared decision-making process for better outcome and better quality of life for people with mental disorder and their families, including brain surgeries. Um, these are the references. Thank you. Terima kasih. Tasekur. Shukran. I would like to know more. Okay. Thank you. Yes. So I am not speaking too long. Uh, Professor Terker, I need you here. Sorry? You need I, me? Yes, here, please. I will tell you why. Okay. I'm here? Yeah, please. No, no, no, no. No, no, no. Here. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> I noticed something. But Professor Tahran, he is the guide for the mic for inquiry. 
when I took too much, he asked the, the mic to be transferred from me. So that is why I kept him here. <laughs> this is the first. Second, for you, you are sincere and uh, you are honest. Thank you. Thank you. Because you are mentioning a small uh, details in a very sincere and honest way. Thank you. However, my uh, speciality is a neurosurgeon. That's it. Finish. Okay. Take, Thank you. <laughs> no. Thank you, Dr. Fahmi. Since we have limited time, um, I'll be happy to. <laughs> I'll be happy to invite uh, Vicky Yamamoto to the floor. Yeah, thank you. We, we have to skip a break because we have limited time to catch up the lunch. So Vicky, the floor is yours. Thank can you. I, thank you. Can I, uh, uh, can I um, comment on the remark? Uh, I think, uh, I think uh, I thank you very much because uh, about the honesty because it, it is a self criticism as well for us because we need to work more closely to other specialists as well. So, oh, um, I'm working in uh, in Surabaya in Indonesia. It's a general hospital. Yes, thank you very much. No, no, we're very present. we're looking forward for that. So we need to give uh, to have more input on that. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Dr. Mia, there's one more question if you don't Can mind. we get the questions after this second following one because we have limited time. We sure. will be having the next one, then sure. we will be getting the questions. Thank you. So Vicky, floor is yours. Vicky. So you're going to start with your presentation so we can take you here. Welcome to our uh, neuro oncology session. Um, so, um, for the sake of time, uh, we will have uh, strictly we will have a 15 minutes of a talk for each speaker. And uh, I think it's uh, or, uh -huh. hello. Yes. Uh -huh. Hi. Oops. Oh, it's okay. Maybe this one is. Uh, yeah, this one probably works better. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, so each speaker will have 15 minutes uh, and question and answer at the end of the session. So, first of all, thank you very much uh, for the Yuskudara University and uh, Dr. Tarhan for uh, allowing us to co-organize this first uh, Middle East um, uh, Brain Initiative Summit, which I think is a historical, and also Dr. Turk <laughs> for uh, all the you know the organizations and the logistics and the coordination, and uh, we don't know what we would do without you. Thank you. So um, I'm going to begin my talk, so let me introduce myself. I'm Vicky Yamamoto. Um, I'm actually currently working as a science cancer scientist at the USC Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center. And specifically, my work is mainly in on uh, head and neck cancer. So this time, I uh, actually would like to, uh, nothing to disclose. So basically today, uh, because this is a neuro-oncology, I would like to just state an uh, overview about the current status of the cancer incidence and the cost as well as the new and promising treatments for GBM uh, done by others and also some of my colleagues at the USC and the Society for Brain Mapping. And the uh, uh, our, our organization's approach to lower the burden of the cost, fast-track therapy, and then try to make this therapy available and accessible to uh, all. So cancer is a worldwide problem, as you can see from all these statistics, that um, those uh, entire world, as we are getting more Asian and live longer, which is a great thing, but then at the same time, um, as we grow older and older, there will be an increased chance of uh, getting cancer. And because of this, the number of uh, cancer death and cancer incidence are uh, expected to increase further in the next 25 years or so. So when it comes to see the uh, um, CNS or uh, um, cerebral uh, brain tumors uh, cancer incident, uh, in the United States, um, as a reference, uh, we have a case about, uh, oops, it's not working, okay, U.S. is about about seven per uh, 100,000 uh, cases, I mean 100,000 uh, people in a population, but if you take a look at the worldwide, 
Um, if you take a look at, let's say, Middle Eastern region, uh, because this is a Middle Eastern Brain Initiative, uh, you see that compared to the United States or European uh, countries, the incidents are actually slightly lower, unfortunately. Uh, and then for some reason, if you take a look at the northern part of Nordic countries, like uh, Finland and uh, Denmark, for some reason, actually, the number of cases are almost a double as in the United States, which the reason we actually do not know. So when in terms of the annual incident rate in Middle Eastern and in non-Middle Eastern country, I was got curious about like, what the situation is like. So this is a, a statistic uh, just uh, published uh, recently in, back in 2020, uh, males and females uh, uh, incident uh, rate. So if you take a look at it, um, as uh, uh, we expected from the previous uh, slides, um, the number of cases of incident rate in Middle Eastern countries are generally lower than European countries, slightly which is a case of between uh, three to about five um, incident rate per 100,000. Uh, compared to the United States or European countries, uh, the figure is about seven or eight. So any progress in cancer treatment since the 1950s? Uh, unfortunately, we, um, especially in the United States, for instance, we spend a lot of money and funding for uh, cancer research. Um, typically about five to six billion dollars per year. And then we have tons of uh, publication per year and then can, did we are uh, able to um, uh, uh, reduce that death rate? Unfortunately, not really. Uh, of course, there are some improvement in some cancer type that's including uh, breast cancer, uh, prostate cancer, and uh, um, uh, leukemia and other blood-related cancer, uh, we made a big progress in uh, um, increasing a survival rate. But then, unfortunately, mainly solid tumors, we still have a very poor five-year survival. And then if you take a look at the left side, uh, now it's working, the brain tumor, for instance, five-year survival rate is very, very low. It's almost comparable to liver cancer or um, esophagus cancer and lung cancer. So. We still have a long way to go um, to improve uh, uh, cancer treatment. And then when it comes to cancer care cost, we understand that um, because of, of uh, you know, location in the uh, inside of a skull, uh, the cancer care for brain tumor is very, very expensive. Um, even in the United States, the cancer care cost in the United States alone will cost $200 billion annually. Um, and I, this is actually the financial burden of a cancer care by sites. So again, this data uh, also um, underscore uh, the, the cost of a br uh, brain cancer treatment, as brain cancer is one of the highest compared to other uh, um, tumors as well. This is also consistent with the uh, um, initial care, as well as continuing care, and the last day of life. Everything is much, much higher than uh, other, most of the other uh, uh, cancer in the other location. And although GBM, uh, which was one of the um, uh, most common adult uh, malignancy in the uh, brain, GBM is very rare, but then it's highly lethal nonetheless. So without any uh, treatment, uh, the uh, median survival is about three months. And even with the aggressive treatment, uh, median survival is, uh, remains about 12 to 15 months. And uh, this is about uh, the um, overall historical timeline of GBM treatment. So um, yes, we have been making a lot of effort to try to produce a better treatment. But unfortunately, uh, the last big um, actually uh, you know, treatment which improved the survival significantly is temozolomide back in nine, actually in 1999, where it was FDA approved. So, well, GBM, why is it so hard to treat? So despite uh, we have a lot of uh, the understanding of now molecular mechanism of GBM's uh, progression, we failed to improve the survival of GBM significantly after uh, the temozolomide, uh, which was approved uh, by FDA with the combination with other therapy, of course. So uh, we know that the checkpoint inhibitor therapy, like immunotherapy, are now a hot topic, obviously. And uh, people have been started to use immunotherapy in the GBM. But so far, at this point, as of today, um, uh, most of the immunotherapy seems like it's not working really well with the GBM treatment. So why? Um, you know, there are, of course, many other um, you know, um, uh, possible uh, 
uh, you know, reasons why it's so difficult to treat. One is that we still do not know much about the mechanism of how GBM arise and how they progress. That's the main issue, but at the same time, uh, so far, um, as you can see from the uh, you know, people in the oncology um, um, uh, in the field, we know that most of the clinical trial right now is try to combine already clinical approved uh, medication. Just try to combine, let's say, drug A, drug B, drug C, combine with drug A and C, drug B. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, of course, you know, that's not really a wasting of time. You know, we have to try to make it, but then so far, uh, we failed to improve the survival um, by just to uh, combine um, available medications. So we really have to think outside the box and then we need more innovative and a collaboration effort to um, de um, develop a better way to treat. So I'd just like to introduce a couple of uh, some of those you know, um, uh, promising new treatment on, uh, on the rise on our horizon. So a couple of them, uh, which include also uh, uh, what we call BNCT or boron neutron capture therapy, which is really exciting therapy. And unfortunately, in the United States, uh, somehow this therapy had been started in back in 1950s and 60s, and then just halted. But then, if you take a look at the other country, um, especially in Japan and uh, also China, they already started to use in the clinic, actual clinical setting for GBM as well as the head and neck cancer. So basically, this treatment is, uh, is basically using this um, stable boron isotype combined with the, some of those uh, drugs. They introduce this um, chemicals or boron isotope. So that this boron isotope uniquely it will be incorporated only in the tumor, but then not the surrounding uh, healthy tissue. So then, after the incorporation of this boron, then, uh, um, then the, the patient will be irradiated with low energy neutrons. So what will happen is after the new, um, neutrons uh, exposure, then the boron will start to break down to generate the weak radiation. But just only within the tumor, but then not the surrounding tissue. So this is actually really promising because this will um, specifically target tumors, but then not the surrounding tissue, uh, normal tissue. But uh, also one of the major reasons why U.S. also uh, stopped doing uh, this um, trial or uh, development of this therapy is that we normally need nuclear reactor. So people who know what, like, uh, what, what is nuclear reactor? Nuclear reactor is basically uh, just too expensive and uh, it requires a huge uh, um, um, area to occupy the space. And so, that's why um, most of the European countries and the United States, they just stop or abandon uh, this therapy and then instead going to just try to discover a new like a therapy or chemotherapy instead. But then a uh, good thing is that now uh, uh, technology allows us to create this accelerator-based neutron source, which is really, really, really tiny, well, not exactly tiny, tiny, but then compared to nuclear reactor, which is much safer and a smaller, occupies smaller space. And this can be utilized as a source of uh, uh, BNCT therapy. So hopefully the U.S. will, um, uh, well, the U.S. is actually in, the, like in Massachusetts. There's one company is, uh, is right now start, just starting this uh, clinical trial, and uh, hopefully this will be spread in the United States and other places uh, even more in the future. And there's another one which um, actually uh, my colleague at the um, uh, Loma Linda University and a couple of uh, others um, in uh, other universities are also engaging in this study is what we call AEF or alternating electric field. So the idea is to uh, um, is to try to disrupt a cell division and induce a cell apoptosis by applying a low intensity, intermediate frequency alternating electric field, which is uh, deliberate in this manner. And um, actually, this therapy was uh, approved in, uh, by FDA in the United States back in 2015. So what's very um, uh, exciting is that this actually therapy with uh, um, uh, also combination with the uh, temozolomide, it actually extends uh, the overall survival by almost four, almost like a five months, which in the world of uh, uh, oncology, this is a really a huge success. So this actually um, is one of the you know, exciting treatment. Um, the, head, uh, the, um, the difficulty is that this patient needs to wear this, such a device 
pretty much uh, uh, about 16 hours per day, which is going to be a little bit of a burden for the patients, and especially this is uh, connected to with wire. So we and others are trying to develop a, a, a way that uh, we can actually create this type of uh, you know, treatment or device wirelessly. So this is something that we are working on right now. And another uh, important development in imaging field is that what we call the um, radiomic uh, you know, field or radiomic um, um, uh, imaging system. So this is like a one example showing a multi-parametric MRI. Uh, basically, uh, you know, by looking at uh, the morphology or uh, the tumor density, extent of edema, vascularization, and molecular signature, uh, people can now uh, fairly accurately um, even uh, predict um, also um, molecular signature, like EGFR mutation low or high, and based on this, we can actually clearly correlate also overall survival just by looking at the uh, combination of the imaging system, which I feel like uh, this is a very really promising field. And also in terms of uh, early diagnosis, uh, many people are working on, of course, with biomarkers. So this is something that uh, we know this colleague from Osaka University in Japan is right now developing is that uh, by combining uh, dozens of uh, different mRNA, uh, microRNA signature in the blood. Um, um, with uh, this small, um, I think it was only about 100 um, samples, it was a very, very small sample, but it turns out that they were able to predict and um, accurately uh, detect the early cancer stage, that's including also brain tumor as well. It's almost at the, time, uh, the level of a 99% uh, percent accuracy. And uh, within the two hours of blood corrections. So I know that uh, this Osaka University, they already started this uh, clinical trial, more larger clinical trial uh, beginning from the last fall. So hopefully in a year or two, we uh, will be able to see uh, more data and hopefully um, we can actually give, us, uh, give you a better um, um, you know, result to showing that microRNA signature may be able to use as a early cancer uh, detection. And early cancer detection, not only in the brain tumor, but in all other tumors, is essential because if you catch the cancer in stage one or two, then most likely we should be able to um, you know, treat and the remission is possible. And another thing, um, probably Dr. Nami will be <laughs> interested in, uh, is a chronotherapy. Uh, which is actually that, uh, you know, chronotherapy, circadian rhythm uh, related protein is an important uh, protein that to actually control your sleep and awake cycle. That's why uh, some of us, like, let's say, travel uh, into Turkey from other places from different time zones, we feel dizzy or get, um, um, you know, jet lag because of this protein, which is a very important. Like, so it turns out that there are many um, uh, um, uh, uh, results that has been published that um, if the chemotherapy, certain chemotherapy will be given to a patient at a different time point, let's say morning or evening or later at night, sometimes you will see better results based on their circadian patients' uh, unique circadian rhythm. So, uh, those chronotherapy may be another, uh, so maybe a possible another solution to enhance the effectiveness of uh, uh, chemotherapy. And then in fact, at the, here at the USC, uh, my colleague Steve Kay and uh, our, one of our collaborators, Dr. Jeremy Rich from UCSC, or actually he actually now moved to the University of Pittsburgh, but um, they were actually find out that some of those uh, circadian rhythm um, uh, pro uh, related protein, clock and BMO1, is responsible for um, uh, maintaining a stemness in a brain tumor. And this will actually, uh, if you control uh, uh, the amount of those two uh, important uh, protein amount uh, during a chemotherapy, they are able to um, actually uh, eliminate, eliminate or reduce the amount of stemness within the cancer, and uh, they were able to treat the cancer better in an animal model as well as an in vitro model as well. So I um, just like to briefly introduce about the SPMT's um, you know, approach for by uh, our organization is that again uh, collab I th we believe that collaboration is the key um, uh, in order to um, fast track uh, the therapy uh, development of therapy as well as the diagnostic and uh, prevention as well. 
So as uh, <laughs> Dr. Tarhan is here as well. Uh, so uh, G, um, so G20 and 20 brain mapping um, and therapeutics, uh, we, we are the one who advocate and encourage those academic and private and governmental agencies, not only in the United States, but across uh, the, uh, the, um, the world, including European countries, Asian and Middle Eastern, Africa and Oceania. So um, our goal is try to, uh, through this collaboration, we will be uh, better to find or develop uh, innovative, effective, and affordable cancer therapy, which will reduce also eventually the medical cost. And uh, so for those who um, may be interested in attending uh, next year's uh, our SBMT Congress, uh, we hope that uh, we, um, especially if you are interested in new oncology, we really would like to invite you to participate in our new oncology session of SPMT in the next uh, February of 2023. Uh, we have a lot of exciting um, uh, new uh, um, advancement and updates on uh, therapeutics as well. So hopefully you may be able to actually join. We just start, we actually, um, uh, so Dr. Um, Reinhard Schulte from uh, Loma Linda University and uh, I myself actually started this new oncology subsection a few years ago with just only one session, but then now, um, now we extended to uh, four days of a full day uh, session. So hopefully, um, you know, um, people who, for those who are interested, uh, please join us. And then thank you for listening. Um, so we will have a, a question and answer toward the end. So. Okay, so with that, uh, we have uh, two more uh, speakers uh, who are actually going to introduce us with the exciting finding about the treatment for cancer. Um, Dr. Vasilis uh, Katsaros, I know he will be talking about uh, advanced MRI in preoperative treatment for brain tumor. So, hello, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation, uh, all of the organizing committee, and especially Turka and Professor uh, Tahan, if I say the name right, and also Babak uh, Kadeb uh, from SBMT. Uh, I will try uh, to summarize. I'm, I'm, uh, I think I'm the plus in the ME plus brain initiative because I'm, I think I'm the only uh, European and from Balkan that uh, is invited to speak uh, in this meeting. And let's hope that in the next meetings we will have more uh, from Europe and Balkan. And so make the collaboration all over uh, the world, which is the purpose that uh, Vicky mentioned before. So uh, I will try, I'm, I'm based in Athens, but I have some collaboration also in uh, uh, Germany and uh, UK and the uh, last two years in, uh, with uh, SBMT. Uh, why do we need advanced imaging uh, for brain tumors and what is the role of uh, neuroradiologists uh, in these uh, aspects? Uh, it is the most noble organ and uh, that's why we need imaging guided decision and treatment. Uh, here you can see uh, paradigm of uh, functional MRI, DTI, and tractography in a brain tumor. I will go further. This is the, super, the superior longitudinal fasciculus and especially the uh, posterior part of it, the arcuate fasciculus. Uh, where is the pointer? Okay, let's go further. Uh, this is the optic radiation in the tumor of the left of the right hippocampus. I will try to uh, uh, talk about initial diagnosis and treatment decision making, pre-surgical planning, intraoperative guidance, and if we have time, also a bit about radiotherapy planning and follow-up after treatment. So we make advanced imaging, what does advanced imaging mean? So we are trying to have high resolution, if possible, with higher uh, field strength on 3 Tesla in uh, 3D T1 weighted imaging, 3D T2 weighted imaging. That means that we are making volumetric imaging and also 3D flare. Uh, if it's possible, then we go uh, very high resolution also on fMRI, which is uh, 
uh, technique based on uh, blood oxygenation level, and we can measure that. And also diffusion tractography, dynamic susceptibility contrast T2 stop of fusion, uh, which is showing the macrovascular density in the uh, tissue, in the normal and pathological tissue, as well as the permeability, uh, which is the uh, former perfusion, uh, which measures the permeability of uh, a lesion uh, in, in comparison with the normal tumor. And then we go to metabolic imaging, which is MR spectroscopy and amide protein transfer, which is based on uh, chemical exchange saturation transfer. So uh, the initial diagnosis and treatment decision making, this is one of the papers that we, are, uh, we published in collaboration with uh, UCL and uh, my best man, my I'm his best man, Professor Sotiros Bizas from UCL, and we show that we have about 75% uh, uh, uh, accuracy in uh, detecting not only the grading of the tumor, but also the IDH mutation of the tumors uh, with flare and uh, dynamic susceptibility contrast to star perfusion imaging. So I will show some cases and the initial diagnosis and treatment decision making from the everyday clinical routine. So you see here, uh, I can't find the pointer. Uh, is it here? So we see here uh, an heterogeneous uh, lesion of the uh, frontal to temporal uh, lobe, which came to us uh, with suspicion of an FCD or a low-grade glioma. This, is, this specific uh, sequence is uh, introduced uh, last one year with a new machine. It's the double invention recovery in which we are suppressing both CSF and white matter. Uh, originally, it was used for uh, MS plaques and better to visualize uh, MS plaques in the uh, gray matter. But as I have seen from the experience of the last year, we can see better the uh, delineation of the tumors uh, because tumors, normally gliomas, arise from the white matter. So if we, com if we uh, suppress the normal white matter, we can see if we can see the boundaries of the uh, tumors better than even than flare. But this case showed after gadolinium administration, and especially uh, this sequence is acquired at least 10 minutes after gadolinium administration. So, because it's a 3D T1 MP rage uh, image, which needs more time to accumulate the gadolinium in the uh, pathological tissues. So, it is a net heterogeneous enhancement. It seems that it is more than one lesion, so about at least three lesions, and this was the uh, first suspicion that we don't have to deal with a focal cortical dysplasia or a low-grade glioma. We applied here uh, artificial intelligence uh, where we segment and uh, morphologically as well as in the perfusion imaging, and we see that we have to do uh, with different habitats with a high angiogenic tumor, uh, absolute in, uh, volume of two, uh, milliliters, and uh, you see the low angiogenic tumor with uh, yellow uh, infiltrative peripheral edema and vasogenic peripheral edema that helps us and the neurosurgeon to uh, operate this lesion. What is our aim as neuroradiologists is to help first the neurosurgeon to excise as much as possible with the less neurological post-surgical uh, deficit and this is better also for the, I don't know. This is also a, a, a better, a better uh, result for the patient. And this is the same case where you can see uh, the spectroscopy with a raised choline, creatine, uh, low decreased NAA. And here you can see also, this is the choline here. This is creatine, creatine NAA and uh, lactate, which is uh, typical. typical for uh, high-grade glioma, and it was a GBM. What do we, do, do, do we need for pre-surgical planning and even intraoperative planning is, first of all, the language lateralization because of the 
uh, localization of the lesion. It is in the right, the patient is uh, right-handed, but in some cases we have uh, right dominant hemisphere, although the patients are right-handed. And here we can uh, conclude that the patient is left uh, dominant hemisphere for language uh, function. And this we can confirm also by measuring the thickness of the superior longitudinal fasciculus on the left, which is almost double uh, compared to the right. And this is a nice 3D representation. Another case in which we don't see real enhancement, it's again a double inversion recovery. You can see the outline of the tumor in the uh, frontal, prefrontal cortex, superior. Uh, superior frontal uh, gyrus, mainly. Not a real enhancement, just faint punctuate enhancements uh, 10 minutes after gadolinium uh, administration. So here I'm showing that because uh, artificial intelligence didn't help, so human intelligence have to go back and see in the perfusion imaging that there is also a high-grade tumor, which was confirmed by histology. It was an anaplastic astrocytoma grade 3, IDH mutant. And here is also the uh, comparison between the pathological uh, side uh, on the left side and the normal on the right side. You can see the increase of the choline compared to the normal, also increase of the creatine and uh, decrease of the NAA, and also lipids and, and uh, lactate, which is uh, for high-grade tumor. We can do also resting state fMRI in tumor patients for uh, language and uh, motor uh, lateralization. Here is uh, the same patient uh, with uh, the language network. You can uh, appreciate here the uh, inferior uh, frontal gyrus, which is the Broca's uh, area. Here is the Gishwin's area, which is the inferior parietal lobule, and the uh, parietal lobe uh, comprising of uh, uh, angular and supramarginal gyrus. And here you can see in planum temporale the uh, uh, region of Wernicke. What, what is the difference between the test-based fMRI and resting state fMRI is that we just uh, take effect of the bold phenomenon without the patient uh, to be ordered to make some tasks, while in the task we give him some uh, uh, orders and he will follow the orders. We confirm that also with task-based fMRI. You see here that uh, we have uh, the Broca's area on the left, so it's a left dominant hemisphere, which is very critical for the neurosurgeon, although uh, it's a very uh, big distance between the Broca's area and the, re the, re the lesion. And we do also uh, not only uh, language, but uh, uh, motor uh, evaluation. Uh, in this case, especially, the language showed something that uh, we suspected from the anatomy. The pre-SMA, the supplementary motor area, which is not in the same region as the supplementary motor area for the motor is, the, uh, uh, it's, is what is uh, connected for tasks of the uh, language. So it's very close proximity with the tumor. So the neurosurgeon should uh, be very careful here so that we had, don't have the SMA syndrome after the surgery. This is the uh, motor area, and as you can see, the SMA for the motor tasks is more behind, is the, the distance is bigger than the pre-SMA, and also the motor areas, the main motor area in the uh, frontal, uh, uh, no, anterior, uh, anterior central uh, uh, gyrus is more than two centimeters away from the lesion. So from motor, we don't have any problem. And we can see that there is an infiltration of some fibers of the cortical spinal tract in the region of the supplementary motor area uh, of the language here. And this is the uh, 3D representation of the cortical spinal tract or pyramidal tract on the left. Yeah. So uh, some uh, stars in the 
uh, sky. So that's a resting state of MRI with a software that we're using the last five years, and which is showing also the language and memory lateralization. As you can see here with uh, high, uh, Z values, uh, we have a higher Z value on the left hippocampus, and this implies that we have to do with memory lateralization. So that's, I'm not sure how I can play the video here. This one on the left. This is a functional uh, neurosurgical procedure which uh, integrates all this that I showed before. And we could see that also in a video where we can see the tracts and the uh, functional, the eloquent areas which are in near proximity with a tumor. Here is that how we integrate the resting state fMRI language network and uh, uh, superior longitudinal fasciculus and arcuate fasciculus in another case. And this is a picture from my collaborator and uh, very good friend, Professor George Sanzel, as well. He's operating by neural navigation and integrating all this stuff in the uh, surgical room. And how we can uh, use that in the interoperative MRI setting, this is a picture from uh, University of Tübingen, where we uh, uh, collaborated uh, five years ago. And we can see that after the excision of the tumor, which is on the left occipital lobe, uh, what is here the interesting is the uh, after the operation, if, we, if the surgeon has excised the as much as possible from the tumor, and what is the uh, situation of the uh, optic radiation on, of the right hemisphere, so it's intact, so he can go and say, uh, okay, and then uh, the patient goes to the radiotherapist and oncologist. What we can do also in, uh, with uh, uh, radiotherapy planning by integrating fMRI, and also perfusion MRI, where we can see here on the, uh, the red color is the high angiogenic uh, uh, habitat of the tumor. So we can make a dose painting by uh, this uh, stuff and how we can follow up great two gliomas. And uh, there is a uh, excision of 96.91%. And also check this by uh, artificial intelligence with different techniques which we don't have the time to go over. I wanted to show you the last year's experience uh, with uh, fusion of uh, PET-CT with MRI in a patient with a low uh, grade oligodendroglioma grade 2 and which he didn't have the criteria for a relapse really. So the criteria with volumetry is to have a 40% increase of the tumor during six or six months or one year. So this case slowly increased not more than 10% per six months per, per one year. We follow this patient for seven, eight years, and we can see on the PET that we have a relapse of the uh, uh, low-grade oligodendroglioma, and then we go back and review the perfusion and see that we have also an RCBV ratio of more than 1.75, and uh, namely it is uh, six, uh, sorry, 6.76 uh, ratio. So uh, upcoming methods is the diffusion kurtosis, in which we also made a, a study with uh, uh, Soterios from UCL and our team. Uh, we can see also in spectroscopy new methods and new metabolites. Uh, glycine is uh, considered as more specific for diagnosing of uh, high-grade gliomas and also uh, go uh, further with uh, this IDH mutation where we can find uh, uh, immunostem uh, uh, upcoming methods in, uh, in uh, in spectroscopy, and uh, here we can detect the two uh, hydroxyglutarate and kistathionin in patients, uh, and uh, we can uh, discriminate also between uh, the low and high grade tumors with methionine PET, which you don't have really in Greece. The next project in, uh, to uh, integrate in our machine the amide proton transfer and chest imaging, 
And from morphology, as you can see, we can go to physiology and biochemistry, and so we can help diagnosis, initial diagnosis, pre-surgical treatment, pre-radiotherapy treatment, pre-radiotherapy, uh, pre-surgical planning and intraoperative uh, guidance and also uh, radiotherapy guidance. And here is another case we, we, can, uh, we have uh, seen a very close proximity with the uh, superior longitudinal fascicles on the right. And with that, I want, you, uh, to, uh, I want to thank you very much. So the only thing is that we have to do more effort about the artificial intelligence uh, which contribute as an additional tool for the best treatment decision making in the brain tumors. Thank you very much for your attention. And if I have to make a comment, this is uh, from some uh, very nice uh, island in Greece, Samothraki, which is very near to Turkey. Yet I uh, propose for all of you to visit it. Thank okay. you very much. Great, thank you, Dr. Katsos. So our next speaker uh, is Dr. Sukuru Mehmet El Turk. No questions. Great. So he'll be talking about the AI in radiology. Oh, yeah. Question and answer will be the, toward the, uh, at the end of the session. End of the session, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, we have a very, very important session in the next one, which is a lunch time, so we we'll just like to speed up. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, okay. first of all, thanks uh, for inviting me to this beautiful meeting. Uh, uh, today I will try to talk about the artificial intelligence and radiology. But I will try to focus on basic concepts. As far as I understand, we already ran out of time, so I will try to be short and to the point. Now, if we are talking about artificial intelligence, these three basic concepts are important. The artificial intelligence itself is like an umbrella term, and under it, we have the machine learning, and under this, we have the deep learning. Till the introduction of the deep learning, artificial intelligence, especially in radiology, did not play a major role. We had this, you know, computer-assisted, uh, diagnostics and stuff like this, but the deep learning changed the game. It was a real game changer for radiology. Now, again, these two concepts are important. These two approaches to artificial intelligence. First, we have the good old-fashioned way. That means a rule-based, uh, if you wish, algorithm. That means you teach or you instruct the machine or the computer with rules. If so, if not, if yes rules, if you wish. And then we have the statistical machine learning. This is the basis of deep learning. If we are talking about deep learning, we are talking about huge amount of data, and this data can be related to the basic you know, task or problem, or also can be unrelated as far as the human understands. And we need this computing muscle, that means powerful, fast enough, computers, and we need these neural networks. And if we have more than one network, we have these hidden layers, I will try to show them to you. If we have more than one hidden layer, then we talk about deep learning. It's the rule. Now, this guy is Gary Kasparov, a world famous chess player, and a machine, uh, actually IBM's Deep Blue defeated him in 1997, but Deep Blue was not employing or utilizing deep learning. It was, again, I mean, all its algorithms were rule-based. Now, I have these three numbers, 10 to 50, 10 to 80, 10 to 171. Any guesses, I mean, what these numbers can mean or may mean? Okay, the first one is the number, total number of possible moves in a chess game. Okay? The second one is the number of atoms in the observable universe. And the third one is the number of possible moves in this board game. It's called Go. So if you compare Go with chess, Go is far more complicated. But in 2016, the AlphaGo 
it's a Google algorithm, which was utilized in that time. It's AlphaGo, AlphaGo mass enough, they have the AlphaGo Zero, it's much more powerful today. It managed to defeat this Lee Sido, and he was I'm one of the world's most famous Go masters. Okay? I mean, for chess, you have these rules, but for Go, it's far more complicated if you check the number of the possible moves. But with deep learning, this became possible. Again, three basic concepts. If we are talking about artificial intelligence and radiology or medicine or whatever you wish, then we have these three basic concepts. We have the unsupervised learning, we have the supervised learning, and we have the reinforcement learning. In majority of cases in radiology, we try to employ the supervised learning, but if we you know, utilize the neural networks, then we go to the field of reinforcement learning. Okay? Those are the methods. Like, the methods, like, I mean, it's the classical statistics, actually. Yeah, if we are talking about deep learning, it's classical statistics plus neural networks. Plus, that means computing muscle. But huge amounts of data. The data is important. The amount of data is important. And then we have these neural networks. And we have these different architectures. It's too much detail. We have the two-dimensional ones, we have the three-dimensional ones. This unit especially is important, I will show it to you, because in radiology we utilize this unit for segmentation. And if I'm talking about segmentation in radiology, it's not only I'm trying to make a segmentation of the lung, for example. In the lesion recognition, it's also a segmentation, okay? The segmentation is the basic task, the major problem we need to solve in radiology. This is a basic artificial neural network, one hidden layer. If I have more than one layer, then it's a deep neural network, okay? And this is the architecture of UNET. It's from Freiburg. This is I mean, a very basic structure which we utilize in problem solving in radiology. And one more thing. This Transfer learning is especially important. That means you can train the algorithm, for example, to recognize liver masses. But if you utilize the methods of transfer learning, you can use the same algorithm with some modifications and, let's say, retraining to also recognize lung masses or other tumors in the body. This transfer learning is also transfer learning is also very a very important concept in radiology. And then we have this black box. The black box means something like this. Told you, we are talking huge amounts of data, we are talking about muscle, computing muscle, and that's statistics. So the machine, the algorithm decides something, tells you this is a lesion. And you can never question how we reach this conclusion how the machine reached its conclusion. And this is what we call black box. Now, today's research in artificial intelligence is trying to explore inside of this black box. It's a work in progress. Okay, again in radiology, to keep it simple, we have Python. I I'm sure that you all are familiar with this concept. But more importantly, Python is, you know, a language, a high-level language. We have Keras. It's an open source library. It had multiple backends. But now Keras is working with TensorFlow. And TensorFlow is an open source software li library. So to train all these neural networks to solve problems in my field, in radiology, what you need is TensorFlow Keras. Okay, it's very straightforward. You can, you know, you know, train, teach yourself the rules and basic concepts, and you know, create something from it. And one more important thing: in radiology, we are talking right now about radiomics and radiogenomics. That's something like this. In radiology, traditionally, you know, the, the inventor, the founder of my discipline of radiology is Wilhelm Röntgen. 
he began with the, you know, the radiograph of the hand of his wife. It was an analog image. But now in radiology, everything is digital. What we do is something like this. We create from the digital images or digital data sets analog images for us, for example, for me as a radiologist, so I can evaluate it. The question is this. The image is a data set. You know, it's composed of numbers, numbers, numbers, numbers, and all the pixels are you know, somehow interrelated. So there is so many things to explore and analyze. You, with the bare human eye, you cannot do this. And this is something we call texture analysis. So using the texture analysis and using the methods of deep learning, now we are talking about radiomics and radiogenomics. That means, for example, we can predict, let's say, lung cancer, if the tumor has the specific gene mutation or not, because it changes the therapy. I'm talking about smart, smart molecules, you know, smart cancer therapeutic agents and stuff like this. You need to know it. And now, with radiogenomics, we are able to do it. Okay, again, a basic question or problem or a basic fear. The artificial intelligence will replace radiologists. No, I don't think so. Again, one of my colleagues, he said, Radiologists who use AI will replace those who don't. That's what I believe. And in the radiology meetings, in our conferences, congresses, we right now start to talk, talk about artificial intelligence. Okay, last slide. There is Bosphorus. Very beautiful water. Channel, straight. But you know, it has the curves and streams and stuff like that. It's dangerous. Therefore, it's recommended for the captains of ships like this one to take hire a pilot. This guy is also a captain, but his job is to guide, it's not guide, or to you know drive, let's say, this ship through the, the strait because he is familiar with everything. But it's not a must. You need to pay to the Turkish government for this service. And therefore, some captains prefer not to hire or not to get the pilots. And stuff like this happens. Okay? The artificial intelligence is like a pilot for us. So, therefore, it's very, you know, logical to think that radiologists, who can utilize, who can employ artificial intelligence, will replace those radiologists who cannot. And it's also true for all branches of medicine. Okay, that was it. Thank you so much. Great, that was an excellent talk. We have a, a few minutes for question and answer. Do you have any question from the audience? Oh. Shall I, Dr. Yamamoto? Oh, yeah. So, um, one of the best uh, features of the panel was that you put together experts from different disciplines, and that's a must when it comes to uh, neuro-oncology. So, neuro-oncology is apparently a multidisciplinary approach to diagnosis, treatment, and maintenance of the responsiveness to ther therapies. So, uh, uh, the thing is that Although all the efforts have been in place for several years, the treatment of GBMs is still a failure. Some of the, I mean, experts are like you, cancer scientists. Some of them are neuroradiologists. Uh, they do uh, imaging, and based on that, they do the diagnosis. Metabolomists. Some of them are uh, deviceologists. Some are pathfinders. Some are metabolomists. And some are optimists. 
all right? So, so what, when we're talking about the treatment of um, GBM, of course, the connect approach to the diagnosis and treatment is a must, but is still, there's a long way to go. And as a, as a cancer scientist, how would you think that technology is really bridging the boundary or breaking the boundaries for novel treatments? Some things like, as, as far as I understood, something like Novo TTF or AEE, they are, uh, you know, uh, just adding some overall survival values. And how would technology take us to next level with the... Uh, uh, with respect to treatment of GBM and how well, how we're going to deal with this catastrophe? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, yeah, so as we can uh, introduce you with a couple of new, um, yeah, new treatment. Indeed, uh, you know, technology is really uh, required to, um, you know, figure out or, um, you know, uh, to enhance the treatment. Obviously, right? so, yeah, technology is, is really. Um, a, Probably important so, because nowadays, you know, people are just talking only about again, you know, administering uh, those, um, um, uh, let's say, uh, you know, chemotherapies and chemotherapies, all the chemotherapies. But then, I think we really need some sort of like a different like a device, um, uh, just like I introduced you. But then on top of that, I think, um, for instance, AI, uh, for instance, will be probably a crucial in order to actually enhance the treatment. So one of which we can um, possibly utilize will be that when a surgeon is trying to uh, take out or remove a tumor from the brain, so what happened is that during a surgery, um, many things can happen, obviously. So um, I'm not actually the surgeon, so, uh, oops, hold on just a minute. <laughs> that was my time. So what happened is that, uh, you know, sometimes especially with the GBM, GBM doesn't have any boundary, clear boundary. So surgeons uh, generally struggle with how to remove properly. And then, you know, brain, you cannot just remove ac accessibly because that will alter the function of uh, some, uh, you know, patients. If you take out too much in a, you know, um, eloquent region, then the you know, patient may probably lose ability to speak or ability to like, move their, you know, body. So, so they want to obviously minimize removing a uh, normal tissue, but then you know they're having a hard time uh, try to locate visually on tumors. So um, one of which I think Dr. Cutler also might have mentioned is that uh, um, AI or some of the computing technology may be able to predict the direction of how the tumor may grow, and based on the information, the surgeon can remove uh, the. Um, yeah, maximal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's like one of uh, um, probably that um, um, met uh, uh, you know, method or you know. Yeah. So, so yeah. I make a comment very short. So, the past effort to uh, treat brain tumors has failed. So, the new path is going to be based on big data analytics, and. Uh, for instance, we are working with the uh, Veterans Affairs with one million uh, veterans data base. So you can actually look at the mass population of uh, you know, patients and predict uh, and uh, see how the pathophysiology is happening. So that's one thing. So, so technology could help uh, using mass data for prediction. Uh, in terms of the therapeutics, as Dr. Yamamoto said, many things has failed. Um, proton capture therapy is one that is uh, promising, but I think we're going to look back at chemotherapy like a lobotomy in the future and say, how could you do that to a patient? And uh, the new generation of therapy will be chemotherapy. And, I'm sorry, immunotherapy. But so. Not necessarily. You know, if you look at the cellularities clinical trial, actually in leukemia, AML, M5, they have been, you know, 65, 70% remission. But immunotherapy, and for, for you mean cell therapy or? So, including cell therapy, including exosomal therapy, including uh, nanoimmunotherapy. So, you're moving away from chemo. Um, there's a resistance from pharma on that. But uh, the future, I think, will be much more immuno cell therapy. 
Yeah, just wanted to add a big feature before the technology. So even to understand and collaborate, we, we, don't, we need the, the same interface to communicate between the uh, multidisciplinary team. So uh, even in the, I have this problem every day, even when I have artificial intelligence and technological advances uh, to, uh, I understand that, okay? I'm a neuroradiologist, I'm more familiar, so I have a problem with a radiotherapist, with an oncologist, with a neurosurgeon. So we have to establish also this communication better, this interaction, so that we all understand what technology can offer us. Thank you. About uh, neuroradiology, can I ask about neuroradiology to shifting for the second uh, talk today? For you? Uh, no problem. Okay, I hope. To, no, no, no, just enough for me. <laughs> no, I don't have a problem. Whatever you want. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, uh, you exposed us today for uh, a beautiful uh, piece of work. It is actually not a single research, as I understood from, uh, uh, you exposed us for four or five different type of research about integration, neuroradiology, and the surgery. Simply speaking. Um, clinical, that is super excellent. Uh, especially on uh, one important point, it is about uh, the preoperative planning. This is a study or a research, clinical research. And then intraoperative, you are also working with the neurosurgeon. Another study, okay? Just according to my, stand, uh, my understanding as a neurosurgeon. And the third one about very close. We, we all also in Alexandria, Egypt, you are uh, uh, so close to the new neuroradiology. All the neurosurgeons, ask Professor Babik, love the neuroradiology. We are actually, we have a seminar every day <laughs> for the neuroradiology. And uh, some of them getting on the OR, on the theater with us, and you know this, Professor Babik knows this. The more important is the follow-up, especially for recurrence by function FMRI. Highly important to diagnose the recurrence. And uh, a fourth study, I guess, for the future, on the last uh, piece, on the future between the combination of FMR and the tractography, that's right. But I have a remark about uh, lateralization. You showed us, uh, I think, two, a couple of slides, lateralization, all we us know if right-handed would be left with uh, a certain uh, remark about sometime on the left side, it will be on the right side. And uh, you said on one slide there is hypertrophy on which gyrus? Uh, I mean if absent lateralization. The right dominant controlling the right side, according to my memory. We have uh, a session for him and me on the lunch. You agree? Okay, so this will conclude our session. So thank you very much for all the participation. And yeah. <laughs> next one will With be us, all the time very we'll be passing out all the day. <laughs> Enjoy your lunch. Thank you. Thank you. üçüncü sınıf öğrencisi Öznur Aynural. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra felsefe okumak istedim hep. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir felsefe mezun olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğinden bahsedeyim size. Sokrates'in dediği gibi, kendini tanı, yolculuğun burada başlıyor. Okumak, sorgulamak, araştırmakla donandığın dört yılın sonunda akademisyenlik, çeşitli şirketlerde felsefe danışmanlık, basın yayın organlarında ve yayın evlerinde editörlük, yazarlık, eleştirmenlik, reklamcılık yapabiliyorsun. Kamu ve özel sektörde 
sivil toplum kuruluşlarında hukuk, finans, tıp, medya, sanat gibi çeşitli alanların toplumsal hizmet projelerinde ve etik danışma kurullarında çalışabiliyorsun. Her şeyden önce yüzün burada hep gülüyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra felsefe okumak istiyorsan bize katıl. Merhaba, ben Ahmet Arslan. Sosyoloji bölümü öğrencisiyim. Hayatım boyunca önce mutlu olmak, sonra sosyoloji okumak istedim hep. Aldığım sosyoloji eğitimim sayesinde her ikisinin de özdeş kavramlar olduğunu fark ettim. Şimdi size neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'nin sosyoloji bölümünü tercih ettiğimi anlatayım. Bölümdeki dersler toplumsal olayları açıklama, yorumlama, eleştirme ve çözme ihtiyaçlarına karşılık vermeye yardımcı olan bir içeriğe sahip. Bu ihtiyacı karşılamak için gerekli olan temel kuramsal konular ve araştırma yöntemleri kapsamlı bir sosyolojik literatür çerçevesinde alanında deneyimli hocalar tarafından aktarılıyor. İstanbul gibi bir metropolde sağ çalışmaları vasıtasıyla pratiğe geçirme olanını sunuyor. Bu da bana mutlu bir toplumun nasıl inşa edileceği hususunda vizyon ve misyon kazandırıyor. Her şeyden önce hep yüzün gülüyor burada. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra sosyolog olmak istiyorsan bize katıl. Ben yeni medya gazetecilik bölümünden Burak. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra gazeteci olmak istedim ben. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir gazeteci olmak için neden üstün üniversitesini tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Hepimizin gözlemlediği gibi internetle birlikte medya ve gazetecilik alanında çok radikal, yapısal ve işlevsel dönüşüm süreçleri başladı. Yazılı basın, görsel, işitsel medya gibi ayrımlar ortadan kalkarak bütünleşik dijital yeni medya yapılanması ortaya çıktı. İşte burada yeni medya ve gazetecilik alanındaki bu yeni duruma uygun bir profesyonel olmalı odaklı eğitim alıyorsun. Dijital içerik üretebilen ve yönetebilen, yeni medyanın tüm özelliklerini kullanabilen bir profesyonel olmak hedefleniyor. Ayrıca yeni medya okuryazarı direklerine sahip olarak medya içeriklerini eleştirel bakabilmeyi öğreniyorsun. Mesleki etik değerlere uygun davranmanı, gazetecilik mesleği açısından ne kadar önemli olduğunu kavruyorsun. Her şeyden önce burada yüzün hep biliyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra gazeteci olmak için bize katıl. Reklam tasarımı ve iletişim öğrencisi Zehra Güneş. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra reklamcı olmak istedim hep. Mutlu olmadan olduğu şeyin önemi yok çünkü. Ben de mutlu bir reklamcı olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğinden bahsedeyim size. Nitelikli bir akademisyen kadrodan 4 yıl boyunca eğlenerek, keyif alarak eğitim görüyorsun. İlgi ve yönelimlerine yanıt vermeye elverişli bir ders programın oluyor sektörle işbirliği içinde hazırlanan bir eğitim öğretim programı oluyor. Bu eğitim kapsamında hem reklam sektörüne hem de akademik çalışma yapmakta olan kurumlara profesyonel bir iletişimci olmaya hazırlanıyorsun. Her şeyden önce yüzün burada hep gülüyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra reklamcı olmak istiyorsan size katıl. Merhaba, ben Eylül. Üsküdar Üniversitesi Halkla İlişkiler Bölümü öğrencisiyim. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra haklı ilişkiler uzmanı olmak istedim hep. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir haklı ilişkiler uzmanı olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Bölümde insanların neden ve nasıl iletişim kurduklarından başlayarak medyanın insan ve toplumlara etkisini, devletlerin, kurumların ve markaların işleyişini ve dev haklı ilişkiler kampanyalarının nasıl yapıldığını öğreniyorsunuz. Yıl boyu düzenlenen etkinlikler sayesinde sektörün önde gelen isimleriyle birlikte çalışma imkanı yakalıyorsun. Her şeyden önce burada hep yüzün gülüyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra haklı işleri uzmanı olmak için bize katıl. Merhaba ben Sezer, radyo, televizyon ve sinema öğrencisiyim. Önce mutlu olmak istedim. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir radyo, televizyon ve sinema mezunu olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Nitelikli bir akademik kadrodan ders alıyorsun. Ders gördüğün alanlar fiziki ve teknik donanımlı mekanlardan, laboratuvarlardan oluşuyor. Radyo ve televizyon stüdyolarında teorik ve uygulamalı eğitimi bir arada görüyorsun. Yalnızca bugün değil, geleceği de dikkate alarak hazırlanmış bir müfredatın var. Kalifiye meslek insanları olarak yetiştirildiğini her an hissediyorsun. Yıl boyu düzenlenen etkinliklerde sektörün önde gelen isimleriyle bir araya gelme imkanı buluyorsun. Ü TV ve Ü Radyo stüdyolarında pratik imkanı oluyor. Her şeyden önce burada yüzün hep biliyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra radyocu, televizyoncu veya sinemacı olmak istiyorsan bize katıl. Merhaba arkadaşlar, ben Üsküdar Üniversitesi Görselleşim Tasarım Öğrencisi. 
her şeyden önce mutlu olmak ve iyi bir gösteriyle çizgi olmak istedim. Çünkü mutlu olmadan yaptığımız için hiçbir önem yok. O zaman neden istiyor üniversitesi gösteriyle çizgi olmak istedim? Her detayından size birazcık bahsedeyim. Sıkılmadan eğlene eğlene 4 yıl genelden özele, kurumsaldan uygulamaya, birbirini tamamlayan dersler görüyoruz. İkinci sınıftan itibaren genelde mek laboratuvarında oluyoruz. Alanında uzman, kaliteli meslek insanı olarak yetiştirildiğine her an hissediyoruz. Yalnızca bugünü değil, geleceği de dikkate alarak hazırlanmış bir müfredatım var. Mezuniyetten sonra artık sen ne istersen. Ajans, medya, kurumsal. Her şeyden önce burada yüzün hep duruyor. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra da iyi bir gösteriyle çizgi olmak istiyorsan bize kat. İstanbul'un kalbi Üsküdar'da Türkiye'nin beyin üstünü kurmak ve dünya çapında bir üniversite olabilmek için kolları sıvadığımızda her şeyi insanı anlamakla başlar dedik ve bu gayeyle çıktık yola. Sağlık alanındaki çeyrek asırlık tecrübeyle Türkiye'nin ilk ve tek davranış bilimleri ve sağlık temalı üniversitesi ünvanına kavuşmamıza uzanan yolculuğumuz böyle başladı. Kısa zamanda çok büyük mesafeler kat ederek ülkemizi bilimin ışığında parlak yarınlara taşıyacak gençler yetiştirmiş olmanın mutluluğunu yaşıyoruz. İnanıyoruz ki ulusal ve uluslararası ölçekte çağdaş, donanımlı, sorgulayan, araştıran, bilim üreten gençlerimiz de global platformlarda daha birçok başarımız, gururumuz olacak. Biz hayatın içinde bir üniversiteyiz. Bir üniversite 5 yerleşke anlayışıyla İstanbul'un farklı noktalarından kolaylıkla ulaşılabilen yerleşkelerimizde öğrencilerimizin kampüs deneyimini şehrin dinamik temposundan kopmadan yaşamasını sağlıyor, onların hayata her an bağlı kalmalarına olarak tanıyoruz. Öğrencilerimize teorik ve pratik bilgiyi bir bütün olarak sunduğumuz, yapay zekadan farmakogenetiğe kadar pek çok farklı alana yönelik, 70'i aşkın laboratuvarımız, televizyon ve radyo stüdyolarımız, ileri teknolojiye sahip dersliklerimiz ve daha birçok modern altyapı özelliğimizle dünya standartlarında bir üniversiteyiz. 6 fakülte, 1 sağlık hizmetleri meslek yüksekokulu ve 5 enstitümüzde hepsi alanlarında yetkin, bini aşkın güçlü akademik ve idari kadromuzla 4 temel ilkemiz olan eleştirilebilirlik, özgürlükçülük, çoğulculuk ve katılımcılığı yüksek öğretimin her alanında uyguluyoruz. Tıp, diş, mühendislik ve doğa bilimleri, iletişim, sağlık bilimleri, insan ve toplum bilimleri alanlarındaki lisans ve sağlık hizmetleri meslek yüksekokulu ön lisans programlarımızın yanı sıra bağımlılık ve adli bilimlerden tasavvuf araştırmalarına kadar farklı branşlara yönelik yüksek lisans ve doktora programlarımızla birlikte Toplamda 22 bine aşkın öğrencimizde yüksek öğretimde çığır açmaya devam ediyor. 10. yılımızı geride bırakırken verdiğimiz 23 bin mezunumuzla da gurur duyuyoruz. Girişimcilik, üniversite kültürü ve yurt dışındaki birçok saygın üniversiteden önce dünyada ilk kez hayata geçirdiğimiz pozitif psikoloji gibi derslerin yanı sıra yüzlerce ulusal ve uluslararası çapta etkinlikle öğrencilerimizin iyi birer dünya vatandaşı olmalarını amaçlıyoruz. Türkiye'nin ilk bilim ve fikir festivali ve yüksek insani değerler ödülleri gibi geleneksel hale getirdiğimiz geniş kapsamlı etkinlikler ve sosyal sorumluluk projeleriyle kurumsal çalışmalarımızı sosyo-kültürel alanlara da yayıyoruz. Mutlu Yuva, Haydi Tut Elimi Derneği gibi sivil toplum kuruluşlarıyla sevgi ve güven dolu bir geleceğe katkıda bulunurken, bilim ve uygulama ortağımız NP İstanbul Beyin Hastanesi uzmanlarının desteği sayesinde başarıyla sürdürdüğümüz Aileler Üniversitede Projesi ve benzeri çalışmalarla yarınlarımız için sağlam temeller inşa ediyoruz. Arge odaklarımızın yanı sıra Brain Park Teknoloji Transfer Ofisi, Silikon Türk Teknopark gibi teknolojik inovasyonlarla bilimsel çalışmalarda öncü rol üstleniyoruz. Dünyanın 80 ülkesinden 3 bine aşkın uluslararası öğrencimizle farklı medeniyetleri Üsküdar'ın bilim çatısı altında buluşturuyoruz. Yüksek öğretimde uluslararası kalite standartlarına büyük önem veriyoruz. Bu yöndeki tüm çalışmalarımızı Pearson, FEDEC, ILAT, ISO 9001 gibi akreditasyonlarla belgeliyoruz. Kurucu rektörümüz Profesör Doktor Nevzat Tarhan'ın öncülüğünde G20 zirvesine ev sahipliği yapan ilk ve tek Türk üniversitesi olarak beyin konusundaki çalışmalarımıza küresel çapta devam ediyoruz. Geleceğin bilgili ve donanımlı hekimlerini yetiştirdiğimiz tıp fakültemizde afiliye hastanemiz NP İstanbul Beyin Hastanesi ile sürekli işbirliği içindeyiz. Ayrıca sağlık ve uygulama merkezlerimiz olan NP Fener Yolu ve NP Etiler Tıp Merkezimizde de geniş uygulama ve staj olanakları sunuyoruz. Üniversite tercihi gelecek tercihidir. Tercihini iyi bir gelecekten yana kullananlar Üsküdar Üniversitesi'nde buluşuyor, parlak yarınlara emin adımlarla yürüyorlar. Çünkü Üsküdar gerçek bir üniversite. Türkiye'nin beyin üssü Üsküdar Üniversitesi. Merhaba ben Asena. Herkes gibi ben de mutlu olmak istiyorum. 
mutlu olmak için önce sevdiğim ve istediğim bölümde olmam gerektiğini biliyorum. Mutluyum çünkü Üsküdar Üniversitesi'nde tarih bölümü öğrencisiyim. Mutlu bir öğrenci olarak sizlere neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimi anlatayım. Bizde Türkiye'de tarih eğitiminde ilkleri yaşamanız mümkün. Bütün bir yıl sadece ders dinlemiyor, pek çok tarihi mekana, arşivlere, müzelere gidiyoruz. Ödevlerimizi sadece evde değil, bizzat sınıflarda, hocalarımız danışmanlığında yapıyoruz. Tarih öğrenimi için çok önemli olan Osmanlıca eğitimini oldukça yoğun alıyoruz. Derslerimizi grup çalışmaları eşliğinde sorgulayarak işliyoruz. Bu fakültede bulunan Sosyoloji, Felsefe, Siyaset Bilimi ve Uluslararası İlişkileri bölümleri ile birlikte karşılıklı etkileşimle ders görüyoruz. Bir yandan tarih öğrenirken, diğer yandan multidisipliner bir bakış açısıyla hayata hazırlanıyoruz. Her şeyden önemlisi burada yüzün hep gülüyor. Sen de hem mutlu olmak hem de tarih okumak istiyorsan bize katıl. Merhaba, medya ve iletişimden Sude ben. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra medya ve iletişim uzmanı olmak istedim. Mutlu olmadan olduğu şeyin bir önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir medya iletişim uzmanı olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'nin tercih ettiğinden bahsedeyim size. Bölümde akademik ve bilimsel anlayış üzerine odaklanıyorsun. Bu nedenle daha çok alana akademisyen, araştırmacı ve bilim insanı yetiştirme misyonu etrafında biçimlenebiliyorsun. Üsküdar Üniversitesi Televizyonu, Radyosu ve Üsküdar Haber Ajansı gibi üniversitemizin medya organlarında görev alarak daha okul yıllarında medya ile iç içe oluyoruz. Bunun dışında yıl boyu düzenlenen etkinliklerde sektörün önde gelen isimleriyle bir araya gelme imkanı oluyor. Her şeyden önce burada yüzün hep geliyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra medya ve iletişim uzmanı olmak istiyorsan bize katıl. Merhaba, ben Elif Nur, psikoloji bölümü öğrencisiyim. Hem mutlu olmak hem de psikolog olmak istedim hep. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir psikolog olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ne tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Davranış ve sağlık bilimlerinde Türkiye'nin ilk ve tek tematik üniversitesinden mezun oluyorsun. Pozitif psikoloji dersiyle hayata bambaşka pencereden bakma fırsatı yakalıyorsun. Üniversite Hastane işbirliği modeliyle akademik ve klinik eğitimin iç içe olduğu bir lisans tecrübesi elde ediyorsun. Multidisipliner eğitim kültürünü oluşturma idealiyle dünya standartlarının üstünde bilim üretme hedefini bizzat hissediyor ve görüyorsun. Türkçe ve İngilizce eğitim olanağı var. Kurucu rektörümüz Profesör Doktor Nevzat Tarhan Endülüğü'ndeki güçlü akademik kadro ile seni kariyer hayatına en iyi şekilde hazırlıyor. Her şeyden önce burada yüzün hep gidiyor. Ee, hem mutlu olmak hem psikolog olmak istiyorsan bize katıl. Ben felsefe 3. sınıf öğrencisi Öznur Aynural. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra felsefe okumak istedim hep. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir felsefe olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Sokrates'in dediği gibi, kendini tanı, yolculuğun burada başlıyor. Okumak, sorgulamak, araştırmakla donandığın 4 yılın sonunda akademisyenlik, çeşitli şirketlerde felsefe danışmanlık, Basın yayın organlarında ve yayın evlerinde editörlük, yazarlık, eleştirmenlik, reklamcılık yapabiliyorsun. Kamu ve özel sektörde, sivil toplum kuruluşlarında, hukuk, finans, tıp, medya, sanat gibi çeşitli alanların toplumsal hizmet projelerinde ve etik danışma kurullarında çalışabiliyorsun. Her şeyden önce yüzün burada hep gülüyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra felsefe okumak istiyorsan bize katı. Merhaba, ben Ahmet Arslan. Sosyoloji bölümü öğrencisiyim. Hayatım boyunca önce mutlu olmak, sonra sosyoloji okumak istedim hep. Aldığım sosyoloji eğitim sayesinde her ikisinin de özdeş kavramlar olduğunu fark ettim. Şimdi size neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'nin sosyoloji bölümünü tercih ettiğimi anlatayım. Bölümdeki dersler toplumsal olayları açıklama, yorumlama, eleştirme ve çözme ihtiyaçlarına karşılık vermeye yardımcı olan bir içeriğe sahip. Bu ihtiyacı karşılamak için gerekli olan temel kuramsal konular ve araştırma yöntemleri kapsamlı bir sosyolojik literatür çerçevesinde alanında deneyimli hocalar tarafından aktarılıyor. İstanbul gibi bir metropolde sağ çalışmaları vasıtasıyla pratiğe geçirme olanını sunuyor. Bu da bana mutlu bir toplumun nasıl inşa edileceği hususunda vizyon ve misyon kazandırıyor. Her şeyden önce hep yüzün gülüyor burada. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra sosyolog olmak istiyorsan bize katıl. Ben yeni medya gazetecilik bölümünden Burak. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra gazeteci olmak istedim ben. 
Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir gazeteci olmak için neden üstüne versin tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Hepimizin gözlemlediği gibi internetle birlikte medya ve gazetecilik alanında çok radikal, yapısal ve işlevsel dönüşüm süreçleri başladı. Yazılı basın, görsel, işitsel medya gibi ayrımlar ortadan kalkarak bütünleşik dijital yeni medya yapılanması ortaya çıktı. İşte burada yeni medya ve gazetecilik alanındaki bu yeni duruma uygun bir profesyonel olmana odaklı eğitim alıyorsun. Dijital içerik üretebilen ve yönetebilen, yeni medyanın tüm özelliklerini kullanabilen bir profesyonel olma hedefleniyor. Ayrıca yeni medya okuryazarı direklerine sahip olarak medya içeriklerini eleştirel bakabilmeyi öğreniyorsunuz. Mesleki etik değerlere uygun davranmanın gazetecilik mesleği açısından ne kadar önemli olduğunu kavruyorsun. Her şey dönünce burada yüzün hep biliyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra gazeteci olmak için bize katıl. Reklam tasarımı ve iletişimi öğrencisi Zehra Güneş. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra reklamcı olmak istedim hep. Mutlu olmadan olduğu şeyin önemi yok çünkü. Ben de mutlu bir reklamcı olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğinden bahsedeyim size. Nitelikli bir akademisyen kadrodan 4 yıl boyunca eğlenerek, keyif alarak eğitim görüyorsun. İlgi ve yönelimlerine yanıt vermeye elverişli bir ders programın oluyor. Sektörle işbirliği içinde hazırlanan bir eğitim öğretim programı oluyor. Bu eğitim kapsamında hem reklam sektörüne hem de akademik çalışma yapmakta olan kurumlara profesyonel bir iletişimci olmaya hazırlanıyorsun. Her şeyden önce yüzün burada hep gülüyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra reklamcı olmak istiyorsan size katıl. Merhaba, ben Eylül. Üsküdar Üniversitesi Halk ve İlişkiler Bölümü öğrencisiyim. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra haklı ilişkiler uzmanı olmak istedim hep. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir haklı ilişkiler uzmanı olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Bölümde insanların neden ve nasıl iletişim kurduklarından başlayarak medyanın insan ve toplumlara etkisini, devletlerin, kurumların ve markaların işleyişini ve dev haklı ilişkiler kampanyalarının nasıl yapıldığını öğreniyorsunuz. Yıl boyu düzenlenen etkinlikler sayesinde sektörün önde gelen isimleriyle birlikte çalışma imkanı yakalıyorsun. Her şeyden önce burada hep yüzün gülüyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra haklı işleri uzmanı olmak için bize katıl. Merhaba ben Sezer, radyo, televizyon ve sinema öğrencisiyim. Önce mutlu olmak istedim. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir radyo, televizyon ve sinema mezunu olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Nitelikli bir akademik kadrodan ders alıyorsun. Ders gördüğün alanlar fiziki ve teknik donanımlı mekanlardan, laboratuvarlardan oluşuyor. Radyo ve televizyon stüdyolarında teorik ve uygulamalı eğitimi bir arada görüyorsun. Yalnızca bugün değil, geleceği de dikkate alarak hazırlanmış bir müfredatın var. Kalifiye meslek insanları olarak yetiştirildiğini her an hissediyorsun. Yıl boyu düzenlenen etkinliklerde sektörün önde gelen isimleriyle bir araya gelme imkanı buluyorsun. Ü TV ve Ü Radyo stüdyolarında pratik imkanı oluyor. Her şeyden önce burada yüzün hep biliyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra radyocu, televizyoncu veya sinemacı olmak istiyorsan bize katıl. Merhaba arkadaşlar, ben Nur. Üsküdar Üniversitesi Görselleşim Kasırma Öğrencisi. Her şeyden önce mutlu olmak ve iyi bir görselleşimci olmak istedim. Çünkü mutlu olmadan yaptığımız için hiçbir önemi yok. O zaman neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi Görselleşim Kasırma Öğrencisi'nin tercih ettiğinden size birazcık bahsedeyim. Sıkılmadan, eğlene eğlene, 4 yıl genelden özele, kurumsaldan uygulamaya, birbirini tamamlayan dersler görüyorsun. İkinci sınıftan itibaren genelde mektep oratöründe oluyoruz. Alanında uzman, kalifiye meslek insanı olarak yetiştirildiğini her an hissediyorsun. Yalnızca bugünü değil, geleceği de dikkate alarak hazırlanmış bir müfredatım var. Mezuniyetten sonra artık sen ne istersen, ajans, medya, kurumsal. Her şeyden önce burada yüzünü hep duruyor. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra da iyi bir görselle çizgi olmak istiyorsan bize kat. İstanbul'un kalbi Üsküdar'da Türkiye'nin beyin üssünü kurmak ve dünya çapında bir üniversite olabilmek için kolları sıvadığımızda her şeyi insanı anlamakla başlar dedik ve bu gayeyle çıktık yola. Sağlık alanındaki çeyrek asırlık tecrübeyle Türkiye'nin ilk ve tek davranış bilimleri ve sağlık temalı üniversitesi ünvanına kavuşmamıza uzanan yolculuğumuz böyle başladı. Kısa zamanda çok büyük mesafeler kat ederek ülkemizi bilimin ışığında parlak yarınlara taşıyacak gençler yetiştirmiş olmanın mutluluğunu yaşıyoruz. İnanıyoruz ki ulusal ve uluslararası ölçekte çağdaş, donanımlı, sorgulayan, araştıran, bilim üreten gençlerimiz de global platformlarda daha birçok başarımız, gururumuz olacak. 
Biz hayatın içinde bir üniversiteyiz. Bir üniversite 5 yerleşke anlayışıyla İstanbul'un farklı noktalarından kolaylıkla ulaşılabilen yerleşkelerimizde öğrencilerimizin kampüs deneyimini şehrin dinamik temposundan kopmadan yaşamasını sağlıyor, onların hayata her an bağlı kalmalarına olarak tanıyoruz. Öğrencilerimize teorik ve pratik bilgiyi bir bütün olarak sunduğumuz, yapay zekadan farmakogenetiğe kadar pek çok farklı alana yönelik 70'i aşkın laboratuvarımız, televizyon ve radyo stüdyolarımız, ileri teknolojiye sahip dersliklerimiz ve daha birçok modern altyapı özelliğimizle dünya standartlarında bir üniversiteyiz. 6 fakülte, 1 sağlık hizmetleri meslek yüksekokulu ve 5 enstitümüzde hepsi alanlarında yetkin, bini aşkın güçlü akademik ve idari kadromuzla 4 temel ilkemiz olan eleştirilebilirlik, özgürlükçülük, çoğulculuk ve katılımcılığı yüksek öğretimin her alanında uyguluyoruz. Tıp, diş, mühendislik ve doğa bilimleri, iletişim, sağlık bilimleri, insan ve toplum bilimleri alanlarındaki lisans ve sağlık hizmetleri meslek yüksekokulu ön lisans programlarımızın yanı sıra bağımlılık ve adli bilimlerden tasavvuf araştırmalarına kadar farklı branşlara yönelik yüksek lisans ve doktora programlarımızla birlikte Toplamda 22 bine aşkın öğrencimizde yüksek öğretimde çığır açmaya devam ediyor. 10. yılımızı geride bırakırken verdiğimiz 23 bin mezunumuzla da gurur duyuyoruz. Girişimcilik, üniversite kültürü ve yurt dışındaki birçok saygın üniversiteden önce dünyada ilk kez hayata geçirdiğimiz pozitif psikoloji gibi derslerin yanı sıra yüzlerce ulusal ve uluslararası çapta etkinlikle öğrencilerimizin iyi birer dünya vatandaşı olmalarını amaçlıyoruz. Türkiye'nin ilk bilim ve fikir festivali ve yüksek insani değerler ödülleri gibi geleneksel hale getirdiğimiz geniş kapsamlı etkinlikler ve sosyal sorumluluk projeleriyle kurumsal çalışmalarımızı sosyo-kültürel alanlara da yayıyoruz. Mutlu Yuva, Haydi Tut Elimi Derneği gibi sivil toplum kuruluşlarıyla sevgi ve güven dolu bir geleceğe katkıda bulunurken, bilim ve uygulama ortağımız NP İstanbul Beyin Hastanesi uzmanlarının desteği sayesinde başarıyla sürdürdüğümüz Aileler Üniversitede projesi ve benzeri çalışmalarla yarınlarımız için sağlam temeller inşa ediyoruz. Arge odaklarımızın yanı sıra Brain Park Teknoloji Transfer Ofisi, Silikon Türk Teknopark gibi teknolojik inovasyonlarla bilimsel çalışmalarda öncü rol üstleniyoruz. Dünyanın 80 ülkesinden 3000'e aşkın uluslararası öğrencimizle farklı medeniyetleri Üsküdar'ın bilim çatısı altında buluşturuyoruz. Yüksek öğretimde uluslararası kalite standartlarına büyük önem veriyoruz. Bu yöndeki tüm çalışmalarımızı Pearson, FedEx, ILAD, ISO 9001 gibi akreditasyonlarla belgeliyoruz. Kurucu rektörümüz Profesör Doktor Nevzat Tarhan'ın öncülüğünde G20 zirvesine ev sahipliği yapan ilk ve tek Türk üniversitesi olarak beyin konusundaki çalışmalarımıza küresel çapta devam ediyoruz. Geleceğin bilgili ve donanımlı hekimlerini yetiştirdiğimiz tıp fakültemizde afiliye hastanemiz NP İstanbul Beyin Hastanesi ile sürekli işbirliği içindeyiz. Ayrıca sağlık ve uygulama merkezlerimiz olan NP Fener Yolu ve NP Etiler Tıp Merkezimizde de geniş uygulama ve staj olanakları sunuyoruz. Üniversite tercihi gelecek tercihidir. Tercihini iyi bir gelecekten yana kullananlar Üsküdar Üniversitesi'nde buluşuyor, parlak yarınlara emin adımlarla yürüyorlar. Çünkü Üsküdar gerçek bir üniversite. Türkiye'nin beyin üssü Üsküdar Üniversitesi. Merhaba ben Asena. Herkes gibi ben de mutlu olmak istiyorum. Mutlu olmak için önce sevdiğim ve istediğim bölümde olmam gerektiğini biliyorum. Mutluyum çünkü Üsküdar Üniversitesi'nde tarih bölümü öğrencisiyim. Mutlu bir öğrenci olarak sizlere neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimi anlatayım. Bizde Türkiye'de tarih eğitiminde ilkleri yaşamamız mümkün. Bütün bir yıl sadece ders dinlemiyor, pek çok tarihi mekana, arşivlere, müzelere gidiyoruz. Ödevlerimizi sadece evde değil, bizzat sınıflarda, hocalarımız danışmanlığında yapıyoruz. Tarih öğrenimi için çok önemli olan Osmanlıca eğitimini oldukça yoğun alıyoruz. Derslerimizi grup çalışmaları eşliğinde sorgulayarak işliyoruz. Bu fakültede bulunan sosyoloji, felsefe, siyaset bilimi ve uluslararası ilişkileri bölümleri ile birlikte karşılıklı etkileşimle ders görüyoruz. Bir yandan tarih öğrenirken, diğer yandan multidisipliner bir bakış açısıyla hayata hazırlanıyoruz. Her şeyden önemlisi burada yüzün hep gülüyor. Sen de hem mutlu olmak hem de tarih okumak istiyorsan bize katıl. Medya ve iletişimden Sude ben. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra medya ve iletişim uzmanı olmak istedim. Mutlu olmadan olduğu şeyin bir önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir medya iletişim uzmanı olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Bölümde akademik ve bilimsel anlayış üzerine odaklanıyorsunuz. 
Bu nedenle daha çok alana akademisyen, araştırmacı ve bilim insanı yetiştirme misyonu etrafında biçimlenebiliyoruz. Üsküdar Üniversitesi Televizyonu, Radyosu ve Üsküdar Haber Ajansı gibi üniversitemizin medya organlarında görev alarak daha okul yıllarında medya ile iç içe oluyoruz. Bunun dışında yıl boyu düzenlenen etkinliklerde sektörün önde gelen isimleriyle bir araya gelme imkanı oluyor. Her şeyden önce burada yüzün hep geliyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra medya ve iletişim uzmanı olmak istiyorsan bize katıl. Merhaba, ben Elif Nur, psikoloji bölümü öğrencisiyim. Hem mutlu olmak hem de psikolog olmak istedim hep. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir psikolog olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ne tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Davranış ve sağlık bilimlerinde Türkiye'nin ilk ve tek tematik üniversitesinden mezun oluyorsun. Pozitif psikoloji dersiyle hayata bambaşka pencereden bakma fırsatı yakalıyorsun. Üniversite Hastane İşbirliği modeliyle akademik ve klinik eğitimin iç içe olduğu bir lisans tecrübesi elde ediyorsun. Multidisipliner eğitim kültürünü oluşturma idealiyle dünya standartlarının üstünde bilim üretme hedefini bizzat hissediyor ve görüyorsun. Türkçe ve İngilizce eğitim olanı var. Kurucu rektörümüz Profesör Doktor Nevzat Tarhan Endüriyündeki güçlü akademik kadro ile seni kariyer hayatına en iyi şekilde hazırlıyor. Her şeyden önce burada yüzün hep gidiyor. Ee, hem mutlu olmak hem psikolog olmak istiyorsan bize katıl. Ben felsefe 3. sınıf öğrencisi Öznur Aynural. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra felsefe okumak istedim hep. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir felsefe mezunu olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Sokrates'in dediği gibi, kendini tanı, yolculuğun burada başlıyor. Okumak, sorgulamak, araştırmakla donandığın 4 yılın sonunda akademisyenlik, çeşitli şirketlerde felsefe danışmanlık, Basın yayın organlarında ve yayın evlerinde editörlük, yazarlık, eleştirmenlik, reklamcılık yapabiliyorsun. Kamu ve özel sektörde, sivil toplum kuruluşlarında, hukuk, finans, tıp, medya, sanat gibi çeşitli alanların toplumsal hizmet projelerinde ve etik danışma kurullarında çalışabiliyorsun. Her şeyden önce yüzün burada hep gülüyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra felsefe okumak istiyorsan bize katı. Merhaba, ben Ahmet Arslan. Sosyoloji bölümü öğrencisiyim. Hayatım boyunca önce mutlu olmak, sonra sosyoloji okumak istedim hep. Aldığım sosyoloji eğitimim sayesinde her ikisinin de özdeş kavramlar olduğunu fark ettim. Şimdi size neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'nin sosyoloji bölümünü tercih ettiğimi anlatayım. Bölümdeki dersler toplumsal olayları açıklama, yorumlama, eleştirme ve çözme ihtiyaçlarına karşılık vermeye yardımcı olan bir içeriğe sahip. Bu ihtiyacı karşılamak için gerekli olan temel kuramsal konular ve araştırma yöntemleri kapsamlı bir sosyolojik literatür çerçevesinde alanında deneyimli hocalar tarafından aktarılıyor. İstanbul gibi bir metropolde sağ çalışmaları vasıtasıyla pratiğe geçirme olanağı da sunuyor. Bu da bana mutlu bir toplumun nasıl inşa edileceği hususunda vizyon ve misyon kazandırıyor. Her şeyden önce hep yüzün gülüyor burada. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra sosyolog olmak istiyorsan bize katıl. Ben yeni medya gazetecilik bölümünden Burak. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra gazeteci olmak istedim ben. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir gazeteci olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğinden bahsedeyim size. Hepimizin gözlemlediği gibi internetle birlikte medya ve gazetecilik alanında çok radikal, yapısal ve işlevsel dönüşüm süreçleri başladı. Yazılı basın, görsel, işitsel medya gibi ayrımlar ortadan kalkarak bütünleşik dijital yeni medya yapılanması ortaya çıktı. İşte burada yeni medya ve gazetecilik alanındaki bu yeni duruma uygun bir profesyonel olmalı odaklı eğitim alıyorsun. Dijital içerik üretebilen ve yönetebilen, yeni medyanın tüm özelliklerini kullanabilen bir profesyonel olmak hedefleniyor. Ayrıca yeni medya okuryazarı direklerine sahip olarak medya içeriklerine eleştiren bakabilmeyi öğreniyorsun. Mesleki etik değerlere uygun davranmanın gazetecilik mesleği açısından ne kadar önemli olduğunu kavruyorsun. Her şeyden önce burada yüzün hep biliyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra gazeteci olmak için bize katıl. Reklam tasarımı ve iletişim öğrencisi Zehra Güneş. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra reklamcı olmak istedim hep. Mutlu olmadan olduğu şeyin önemi yok çünkü. Ben de mutlu bir reklamcı olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğinden bahsedeyim size. Nitelikli bir akademisyen kadrodan 4 yıl boyunca eğlenerek, keyif alarak eğitim görüyorsun. İlgi ve yönelimlerine yanıt vermeye elverişli bir ders programın oluyor. 
sektörle işbirliği içinde hazırlanan bir eğitim öğretim programı oluyor. Bu eğitim kapsamında hem reklam sektörüne hem de akademik çalışma yapmakta olan kurumlara profesyonel bir iletişimci olmaya hazırlanıyorsun. Her şeyden önce yüzün burada hep gülüyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra reklamcı olmak istiyorsan size katıl. Merhaba, ben Eylül. Üsküdar Üniversitesi Halkla İlişkiler Bölümü öğrencisiyim. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra halkla ilişkiler uzmanı olmak istedim hep. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir halk ilişkileri uzmanı olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Bölümde insanların neden ve nasıl iletişim kurduklarından başlayarak medyanın insan ve toplumlara etkisini, devletlerin, kurumların ve markaların işleyişini ve dev halk ilişkiler kampanyalarının nasıl yapıldığını öğreniyorsun. Yıl boyu düzenlenen etkinlikler sayesinde sektörün önde gelen isimleriyle birlikte çalışma imkanı yakalıyorsun. Her şeyden önce burada hep yüzün gülüyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra haklı işleri uzmanı olmak için bize katıl. Merhaba ben Sezer, radyo, televizyon ve sinema öğrencisiyim. Önce mutlu olmak istedim. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir radyo, televizyon ve sinema mezunu olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğinden bahsedeyim size. Nitelikli bir akademik kadrodan ders alıyorsun. Ders gördüğün alanlar fiziki ve teknik donanımlı mekanlardan, laboratuvarlardan oluşuyor. Radyo ve televizyon stüdyolarında teorik ve uygulamalı eğitimi bir arada görüyorsun. Yalnızca bugün değil, geleceği de dikkate alarak hazırlanmış bir müfredatın var. Kalifiye meslek insanları olarak yetiştirildiğini her an hissediyorsun. Yıl boyu düzenlenen etkinliklerde sektörün önde gelen isimleriyle bir araya gelme imkanı buluyorsun. Ü TV ve Ü Radyo stüdyolarında pratik imkanı oluyor. Her şeyden önce burada yüzün hep biliyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra radyocu, televizyoncu veya sinemacı olmak istiyorsan bize katıl. Merhaba arkadaşlar, ben Nur. Üsküdar Üniversitesi Görsel İletişim Kasarı'nı öğrenciyim. Her şeyden önce mutlu olmak ve iyi bir görsel iletişimci olmak istedim. Çünkü mutlu olmadan yaptığımız için hiçbir önemi yok. O zaman neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi Görsel İletişim Kasarı'nın bir gün tercih ettiğinden size birazcık bahsedeyim. Sıkılmadan, eğlene eğlene, 4 yıl genelden özele, kurumsaldan uygulamaya, birbirini tamamlayan dersler görüyorsun. İkinci sınıftan itibaren genelde mektebi örtülerinde oluyoruz. Alanında uzman, kalifiye meslek insanı olarak yetiştirildiğini her an hissediyorsun. Yalnızca bugünü değil, geleceği de dikkate alarak hazırlanmış bir müfredatım var. Mezuniyetten sonra artık sen ne istersen, ajans, medya, kurumsal. Her şeyden önce burada yüzünü ettiriyor. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra da iyi bir gösteriyle çizgi olmak istiyorsan bize kat. İstanbul'un kalbi Üsküdar'da Türkiye'nin beyin üstünü kurmak ve dünya çapında bir üniversite olabilmek için kolları sıvadığımızda her şeyi insanı anlamakla başlar dedik ve bu gayeyle çıktık yola. Sağlık alanındaki çeyrek asırlık tecrübeyle Türkiye'nin ilk ve tek davranış bilimleri ve sağlık temalı üniversitesi ünvanına kavuşmamıza uzanan yolculuğumuz böyle başladı. Kısa zamanda çok büyük mesafeler kat ederek ülkemizi bilimin ışığında parlak yarınlara taşıyacak gençler yetiştirmiş olmanın mutluluğunu yaşıyoruz. İnanıyoruz ki ulusal ve uluslararası ölçekte çağdaş, donanımlı, sorgulayan, araştıran, bilim üreten gençlerimiz de global platformlarda daha birçok başarımız, gururumuz olacak. Biz hayatın içinde bir üniversiteyiz. Bir üniversite beş yerleşke anlayışıyla İstanbul'un farklı noktalarından kolaylıkla ulaşılabilen yerleşkelerimizde öğrencilerimizin kampüs deneyimini şehrin dinamik temposundan kopmadan yaşamasını sağlıyor, onların hayata her an bağlı kalmalarına olarak tanıyoruz. Öğrencilerimize teorik ve pratik bilgiyi bir bütün olarak sunduğumuz, yapay zekadan farmakogenetiğe kadar pek çok farklı alana yönelik, 70'i aşkın laboratuvarımız, televizyon ve radyo stüdyolarımız, ileri teknolojiye sahip dersliklerimiz ve daha birçok modern altyapı özelliğimizle dünya standartlarında bir üniversiteyiz. 6 fakülte, 1 sağlık hizmetleri meslek yüksekokulu ve 5 enstitümüzde hepsi alanlarında yetkin, bini aşkın güçlü akademik ve idari kadromuzla 4 temel ilkemiz olan eleştirilebilirlik, özgürlükçülük, çoğulculuk ve katılımcılığı yüksek öğretimin her alanında uyguluyoruz. Tıp, diş, mühendislik ve doğa bilimleri, iletişim, sağlık bilimleri, insan ve toplum bilimleri alanlarındaki lisans ve sağlık hizmetleri meslek yüksekokulu ön lisans programlarımızın yanı sıra bağımlılık ve adli bilimlerden tasavvuf araştırmalarına kadar farklı branşlara yönelik yüksek lisans ve doktora programlarımızla birlikte 
Toplamda 22 bine aşkın öğrencimizde yüksek öğretimde çığır açmaya devam ediyor. 10. yılımızı geride bırakırken verdiğimiz 23 bin mezunumuzla da gurur duyuyoruz. Girişimcilik, üniversite kültürü ve yurt dışındaki birçok saygın üniversiteden önce dünyada ilk kez hayata geçirdiğimiz pozitif psikoloji gibi derslerin yanı sıra yüzlerce ulusal ve uluslararası çapta etkinlikle öğrencilerimizin iyi birer dünya vatandaşı olmalarını amaçlıyoruz. Türkiye'nin ilk bilim ve fikir festivali ve yüksek insani değerler ödülleri gibi geleneksel hale getirdiğimiz geniş kapsamlı etkinlikler ve sosyal sorumluluk projeleriyle kurumsal çalışmalarımızı sosyo-kültürel alanlara da yayıyoruz. Mutlu Yuva, Haydi Tut Elimi Derneği gibi sivil toplum kuruluşlarıyla sevgi ve güven dolu bir geleceğe katkıda bulunurken, bilim ve uygulama ortağımız NP İstanbul Beyin Hastanesi uzmanlarının desteği sayesinde başarıyla sürdürdüğümüz Aileler Üniversitede projesi ve benzeri çalışmalarla yarınlarımız için sağlam temeller inşa ediyoruz. Arge odaklarımızın yanı sıra Brain Park Teknoloji Transfer Ofisi, Silikon Türk Teknopark gibi teknolojik inovasyonlarla bilimsel çalışmalarda öncü rol üstleniyoruz. Dünyanın 80 ülkesinden 3000'e aşkın uluslararası öğrencimizle farklı medeniyetleri Üsküdar'ın bilim çatısı altında buluşturuyoruz. Yüksek öğretimde uluslararası kalite standartlarına büyük önem veriyoruz. Bu yöndeki tüm çalışmalarımızı Pearson, FEDEC, ILAT, ISO 9001 gibi akreditasyonlarla belgeliyoruz. Kurucu rektörümüz Profesör Doktor Nevzat Tarhan'ın öncülüğünde G20 zirvesine ev sahipliği yapan ilk ve tek Türk üniversitesi olarak beyin konusundaki çalışmalarımıza küresel çapta devam ediyoruz. Geleceğin bilgili ve donanımlı hekimlerini yetiştirdiğimiz tıp fakültemizde afiliye hastanemiz NP İstanbul Beyin Hastanesi ile sürekli işbirliği içindeyiz. Ayrıca sağlık ve uygulama merkezlerimiz olan NP Fener Yolu ve NP Etiler Tıp Merkezimizde de geniş uygulama ve staj olanakları sunuyoruz. Üniversite tercihi gelecek tercihidir. Tercihini iyi bir gelecekten yana kullananlar Üsküdar Üniversitesi'nde buluşuyor, parlak yarınlara emin adımlarla yürüyorlar. Çünkü Üsküdar gerçek bir üniversite. Türkiye'nin beyin üssü Üsküdar Üniversitesi. Merhaba ben Asena. Herkes gibi ben de mutlu olmak istiyorum. Mutlu olmak için önce sevdiğim ve istediğim bölümde olmam gerektiğini biliyorum. Mutluyum çünkü Üsküdar Üniversitesi'nde tarih bölümü öğrencisiyim. Mutlu bir öğrenci olarak sizlere neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimi anlatayım. Bizde Türkiye'de tarih eğitiminde ilkleri yaşamanız mümkün. Bütün bir yıl sadece ders dinlemiyor, pek çok tarihi mekana, arşivlere, müzelere gidiyoruz. Ödevlerimizi sadece evde değil, bizzat sınıflarda, hocalarımız danışmanlığında yapıyoruz. Tarih öğrenimi için çok önemli olan Osmanlıca eğitimini oldukça yoğun alıyoruz. Derslerimizi grup çalışmaları eşliğinde sorgulayarak işliyoruz. Bu fakültede bulunan sosyoloji, felsefe, siyaset bilimi ve uluslararası ilişkileri bölümleri ile birlikte karşılıklı etkileşimle ders görüyoruz. Bir yandan tarih öğrenirken, diğer yandan multidisipliner bir bakış açısıyla hayata hazırlanıyoruz. Her şeyden önemlisi burada yüzün hep gülüyor. Sen de hem mutlu olmak hem de tarih okumak istiyorsan bize katıl. Medya ve iletişimden Sude ben. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra medya ve iletişim uzmanı olmak istedim. Mutlu olmadan olduğu şeyin bir önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir medya iletişim uzmanı olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğinden bahsedeyim size. Bölümde akademik ve bilimsel anlayış üzerine odaklanıyorsun. Bu nedenle daha çok alana akademisyen, araştırmacı ve bilim insanı yetiştirme misyonu etrafında biçimlenebiliyorsun. Üsküdar Üniversitesi Televizyonu, Radyosu ve Üsküdar Haber Ajansı gibi üniversitemizin medya organlarında görev alarak daha okul yıllarında medya ile iç içe oluyoruz. Bunun dışında yıl boyu düzenlenen etkinliklerde sektörün önde gelen isimleriyle bir araya gelme imkanı oluyor. Her şeyden önce burada yüzün hep biliyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra medya ve iletişim uzmanı olmak istiyorsan bize katıl. Merhaba, ben Elif Nur, psikoloji bölümü öğrencisiyim. Hem mutlu olmak hem de psikolog olmak istedim hep. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir psikolog olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ne tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Davranış ve sağlık bilimlerinde Türkiye'nin ilk ve tek tematik üniversitesinden mezun oluyorsun. Pozitif psikoloji dersiyle hayata bambaşka pencereden bakma fırsatı yakalıyorsun. Üniversite Hastane işbirliği modeliyle akademik ve klinik eğitimin iç içe olduğu bir lisans tecrübesi elde ediyorsun. Multidisipliner eğitim kültürünü oluşturma idealiyle dünya standartlarının üstünde bilim üretme hedefini bizzat hissediyor ve görüyorsun. 
Türkçe ve İngilizce eğitim olanağım var. Kurucu rektörümüz Profesör Doktor Nevzat Tarhan Endüstriyindeki güçlü akademik kadro ile seni kariyer hayatına en iyi şekilde hazırlıyor. Her şeyden önce burada yüzüm hep gidiyor. Ee, hem mutlu olmak hem psikolog olmak istiyorsan bize katıl. Ben felsefe 3. sınıf öğrencisi Öznur Aynural. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra felsefe okumak istedim hep. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir felsefe mezun olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Sokrates'in dediği gibi, kendini tanı, yolculuğun burada başlıyor. Okumak, sorgulamak, araştırmakla donandığın 4 yılın sonunda akademisyenlik, çeşitli şirketlerde felsefe danışmanlık, basın yayın organlarında ve yayın evlerinde editörlük, yazarlık, eleştirmenlik, reklamcılık yapabiliyorsun. Kamu ve özel sektörde, sivil toplum kuruluşlarında, hukuk, finans, tıp, medya, sanat gibi çeşitli alanların toplumsal hizmet projelerinde ve etik danışma kurullarında çalışabiliyorsun. Her şeyden önce yüzün burada hep gülüyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra felsefe okumak istiyorsan bize katıl. Merhaba, ben Ahmet Arslan. Sosyoloji bölümü öğrencisiyim. Hayatım boyunca önce mutlu olmak, sonra sosyoloji okumak istedim hep. Aldığım sosyoloji eğitimim sayesinde her ikisinin de özdeş kavramlar olduğunu fark ettim. Şimdi size neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'nin sosyoloji bölümünü tercih ettiğimi anlatayım. Bölümdeki dersler toplumsal olayları açıklama, yorumlama, eleştirme ve çözme ihtiyaçlarına karşılık vermeye yardımcı olan bir içeriğe sahip. Bu ihtiyacı karşılamak için gerekli olan temel kuramsal konular ve araştırma yöntemleri kapsamlı bir sosyolojik literatür çerçevesinde alanında deneyimli hocalar tarafından aktarılıyor. İstanbul gibi bir metropolde sağ çalışmaları vasıtasıyla pratiğe geçirme olanı hızı sunuyor. Bu da bana mutlu bir toplumun nasıl inşa edileceği hususunda vizyon ve misyon kazandırıyor. Her şeyden önce hep yüzün gülüyor burada. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra sosyolog olmak istiyorsan bize katıl. Ben yeni medya gazetecilik bölümünden Burak. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra gazeteci olmak istedim ben. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir gazeteci olmak için neden Üstün Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Hepimizin gözlemlediği gibi internetle birlikte medya ve gazetecilik alanında çok radikal, yapısal ve işlevsel dönüşüm süreçleri başladı. Yazılı basın, görsel, işitsel medya gibi ayrımlar ortadan kalkarak bütünleşik dijital yeni medya yapılanması ortaya çıktı. İşte burada yeni medya ve gazetecilik alanındaki bu yeni duruma uygun bir profesyonel olmana odaklı eğitim alıyorsun. Dijital içerik üretebilen ve yönetebilen, yeni medyanın tüm özelliklerini kullanabilen bir profesyonel olmak hedefleniyor. Ayrıca yeni medya okuryazarı direklerine sahip olarak medya içeriklerini eleştirel bakabilmeyi öğreniyorsun. Mesleki etik değerlere uygun davranmanın gazetecilik mesleği açısından ne kadar önemli olduğunu kavruyorsun. Her şeyden önce burada yüzün hep giriyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra gazeteci olmak için bize katıl. Reklam tasarımı ve iletişim öğrencisi Zehra Güneş. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra reklamcı olmak istedim hep. Mutlu olmadan olduğu şeyin önemi yok çünkü. Ben de mutlu bir reklamcı olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğinden bahsedeyim size. Nitelikli bir akademisyen kadrodan 4 yıl boyunca eğlenerek, keyif alarak eğitim görüyorsun. İlgi ve yönelimlerine yanıt vermeye elverişli bir ders programın oluyor. Sektörle işbirliği içinde hazırlanan bir eğitim öğretim programı oluyor. Bu eğitim kapsamında hem reklam sektörüne hem de akademik çalışma yapmakta olan kurumlara profesyonel bir iletişimci olmaya hazırlanıyorsun. Her şeyden önce yüzün burada hep gülüyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra reklamcı olmak istiyorsan size katıl. Merhaba, ben Eylül. Üsküdar Üniversitesi Halkla İlişkiler Bölümü öğrencisiyim. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra haklı ilişkiler uzmanı olmak istedim hep. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir haklı ilişkiler uzmanı olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Bölümde insanların neden ve nasıl iletişim kurduklarından başlayarak medyanın insan ve toplumlara etkisini, devletlerin, kurumların ve markaların işleyişini ve dev haklı ilişkiler kampanyalarının nasıl yapıldığını öğreniyorsunuz. Yıl boyu düzenlenen etkinlikler sayesinde sektörün önde gelen isimleriyle birlikte çalışma imkanı yakalıyorsun. Her şeyden önce burada hep yüzün gülüyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra haklı ilişkileri uzmanı olmak için bize katıl. Merhaba ben Sezer. 
radyo, televizyon ve sinema öğrencisiyim. Önce mutlu olmak istedim. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir radyo, televizyon ve sinema mezunu olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Nitelikli bir akademik kadrodan ders alıyorsun. Ders gördüğün alanlar fiziki ve teknik donanımlı mekanlardan, laboratuvarlardan oluşuyor. Radyo ve televizyon stüdyolarında teorik ve uygulamalı eğitimi bir arada görüyorsun. Yalnızca bugün değil, geleceği de dikkate alarak hazırlanmış bir müfredatın var. Kalifiye meslek insanları olarak yetiştirildiğini her an hissediyorsun. Yıl boyu düzenlenen etkinliklerde sektörün önde gelen isimleriyle bir araya gelme imkanı buluyorsun. Ü TV ve Ü Radyo stüdyolarında pratik imkanı oluyor. Her şeyden önce burada hizmet biliyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra radyocu, televizyoncu veya sinemacı olmak istiyorsan bize katıl. Her şeyden önce mutlu olmak ve iyi bir görsel iletişimci olmak istedim. Çünkü mutlu olmadan yaptığımız için hiçbir önemi yok. O zaman neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi görsel iletişim tasarım bölümünü tercih ettiğinden size birazcık bahsedeyim. Sıkılmadan eğlene eğlene 4 yıl genelden özele, kurumsaldan uygulamaya, birbirini tamamlayan dersler görüyorsun. İkinci sınıftan itibaren genelde mek laboratuvarında oluyorsun. Alanında uzman, kalifiye meslek insanı olarak yetiştirildiğini her an hissediyorsun. Yalnızca bugünü değil, geleceği de dikkate alarak hazırlanmış bir müfredatım var. Mezuniyetten sonra artık sen ne istersen. Ajans, medya, kurumsal. Her şeyden önce burada yüzün hep duruyor. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra da iyi bir görselleştirici olmak istiyorsan bize kat. İstanbul'un kalbi Üsküdar'da Türkiye'nin beyin üstünü kurmak ve dünya çapında bir üniversite olabilmek için kolları sıvadığımızda her şeyi insanı anlamakla başlar dedik ve bu gayeyle çıktık yola. Sağlık alanındaki çeyrek asırlık tecrübeyle Türkiye'nin ilk ve tek davranış bilimleri ve sağlık temalı üniversitesi ünvanına kavuşmamıza uzanan yolculuğumuz böyle başladı. Kısa zamanda çok büyük mesafeler kat ederek ülkemizi bilimin ışığında parlak yarınlara taşıyacak gençler yetiştirmiş olmanın mutluluğunu yaşıyoruz. İnanıyoruz ki ulusal ve uluslararası ölçekte çağdaş, donanımlı, sorgulayan, araştıran, bilim üreten gençlerimiz de global platformlarda daha birçok başarımız, gururumuz olacak. Biz hayatın içinde bir üniversiteyiz. Bir üniversite beş yerleşke anlayışıyla İstanbul'un farklı noktalarından kolaylıkla ulaşılabilen yerleşkelerimizde öğrencilerimizin kampüs deneyimini şehrin dinamik temposundan kopmadan yaşamasını sağlıyor, onların hayata her an bağlı kalmalarına olarak tanıyoruz. Öğrencilerimize teorik ve pratik bilgiyi bir bütün olarak sunduğumuz, yapay zekadan farmakogenetiğe kadar pek çok farklı alana yönelik, 70'i aşkın laboratuvarımız, televizyon ve radyo stüdyolarımız, ileri teknolojiye sahip dersliklerimiz ve daha birçok modern altyapı özelliğimizle dünya standartlarında bir üniversiteyiz. 6 fakülte, 1 sağlık hizmetleri meslek yüksekokulu ve 5 enstitümüzde hepsi alanlarında yetkin, bini aşkın güçlü akademik ve idari kadromuzla 4 temel ilkemiz olan eleştirilebilirlik, özgürlükçülük, çoğulculuk ve katılımcılığı yüksek öğretimin her alanında uyguluyoruz. Tıp, diş, mühendislik ve doğa bilimleri, iletişim, sağlık bilimleri, insan ve toplum bilimleri alanlarındaki lisans ve sağlık hizmetleri meslek yüksekokulu ön lisans programlarımızın yanı sıra bağımlılık ve adli bilimlerden tasavvuf araştırmalarına kadar farklı branşlara yönelik yüksek lisans ve doktora programlarımızla birlikte Toplamda 22 bine aşkın öğrencimiz de yüksek öğretimde çığır açmaya devam ediyor. 10. yılımızı geride bırakırken verdiğimiz 23 bin mezunumuzla da gurur duyuyoruz. Girişimcilik, üniversite kültürü ve yurt dışındaki birçok saygın üniversiteden önce dünyada ilk kez hayata geçirdiğimiz pozitif psikoloji gibi derslerin yanı sıra yüzlerce ulusal ve uluslararası çapta etkinlikle öğrencilerimizin iyi birer dünya vatandaşı olmalarını amaçlıyoruz. Türkiye'nin ilk bilim ve fikir festivali ve yüksek insani değerler ödülleri gibi geleneksel hale getirdiğimiz geniş kapsamlı etkinlikler ve sosyal sorumluluk projeleriyle kurumsal çalışmalarımızı sosyo-kültürel alanlara da yayıyoruz. Mutlu Yuva, Haydi Tut Elimi Derneği gibi sivil toplum kuruluşlarıyla sevgi ve güven dolu bir geleceğe katkıda bulunurken, bilim ve uygulama ortağımız NP İstanbul Beyin Hastanesi uzmanlarının desteği sayesinde başarıyla sürdürdüğümüz Aileler Üniversitede Projesi ve benzeri çalışmalarla yarınlarımız için sağlam temeller inşa ediyoruz. Arge odaklarımızın yanı sıra Brain Park Teknoloji Transfer Ofisi, Silikon Türk Teknopark gibi teknolojik inovasyonlarla bilimsel çalışmalarda öncü rol üstleniyoruz. Dünyanın 80 ülkesinden 3000'e aşkın uluslararası öğrencimizle farklı medeniyetleri Üsküdar'ın bilim çatısı altında buluşturuyoruz. 
Yüksek öğretimde uluslararası kalite standartlarına büyük önem veriyoruz. Bu yöndeki tüm çalışmalarımızı Pearson, FedEx, İLAT, ISO 9001 gibi akreditasyonlarla belgeliyoruz. Kurucu rektörümüz Profesör Doktor Nevzat Tarhan'ın öncülüğünde G20 zirvesine ev sahipliği yapan ilk ve tek Türk üniversitesi olarak beyin konusundaki çalışmalarımıza küresel çapta devam ediyoruz. Geleceğin bilgili ve donanımlı hekimlerini yetiştirdiğimiz tıp fakültemizde afiliye hastanemiz NP İstanbul Beyin Hastanesi ile sürekli işbirliği içindeyiz. Ayrıca sağlık ve uygulama merkezlerimiz olan NP Fener Yolu ve NP Etiler Tıp Merkezimizde de geniş uygulama ve staj olanakları sunuyoruz. Üniversite tercihi gelecek tercihidir. Tercihini iyi bir gelecekten yana kullananlar Üsküdar Üniversitesi'nde buluşuyor, parlak yarınlara emin adımlarla yürüyorlar. Çünkü Üsküdar gerçek bir üniversite. Türkiye'nin beyin üssü Üsküdar Üniversitesi. Merhaba ben Asena. Herkes gibi ben de mutlu olmak istiyorum. Mutlu olmak için önce sevdiğim ve istediğim bölümde olmam gerektiğini biliyorum. Mutluyum çünkü Üsküdar Üniversitesi'nde tarih bölümü öğrencisiyim. Mutlu bir öğrenci olarak sizlere neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimi anlatayım. Bizde Türkiye'de tarih eğitiminde ilkleri yaşamanız mümkün. Bütün bir yıl sadece ders dinlemiyor, pek çok tarihi mekana, arşivlere, müzelere gidiyoruz. Ödevlerimizi sadece evde değil, bizzat sınıflarda, hocalarımız danışmanlığında yapıyoruz. Tarih öğrenimi için çok önemli olan Osmanlıca eğitimini oldukça yoğun alıyoruz. Derslerimizi grup çalışmaları eşliğinde sorgulayarak işliyoruz. Bu fakültede bulunan sosyoloji, felsefe, siyaset bilimi ve uluslararası ilişkileri bölümleri ile birlikte karşılıklı etkileşimle ders görüyoruz. Bir yandan tarih öğrenirken, diğer yandan multidisipliner bir bakış açısıyla hayata hazırlanıyoruz. Her şeyden önemlisi burada yüzün hep gülüyor. Sen de hem mutlu olmak hem de tarih okumak istiyorsan bize katıl. Medya ve iletişimden Sude ben. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra medya ve iletişim uzmanı olmak istedim. Mutlu olmadan olduğu şeyin bir önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir medya iletişim uzmanı olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğinden bahsedeyim size. Bölümde akademik ve bilimsel anlayış üzerine odaklanıyorsun. Bu nedenle daha çok alana akademisyen, araştırmacı ve bilim insanı yetiştirme misyonu etrafında biçimlenebiliyorsun. Üsküdar Üniversitesi Televizyonu, Radyosu ve Üsküdar Haber Ajansı gibi üniversitemizin medya organlarında görev alarak daha okul yıllarında medya ile iç içe oluyoruz. Bunun dışında yıl boyu düzenlenen etkinliklerde sektörün önde gelen isimleriyle bir araya gelme imkanı oluyor. Her şeyden önce burada yüzün hep gülüyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak sonra medya ve iletişim uzmanı olmak istiyorsan bize katıl. Ben Elif Nur, psikoloji bölümü öğrencisiyim. Hem mutlu olmak hem de psikolog olmak istedim hep. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir psikolog olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ne tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Davranış ve sağlık bilimlerinde Türkiye'nin ilk ve tek tematik üniversitesinden mezun oluyorsun. Pozitif psikoloji dersiyle hayata bambaşka pencereden bakma fırsatı yakalıyorsun. Üniversite Hastane İşbirliği modeliyle akademik ve klinik eğitimin iç içe olduğu bir lisans tecrübesi elde ediyorsun. Multidisipliner eğitim kültürünü oluşturma idealiyle dünya standartlarının üstünde bilim üretme hedefini bizzat hissediyor ve görüyorsun. Türkçe ve İngilizce eğitim olanı var. Kurucu rektörümüz Profesör Doktor Nevzat Tarhan Endülüğü'ndeki güçlü akademik kadro ile seni kariyer hayatına en iyi şekilde hazırlıyor. Her şeyden önce burada yüzün hep gülüyor. Hem mutlu olmak hem psikolog olmak istiyorsan bize katıl. Merhaba, ben felsefe 3. sınıf öğrencisi Öznur Aynural. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra felsefe okumak istedim hep. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir felsefe mezunu olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Sokrates'in dediği gibi, kendini tanı, yolculuğun burada başlıyor. Okumak, sorgulamak, araştırmakla donandığın 4 yılın sonunda akademisyenlik, çeşitli şirketlerde felsefe danışmanlık, basın yayın organlarında ve yayın evlerinde editörlük, yazarlık, eleştirmenlik, reklamcılık yapabiliyorsun. Kamu ve özel sektörde, sivil toplum kuruluşlarında, hukuk, finans, tıp, medya, sanat gibi çeşitli alanların toplumsal hizmet projelerinde ve etik danışma kurullarında çalışabiliyorsun. Her şeyden önce yüzün burada hep gülüyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, Sonra felsefe okumak istiyorsan bize katı. 
merhaba, ben Ahmet Arslan, sosyoloji bölümü öğrencisiyim. Hayatım boyunca önce mutlu olmak, sonra sosyoloji okumak istedim hep. Aldığım sosyoloji eğitim sayesinde her ikisinin de özdeş kavramlar olduğunu fark ettim. Şimdi size neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'nin sosyoloji bölümünü tercih ettiğimi anlatayım. Bölümdeki dersler toplumsal olayları açıklama, yorumlama, eleştirme ve çözme ihtiyaçlarına karşılık vermeye yardımcı olan bir içeriğe sahip. Bu ihtiyacı karşılamak için gerekli olan temel kuramsal konular ve araştırma yöntemleri kapsamlı bir sosyolojik literatür çerçevesinde alanında deneyimli hocalar tarafından aktarılıyor. İstanbul gibi bir metropolde sağ çalışmaları vasıtasıyla pratiğe geçirme olanını sunuyor. Bu da bana mutlu bir toplumun nasıl inşa edileceği hususunda vizyon ve misyon kazandırıyor. Her şeyden önce hep yüzün gülüyor burada. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra sosyolog olmak istiyorsan bize katıl. Ben yeni medya gazetecilik bölümünden Burak. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra gazeteci olmak istedim ben. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir gazeteci olmak için neden Üstün Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Hepimizin gözlemlediği gibi internetle birlikte medya ve gazetecilik alanında çok radikal, yapısal ve işlevsel dönüşüm süreçleri başladı. Yazılı basın, görsel, işitsel medya gibi ayrımlar ortadan kalkarak bütünleşik dijital yeni medya yapılanması ortaya çıktı. İşte burada yeni medya ve gazetecilik alanındaki bu yeni duruma uygun bir profesyonel olmana odaklı eğitim alıyorsun. Dijital içerik üretebilen ve yönetebilen, yeni medyanın tüm özelliklerini kullanabilen bir profesyonel olma hedefleniyor. Ayrıca yeni medya okuryazarı direklerine sahip olarak medya içeriklerini eleştirel bakabilme öğreniyorsun. Mesleki etik değerlere uygun davranmanın gazetecilik mesleği açısından ne kadar önemli olduğunu kavruyorsun. Her şey dönünce burada yüzün hep biliyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra gazeteci olmak için bize katıl. Reklam tasarımı ve iletişimi öğrencisi Zehra Güneş. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra reklamcı olmak istedim hep. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. Ben de mutlu bir reklamcı olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğinden bahsedeyim size. Nitelikli bir akademisyen kadrodan 4 yıl boyunca eğlenerek, keyif alarak eğitim görüyorsun. İlgi ve yönelimlerine yanıt vermeye elverişli bir ders programın oluyor. Sektörle işbirliği içinde hazırlanan bir eğitim öğretim programı oluyor. Bu eğitim kapsamında hem reklam sektörüne hem de akademik çalışma yapmakta olan Shall we? Okay. Very good. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're very pleased to pursue the discussions in this panel, talking about yet another important neuropathological condition, which is epilepsy. And uh, we're fortunate to have a group of panelists that they are literally experts on the field and they are going to touch on the subject matter from different view angles. We'll be listening to uh, Professor Vasilis Katsaros for the brain mapping uh, for epilepsy surgery. Also, Dr. Youssef Zadeh will be highlighting some uh, ideas about the seizure due to the neuro infection. And also we will be having uh, Dr. Nadime, I'm sorry, Dr. Hamide Mustafa, Mustafai, uh, who's going to share with us some epidemiological insights regarding uh, epilepsy in Iran and a region. So, uh, if I may, I just want to start the session by sharing with you some uh, highlights regarding uh, what we have already been doing in terms of uh, uh, research on sleep and sleep disorders 
and the interface between sleep disorders and epilepsy. So, you know, technically there seemed to be like a two-way street between sleep and epilepsies. Some of the epilepsy seizures uh, left to form discharges in the brain uh, uh, EEG and quantitative EEG analysis of the brain oscillations solely happen during sleep. So that's why we need to differentiate sleep epilepsy versus uh, behavioral sleep disorders, including parasomnias. So generally, we have parasomnias and dysomnias. And overall, we, we have more than 80 type of sleep disorders according to the International Classification of, of Sleep Disorders, ICSD-10. So what are parasomnias? And parasomnias are actually defined as undesirable behavioral or experiential phenomena which almost exclusively occur during sleep. And somehow they were initially believed to be due to psychiatric conditions, but we know that uh, many other different conditions, including psychiatric and non-psychiatric conditions, give rise to parasomnia or abnormal behaviors during sleep, what we normally refer to as sleep behavioral disorders. And many of them, fortunately, are treatable. So overall, based on the ICSD, we have different types of sleep-related predicaments, and some of them are even more famous, including insomnias. I don't know if you're familiar with the, with the concept that we have 14 different insomnias. So insomnias are, are like pretty wide umbrella term. And we have sleep-related breathing disorders. At least 20 to 25 percent of the general population, they are suffering from some degrees of sleep-related breathing issues, including hypopneas, snoring, and uh, apneas, or the stoppage of the, of the breathing. Also, we have hypersomnia, people who have uh, idiopathic propensity to experience more and more uh, sleep during the day daytime hours. Circadian rhythm sleep disorders, some people have a um, advanced sleep, advanced circadian rhythm, some people have delayed circadian rhythm. And then we also have those sleep-related movement disorders, isolated symptoms, and other sleep disorders. But let's focus on parasomnias, which are categorized as abnormal behaviors during sleep. Some of the key uh, examples of uh, parasomnias are uh, disordered arousal. We have confusional arousal of sleepwalking and sleep terror, which is more uh, pr prevalent among the children. Also, we have the uh, parasomnia associated with REM sleep. And uh, also, some people refer to that as overall REM behavioral sleep disorders. We have isolated sleep paralysis and or incubus. I don't know if you have experienced that anyway, but we have also uh, nightmare disorders. Other parasomnias may be, may be categorized as dissociative disorders, enuresis or bedwetting, nocturnal groaning, and also explosive head syndrome, sleep-related eating disorders, also sexomnia or abnormal sexual behaviors during the sleep that a person is unaware of that and does not retain any memory for it. Uh, we also have the sleep-related hallucinations because of the drugs and medical problems. And some other parasomnias are unspecified. So we, when we deep dive into unspecified parasomnias and there is no primary reason for this, a fraction of those cases turn out to be cases with epilepsy or sleep epilepsy. This might be idiopathic generalized epilepsy, IgE, or it might be nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy, or NFLE. Right? So these are the two most prominent uh, sleep-related um, seizures. And uh, typically, they are occurring uh, in the first or second cycle of the slow-wave sleep. And the first one or two hours after falling asleep, we experience that. But the clinical features are, are like, uh, uh, you know, equivocal. So they also demonstrate some features of uh, wakefulness, like vocalization, ambulation. And also, they, they, they represent some features of, of deep sleep, including, including uh, like unresponsiveness, yet high arousal threshold. And uh, there are variable presentations. Patients have amnesia for the events, 
and uh, they, they might be experiencing some uh, sleep fragmentations. Normally, uh, people will, will report they have wakes after sleep onset, or WASOs, W-A-S-A-O. So those cases with VASOs need to be uh, scrutinized whether they have confusional arousal or not. It's confusional, when confusional arousal is the case, the person will sit up with glassy eyes, staring somewhere, starts talking, doing some abnormal behavior, you know, purposeless movements like what we have in the uh, complex partial seizures. And when it's the case almost all the time and it's a frequent occurrence, then we need to definitely go for the sleep test. That would do polysomnography. And a part of the polysomnography is to tap into the sleep EEG. Normally, according to the American Academy of Sleep Disorders, we AS, AASM, sleep medicine, we have like, they recommend six EEG channels, but in the neurology department or sleep neurology section, we do at least 19 channel quantitative EEG during sleep. Uh, some variables come into play like family history, age of onset, time of the occurrence, frequency, triggers, as you can see on the list. And the gold standard to capture the pathology is to do polysomnography, and that, that's how it works. The person, the person will come to our doors and get hospitalized in the sleep laboratory for one night, and we have the camera surveillance, we have the sleep EEG, also we tap into the eye movements or electroclography, we have sensors for breathing, we have sensors for, I mean, pressure of the breathing and also the, the uh, uh, uh, the microphone for probability of snoring. Also, we have this chest and abdominal movement sensors. Uh, we also have sensors for oxygen level detection and also limb movement, body position. So overall, we're just recording from 18 different biosignal channels, right? So putting all them together and coming to a conclusion based on the collective analysis of the report that we're getting in the PSG is, is a very hard task. And sometimes we ask the parents, for example, if the case is for children, to video the, the, the kid at home and just uh, help us better understand what has been the presentation of the symptoms. Uh, some of those uh, problems there, uh, they happen exclusively in the slow wave sleep. And some of them are like REM behavioral disorders. So some of the key hallmarks or neuromarkers for, for sleepwalking could be first HSD or hypersynchronous delta activity predominantly in the left hemisphere. So when, when we have the frontal temporal delta predominance and we have the focal slowing of the delta waves in the left hemisphere, this is one of the key hallmarks which has very close correlation with the diagnosis of sleepwalking. And the other thing is uh, the monomorphous alpha activity that normally precedes the episodes. So the alpha activity is uh, also uh, in, the, in the bifrontal polar region. So we have in the, above our eyebrows, we have the monomorphous uh, alpha oscillation. So these are two key neuromarkers that mostly we're uh, uh, uh, you know, looking at when we're you know, just labeling a case for sleepwalking. An increased cap rate, which, is, which stands for cyclic alternating pattern. It's a long story, but you can just uh, uh, read about cap rate if you would be interested. Also, we have the low level of slow wave activity during the first non-REM episode. And um, also, the, the sleep cycle integrity is not there. The proportional distribution of REM and non-REM, N1, N2, N3, and REM sleep is not there. The delta progression in parasomnias is not always the case. I mean, the delta progression degree is normally less than 10 degrees, right? So this means that the hypnic tone is not the case for those cases, all right? So they have this like confusion and this flip-flop between wakefulness and deep down sleep. And that's why they, they kind of sleep deep down sleep and they behave like they're awake. So that's the, uh, the confusion in the interface of sleep and wakefulness. So we see that we have like the monomorphous alpha activity here. As you see, uh, uh, you know, across the derivations, we have uh, like a well-organized background, but we start to have some uh, alpha synchronous activity. Then we start to develop some kind of, you know, abnormal uh, uh, brain waves. So the epileptiform discharges might be like, uh, like you know, paroxysmal or focal. So the focal epileptiform discharges, most of the cases they herald 
the parasomnia episode. It might be seizure in some cases. So when we, when we see abnormal behaviors according to the video surveillance, and that shows that the person has some, you know, uh, polyspikes or epileptiform discharges, not in one or two derivations, but overall. When we have the secondary propagation of the epileptiform discharges, this is more compatible with the, the sleep epilepsy. So when, it, when, when the epileptiform discharges, they arise from the frontopolar region, then that's the nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy. When it comes from other regions, then we need to discuss uh, with, uh, with patients, with family, with other experts to find out what could be the probable uh, cause for this epileptiform discharges and this abnormal like uh, uh, seizure-like attacks. And then as you see, we also have uh, this uh, paroxysmal discharges, then we'll back to the monomorphous alpha across the derivations, then the person will, will start to just get back to the uh, restful sleep. But the thing is that in many cases when we're having this abnormal sleep-related behaviors, we have some concurrent uh, abnormalities in different biosignals that we're getting recorded in the polysomnography. For instance, the person is a snoring, and the snoring turns out to be pathological snoring because that's high pitch, and that it, it just restricts the airflow. So the airflow limitation will become like that. And the person will, will breathe like this way. And the oxygen saturation is going to desaturate, it's going to decrease at least by 3 to 4 percent. And by that, the person will just arouse. And this micro arousal will turn to in like vaso. So the vaso might be confusional or it might be clear, wakeful state. And then sometimes you see that the emergence of those symptoms, they are just very concurrently happening with the leg movements. And also they are happening with the with the uh, flow limitation here, you see the amplitude of the flow limitation, uh, uh, the amplitude of the breathing pattern is different here. So we, we have this pattern, then start to have this loud snoring, and then the person will start to have also tooth grinding. So bronxism, sleep bronxism is also the case. So non-REM parasomnias, they also have some differential diagnosis in place. Uh, we have REM behavioral disorder, as we allotted to before, nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy, NFLE, sleep-related eating disorder, sleep-related sexual behavior, uh, sleep talking, sleep walking, confusion arousal, and psychogenic disorders and other parasomnias. Uh, we got to limit the triggering factors. Safety is a key here. Many people, I, I got like a handful number of patients who lost their life because they're, you know, they just fall off the, their staircase. They just bumped their head to the glass. They, they did something when they were sleepwalking, and they just you know, collided to sharp objects and something like that. So they had head injury and stuff. Or uh, we, we had a legal case, and someone had abnormal behaviors during the sleep, and he was kind of suffocating and uh, you know, kind of you know, uh, homiciding his bed partner. And the person was taken to the court, and we just discussed with the medical legal uh, experts, and it turns out that we need to get this person tested for polysomnography. So the person was actually experiencing seizure and epileptic seizure. So uh, the person did not have any, any, uh, any, any memory for this. So the, the case was clear. Uh, the treatment of breathing disorder, as I just said, and par uh, periodic leg movement disorder. The treatment, pharmacological treatment is clonazepam for short term and then tapering off the medication. Other less tested medi uh, medications are benzodiazepine, anti-epileptic, antidepressants, and melatonin. So these are the things. We did a report, I mean, we did a study uh, for the sleepwalkers, and those people that some of them, they had some issues with sleep-related epileptic disorders, and some of them were just sleepwalkers, right? And then uh, we had uh, 19 channel quantitative electroencephalography, then with the source localization using the Loreta, S. Loreta application, and it turns out in some areas, including the anterior singlet cortex and PCC, which stands for posterior singlet cortex, there is like a predominance of sigma activity and delta activity. So back of the brain in the midline, we got like high frequency uh, sigma oscillations, and in front of the part of the brain, we have uh, a high amplitude delta oscillation. So this is one of the hallmarks that we can also do the quantitative analysis of the EEG data and just reconfirm the diagnosis. 
So some of them are going to shift after they wake up in the slow wave sleep into lighter stage. Some of them might be having some partial arousals, as I said, like sleep terrors and sleepwalking, confusional arousals, and in some instances, they, they just turn into full wakeful state. So uh, the, the, the other sleep-related predicaments that they give rise to this uh, uh, parasomnias are uh, obstructive sleep apnea hypopnea disorders, OSHS, periodic leg movement disorder, and sleep bruxism. Uh, epileptic discharges, if they are there, we need to definitely go into more deep analysis of the, of the morphology of the EEG signals to make sure if the person has epileptic, epileptic uh, I mean seizures or non-epileptic seizures. Uh, as I said, some of them, they have this uh, like behavioral predominance for uh, their, their symptomolo uh, symptomology. symptomology. And hyperarousability of the subcortical and brainstem networks for the innate uh, abnormal behavior need to be well investigated. And there are some, you know, uh, insufficient activated of the prefrontal cortical areas, and also some other reasons that they are just giving rise to complex motor behaviors and also impaired state of consciousness. This might be epilepsy. This might be because of parasomnias. So we we need to have open eyes to differentiate what exactly is the case, because the treatment is different. So we differentiate the diagnosis, we differentiate the proper treatment. So future research uh, will uh, be uh, focusing on a standardization of the, uh, the video PSG criteria. So we need to also uh, uh, you know, investigate further diagnostic measures for the genetic basis, both for NFLE and the parasomnias, and to make the like uh, uh, diagnosis, uh, whether the person has arousal uh, dysregulation or arousal instability AI, and that would, that would probably better address the future epidemiological and genetic studies in that case. So if we can just play the video if you would be, uh, if that would be possible, it would be great. This is one of our patients in 2021. So the video doesn't have any sound? So this patient started to have some abnormal behaviors in our sleep lab, and he turned out to have uh, sleep epilepsy, frontal lobe epilepsy. And you see this fencing posture. So we have this extension of one arm, and you know, <laughs> yeah. oh, so the person was just, you know, shouting, and the person has got some issues like, like uh, uh, grounding during sleep, and, and and that was this person has has changed his apartment three times before coming to the sleep lab. Because whatever he was, he was residing at which apartment, which flat, other neighbors were just you know, making a complaint against him. Because at 3 AM, it was like shouting. And uh, that was the case. And there is another person who has got this you know, abnormal behaviors and leg movements. Then it turns out that this person also have uh, some, some degrees of uh, REM behavioral disorder. And when he wakes up, he reports that I was cycling. And he's just acting out a dream, right? I was you know, happy because he was cycling. Why these are important? Thank you. We can move on with the next slide. And this is an uh, old gentleman. And he was also sleep talking in a REM behavioral disorder. This person was also found to have some degrees of complex partial seizure, which emerged solely during the non-REM sleep. It's just talking is. So why that is important? If the condition continues to be the case, the person will develop sleep inefficiency, and by time, the person will lack deep down sleep. So by time, the excitotoxicity and over and over again a stimulation of the brain networks causes you know, early onset dementia, causes abnormal behaviors, causes fatigue, diurnal excessive uh, sleepiness. Also, the person might have sleepiness and just have car accident. Many other things may, may just you know, hamper the quality of life of the people, and they may literally lose their life, as I just said, that we have some cases. See, he's just laughing, he's talking. Okay, so can we stop the video and move on, please? Dear technical. Hello. Our dear technical. doesn't work. If we can just stop it, thank you very much. Great. 
Can we just move to the next slide? I got two minutes to wrap up. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah, almost, yeah. Yeah, yeah, five minutes late, yeah. So these are the focal epileptiform discharges from the FLE. Again, we have the focal epileptiform discharges in the frontoparietal regions bilateral, and that it, it goes on and on. And finally, in that case, in the in the in a gentleman, I mean the, the senior gentleman that you see in the last video, this turns into uh, an exponential, you know, paroxysmal discharges, a full epileptiform uh, seizure. And then it's back to normal with focal slowing. This is another case with the same scenario. Then we have monomorphous alpha in parasomnia, and then it started to have a you know, literal seizure. You see, this is like an epileptiform, ep epilepsy. This is like a full-blown epilepsy, epileptic seizure. And that's my time. Thank you very much. Happy to have you here. Okay, I sold it. So, good afternoon to all, and again, uh, thank the organizing committee and uh, from Uskidar University and from SBMT for inviting me for presenting a, a, a paper abstract that we showed that. Uh, November in uh, RSNA 2022, where we met first time after COVID with uh, Professor Baba Kateb. So the mapping is not only what it seems, so uh, sometimes we need uh, to find some lesions that are not really obvious in the MRI or in other uh, examinations. Uh, in case so, of com uh, complex partial seizures or focal epilepsy, the localization of uh, the epileptogenic zone is required for probable surgical planning if drugs have no results. So we are talking about pharmacoanthectic, uh, pharmacoresistant epilepsy. Sometimes, uh, in other uh, papers, they refer to 30%, in other papers to 50%. MRI-defined lesions have a greater percentage of, uh, can be found, uh, so we deal also with patients that we don't really find any lesion in MRI. Uh, in patients uh, which we have found a lesion with MRI, then we can have a greater percentage of post-surgery epileptic-free status than those undergoing surgery with no MRI-demonstrated lesions. The role of structural MRI is fundamental to the identification of lesions responsible for seizure with limitations demanding the further practice of the harness protocol. It's the harmonized neuroimaging uh, protocol which was introduced mainly for stroke patients, but then we have seen that it's very good also for other uh, neuro, uh, neurological conditions as epilepsy. And uh, this MRI protocol includes, uh, I will uh, say that in the next slide, uh, 3D uh, MRI uh, sequences as well as the post-processing methods and volumetry. So this, the purpose of this study was to delineate the importance of this harness protocol and uh, to see if we have some added value from functional imaging especially fMRI, DTI, perfusion MRI, and PET in patients with drug-resistant epilepsy who are candidates for surgery. It is a prospective single-center study in a cohort of 74 patients in the last uh, five years. The advanced MRI protocol I showed also in tumors. We used the 3 dt one weighted magnetization prepared rapid acquisition with the gradient echo volumetric sequence before and after intravenous administration of 50 ml of gadolinium, which better is the GADOV, is the GADOVTROL, which has a double concentration inside every ml. 3DT weighted, uh, which is uh, our uh, alternative to T2 weighted, which is uh, proposed by Harness Protocol. 
3D flare, 3D double inversion recovery, all with a voxel size of uh, 0 0.5 and uh, the third. Echoplana, blood oxygenation uh, level dependent uh, uh, sequences were used for task based fMRI as well as for resting state fMRI, and diffusion tensor imaging sequences with uh, at least 32 directions were acquired uh, for clinical reasons in order to define lateralization of language and memory and, if possible, to visualize the epileptogenic zones. Uh, <clears throat> I will skip this uh, because we don't have so much time. I just want to uh, comment that uh, in patients with temporal epilepsy and one-sided hypomedalloboglic focus in PET-CT, they showed uh, optimal post-operative results, uh, that means an annual class one and two in a five-year follow-up uh, in 96%. So this is what we are searching for. This is a typical sign of a focal cortical dysplasia, uh, dysplasia, sometimes not really seen, but if you see this uh, very tiny, very small uh, line, which is going from uh, sub, uh, sub ependymal of the uh, ventricle to the uh, cortex. This is a sign, you see the arrow here. This is a sign that there is somewhere here in this region where this uh, line ends. Uh, you should search for a focal for a very small focal cortical dysplasia. And this we could find in this uh, patient, in the 35-year-old female patient, which exceeds in the superior frontal uh, gyrus. And encephalokil is also a uh, very trend the last two, three years. What is encephalokil? You see here the projection of some part of the temporal lobe inside because of a bone defect uh, and this is causing an epileptic uh, uh, focal, co complex uh, focal uh, epileptic reasons. And we can uh, quantify that and see that we have uh, uh, gliosis in here and the volume of the pathological region is less than the volume of the normal. The language lateralization, as I referred before, uh, it depends on where the inferior frontal uh, gyrus parsa pecularis, that means Broca's area, is dominant. And uh, normally, we can see uh, in the uh, contralateral side, as in this paradigm, this is the uh, inferior frontal uh, gyrus and uh, pars pecularis, uh, pars trigonalis, and uh, pars frontalis. And this is the planum temporale, the region of Wernicke. And here we can see again the patient I showed before with a, a hippocampus on the left, uh, on, on, on the right side, uh, uh, ganglioglioma of the right hippocampus. And we can see that we have a, a, a thicker uh, superior longitudinal fasciculus, and uh, especially the posterior part, which is the arcuate fasciculus, thicker than the right one. Again, with uh, resting state of MRI, how, how we can uh, uh, see the difference between Z values of the left and right hippocampus. Uh, professor uh, from Egypt uh, of Neurosurgery asked me, what is Z value? That is a statistical parametrical mapping of these uh, colors that you see. It's based on mathematical approaches and on statistical uh, parametrical mapping. mapping. So uh, we have a resting state of MRI, the Z value, because we are uh, searching for uh, networks. Instead, in uh, task-based fMRI, we have the p-value, the statistic value we all know from the research, and it should be more than 0.055%. And here we can see in this patient how uh, we can see that uh, in this software we get such a picture of uh, such a, a table of uh, uh, which, or which network and the, the hypocampal uh, and language network is the dominant, and it's on the left. That's very helpful for the uh, neurologist and the neurosurgeon who will uh, go for uh, excising the focal cortical dysplasia. Okay. Uh, I wanted to show this because it's a very rare case, it's, uh, and uh, introduced about two or three years, the MOGES. It's some uh, oligodendroglial hyperplasia and epilepsy, and uh, we could uh, find such one case. But you can say that only by histology uh, from Professor uh, Blumke in Erlangen. 
uh, again, focal cortical deep dysplasia here with uh, resting state fMRI on the uh, left side. Uh, on the middle, you can see the task-based fMRI, TTI, and here is the fused PET uh, CT with MRI and uh, uh, correspondent as uh, standard uptake values, uh, which, show, which are showing hypometabolism of the right temporal pole. And uh, this was confirmed by surgical procedure by surgical excision that it was a focal cortical dysplasia type 2B. And uh, uh, in this case, we've lost in the first uh, view the, the focal cortical dysplasia. Reviewing this after PET-CT fusion with MRI, then we can see different uh, features, in, uh, uh, especially in the, sorry, and especially in the tractography, uh, you can see the different, come on. The different shape uh, of the uncinate fasciculus and the inferior uh, uh, fasciculus and uh, compared right to left. And in the second review, uh, we can define where the uh, focal cortical dysplasia really is and have also this table showing uh, the difference between the pathological and the normal uh, side. So this is another case uh, with uh, focal cortical dysplasia in the broca area which couldn't uh, totally excise, so partially excised, and he had, the tun uh, had uh, uh, epilepsy for the last uh, 10 years. Uh, here is a, another case, a female patient, uh, again with PET-CT and MRI on the right. And some nice reconstructions with all these advanced imaging techniques showing the uh, dominance of the left hemisphere. And also, in second, in the review, we can see that we have also not only hypermetabolism of this area on the left, uh, on the right, frontal uh, cortex, but also uh, prefrontal cortex, but also in the perfusion imaging. So, yeah, uh, Professor uh, since yes, we started a I session will, like 15 minutes late, unfortunately, that would uh, be good I if conclude, you wrap up in one minute. I conclude the advanced and quantitative imaging techniques revealed lesions responsible for epileptic seizures in 53 out of 74 patients. After surgery, 16 out of 70 patients were free of disabling seizures, angle class one, with one year follow-up, while 36 out of 53 patients here have not yet undergone surgery. So in conclusion, a harness MRI protocol combined with advanced uh, MRI studies, functional MRI, DTI, perfusion, as well as with PET, can provide even higher capability for localization and delineation delineation of epilepsogenic lesions, sorry. Thus, the planning for surgery candidates by simultaneous defining the localization of language and memory in patients with refractory epilepsy as candidates for surgical treatment is of utmost importance. These are our references. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. So any question? Any question? I think I was under time. I was under time. <laughs> I was about like six minutes over time, yeah? Because we started like quarter to two. Because we started quarter to two, yeah. I was like 21 minutes, I know. Yeah. MR and geography. So MR and geography uh, is performed uh, in cases that we have the suspicion that we have an uh, arteriovenous malformation or uh, some vascular malformation. When we are seeking for non, uh, we have normal MRIs before we do this protocol, uh -huh. which are negative. Maybe I didn't say that before because I was in a hurry. So uh, we try to uh, recognize and uh, identify lesions in uh, MRI in which the MRIs without using the harness protocol missed the lesion. And I showed you also uh, default of us that uh, uh, in this case, in the first case I showed, uh, with all the, the functional and PET and so on, that if you look at the 
even even with 3D and whatever, you have so many data and so many images that you can lose a very small, a tiny, so a 7.6 millimeter focal cortical dysplasia. And then you can go back and review after the PET shows the hypermetabolism. So this is, you know, forward and backwards. And this is the, uh, I mean, the advantage of, of, of applying all these methods is that even with this protocol, when you lose a lesion, then you go back and see it. And MR angiography and MR venography, normally, we know that we have to do with a malformation or with an aneurysm or whatever. Then we perform MR angiography uh, as well. I thank you for the question. Thank you. You got a question? So, uh, do you think that we can just leave the questions to the end of the session because we still have two communications left? So, uh, we're looking forward to uh, the talk Thank by you very Dr. Much for Sharokh Yousafzadeh. <laughs> uh, thank you for understanding, yeah? So, we'll just keep on. It is my great pleasure and a great opportunity to participate in this event. And also, I want to thank Dr. Kateb and his colleague and Oskodar University for holding this meeting. Uh, I want to talk about the two most important uh, topics in brain disease, seizure and brain infection. Brain infection uh, may come from spontaneously from other part of the body or uh, by surgical intervention or traumatic brain injury. It may present by diffuse uh, inflammation like meningitis, encephalitis, ventriculitis, and space occupying lesion may be uh, like abscess or uh, empyema. A brain infection may uh, cause a structural uh, damage, I mean, a destroy of uh, cells and at the same time may affect the functional state of uh, brain and both of them may cause seizure. The immune re response, uh, host immune response and invadic pathogen uh, or uh, toxin, uh, microbial uh, toxin uh, may have a bottle feed. Fightening of them may cause destroy of uh, cell. Matrix metalloproteinase is a material that may uh, cause the destroy the cell and dysregulation of glutamate metabolism may affect the function. Uh, pathogen, uh, when passing the, uh, across the blood brain uh, barrier, may reach the parenchymal uh, of uh, brain, it may spread from hematogenous oil or uh, retrograde along neural uh, structure. Uh, brain infection may present with uh, superficial infection like uh, infection of uh, skin or subcutaneous or deep uh, infection uh, in subgala or bone infection. Both, but uh, only deep organ space may cause uh, seizure. The risk factor for seizures in brain infection are uh, advanced age, obesity, diabetes mellitus, uh, poor functional state uh, like um, the consumption of uh, corticosteroid or uh, immunosuppressive. Uh, there are concurrent infection in other parts of the uh, body, family history of epilepsy and genetic factor. But the special uh, risk factor, uh, as I mentioned uh, before, uh, patient functional state and foreign body implementation like a VP shunt or uh, using of uh, titanium mesh uh, may uh, susceptible uh, patient to uh, infect to seizure. Duration of surgery more than uh, four hours uh, is a concomitant, concomitant with uh, seizure and CSF leakage is very uh, important usually uh, pathogen uh, reach to brain from uh, that way CSF leakage. 
Uh, the immunity of uh, brain uh, is uh, like the other part of uh, the body, cell immunity and hormonal immunity, and at the same time, it has uh, some natural uh, mechanism like blood-brain barrier. Three out of brain infection are fever, headache, mass lesion. A mass lesion may cause altered uh, level of consciousness, increase ICV monitoring. It uh, presents with uh, headache and uh, vomiting, and seizure, uh, has seen in uh, more than 20% uh, of patients. For diagnosis uh, of this uh, patient, we can use hematologic tests like CRP and ESR. At least CRP and ESR is uh, useful for uh, for useful for antibiotic uh, the control of antibiotic uh, therapy. And uh, CSF sampling uh, sometimes may help us, but imaging is gold standard. Uh, the types of uh, pathogen may be viral, bacterial, parasitic, or uh, fungal. Uh, deep brain infection may present with meningitis, encephalitis, subdural lymphoma, brain abscess, and ventriculitis. This is a herpes uh, simplex. Herpes simplex uh, may reach to uh, brain uh, by uh, trigeminal nerve. Uh, you can see uh, the uh, you can see this uh, ICH hemorrhagic of uh, temporal lobe, uh, and uh, we can we have to do surgery uh, for the compression. HIV uh, virus uh, is another important virus uh, that uh, may uh, directly invade the. Uh, brain or by uh, oncogenic uh, then like uh, primary CNS uh, lymphoma may cause uh, seizure. Uh, coronavirus is another virus uh, that may be directly reached to uh, brain uh, from the olfactory bulb and it may invade the hippocampus and cause seizure. Even uh, vaccination, uh, some patient referred us uh, after vaccination with intractable seizure. A spontaneous bacterial infection may be uh, recent, reached to brain by hematogenous or adjacent organ bacteria. You can see an empima here, and uh, after contrast, uh, you can see the wall of empima, uh, empima and uh, check entrapment and uh, the past entrapment in the, uh, this patient. Uh, presentation of uh, subdural empima may, uh, by, may present by fever, headache, uh, focal neurological de deficit, altered mental state, and uh, seizure. Uh, presentation of uh, empima may due to structural damage, vein thrombophilitis, localized encephalitis, and adjacent uh, edema. This video. I asked the technical. Uh, this video is uh, related a, a patient with uh, a third years old. He suffered from uh, frontal sinus, uh, sinusitis for uh, two years. And you can see the pus entrapment in the uh, subdural. We have to uh, extract the pass, and you can see the pass in the brain. Please, next slide. If this is uh, related to a uh, uh, 13 years, uh, 13 years old uh, girl. Uh, he referred us by uh, uh, arachnoid cyst, and we do surgery uh, by uh, cystoperitoneal uh, shunt. Uh, one month uh, after uh, surgery, he referred uh, again us uh, by fever and uh, seizure. You can see uh, the pus. Uh, in the uh, site of uh, surgery. Uh, 
the most, uh, the anaerobic agent is most uh, important pathogen in this patient. Uh, the pathophysiology of uh, uh, brain abscess is uh, early cerebritis. Uh, we can see in less than three to uh, five days after uh, infection, late cerebritis, after one week, early capsule formation, after two weeks, and late capsule uh, formation. In this uh, video, you can see the patient with uh, pus in the brain. Uh, it is related to a, uh, a 10 years old baby. You can see check inside the uh, parenchymal part. We have to uh, sample from, extract the sample from the abscess. Uh, abscess uh, less than uh, two centimeters, we can use antibiotic. But uh, abscess more than two centimeters, we have to do uh, surgery. You can see the wall of uh, abscess, very thick. And inside the uh, abscess, you can see. Tuberculoma uh, imitate the glioblastom uh, multiform. Uh, we can uh, treat by antimicrobial antituberculosis drug, but it may uh, imitate a GBM. You can see the tuberculoma. Toxoplasmos and uh, is a, a parasitic infection. It may be seen in the uh, after HIV infection, or uh, it may imitate metastasis. This is like metastasis. The treatment of this patient is antibiotic, not surgery. and a traditional parasitic infection in uh, Middle East is hidatic cyst. This is uh, a, a hidatic cyst in a patient for, uh, four years old. You, uh, this is uh, the special <coughs> feature in uh, imaging. We have to be careful uh, because the rupture of uh, this is during uh, surgery may spread the cystic sarcosis and daughter cysts in the poor patient. We have to uh, do this surgery with a traditional way. This is related to uh, four years old. You can see uh, a sedative cyst in a patient we use uh, fully catheter and push water behind the cyst for laboring the cyst. We cannot remove. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. So, uh, for the last speaker of the panel, uh, would like to welcome uh, Dr. Mustafai, and she would be highlighting on uh, epidemiological aspects of epilepsy in Iran. So, thank you for being here. Yeah, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Dr. Hamdi Mustafai. Uh, I have uh, been working for uh, Iranian uh, Epilepsy Association for 14 years, uh, from 14 years. Uh, and I'm, uh, I would like to speak about uh, epilepsy in Iran. Uh, as you know, epilepsy is the most common um, treatable neurologic disease. Uh, that uh, about 50 million people um, suffer from it uh, around the world. Uh, 
Nearly 18% uh, of people with epilepsy live in low and middle income countries. Uh, uh, if properly diagnosed up to 70% uh, uh, could live seizure free. Uh, in Iran, uh, we don't have uh, ample data. Um, epidemiologic studies intense because of uh, mm, um, many reasons, uh, such as mm, diversity of uh, clinical manifestation and etiology of disease, uh, and also um, uh, disease stigma that uh, makes people to conceal their disease and it makes uh, uh, epidemiologic study very uh, complex. Fortunately, there is a, an ongoing uh, project for uh, epilepsy screening uh, in Ministry of Health in Iran, and we are uh, enthusiastically uh, waiting for the results. Uh, previous studies um, showed uh, prevalence of epilepsy in Iran estimation at about 5%. Uh, epilepsy have, uh, impacts on um, patients, their relatives, and uh, society, and um, um, it's important to uh, uh, know about it. Uh, as general consequences of epilepsy, uh, we can point to shortened lifespan of patients because of the um, recurrent hospitalization and uh, more mortality rates uh, in related uh, in uh, more than um, general population. Uh, you know, as you know, uh, in people with m m medically refractory seizures, uh, mortality rate is uh, four to seven times uh, more than uh, general population. Um, they are in uh, risk of more. Um, bodily injury because of um, recurrent fall, fall, falls and uh, accidents. Um, uh, from uh, nor nor neuropsychological and uh, psychiatric impairment uh, affect the patient's um, mental health. Uh, they are uh, more um, uh, an anxiety, depression, and cognitive impairment is, are uh, uh, more common in the uh, epileptic patients. Uh, they are in risk, uh, more uh, risk of um, in risk of injury, brain injury because of the um, seizures, uncontrolled seizures, uh, status epilepticus, uh, uh, SUDEP uh, is uh, more uh, is uh, frequent in uh, uncontrolled patients. And also it is important uh, stigmatization and social exclusion that um, affect on uh, their uh, quality of life uh, and um, individual uh, confidence and self-esteem. Uh, medical or psychiatric com comorbidities, uh, uh, especially in people that their seizure is not um, controlled. Uh, negative uh, impacts on subjective health status and quality of life. Uh, there are many um, uh, situations that is com uh, comorbid epilepsy, like uh, CP, mental retardation, and um, other um, um, congenital uh, disease. Um, uh, changing quality of life. Uh, uh, um, because of effect of anti-epileptic drug treatments uh, can change the, uh, their, their daily lives and uh, sleep patterns and uh, daily activities. Uh, they have uh, social disability uh, problems in, uh, and challenges in mar marriage, uh, reduce employment levels. Uh, in another uh, aspect, the family and caregivers have burden uh, um, from um, different aspects, we can see that uh, their uh, quality of life uh, um, change different for 
children, adolescents, adults, and seniors. Uh, the uh, disease have impact on uh, learning and in children that they are in uh, age of learning, the important age of uh, learning, uh, it uh, may t uh, change their uh, learning skills and uh, learning op opportunity. Uh, impact on mood and memory uh, can affect on uh, sleep, appetite, sexual desires. Uh, school attendance, employment, relationships, and uh, social interactions, all of them uh, uh, can change in uh, patients and have the uh, challenges with, with them. Family and caregiver uh, burden is uh, another uh, issue that um, must be considered. Uh, emotional difficulties, uh, feeling stressed or overwhelmed. Uh, sometimes family, family members have more um, protective uh, um, behavior for patients or sometimes they, uh, they ignore or denial of the uh, patient. Uh, they maybe uh, doesn't find other people to, uh, to be uh, feel related with, with them and uh, share the same experiences and it can be helpful for them. Uh, and uh, I can say just attending a, in a support group or uh, social uh, events that can, can uh, make a relationship between um, uh, family members and uh, relative of patients that um, share with each other uh, the burden. Uh, um, so we can say that uh, epilepsy is not uh, uh, only a medical uh, disease. Is a, a, it is a, a also a um, uh, community and social um, issue. And uh, NGOs and uh, social organizations uh, can um, play an um, important role in supporting patients and control the uh, disease and, um, um, and improving quality of life of patients. Iranian Epilepsy Association uh, have been established uh, from 25 uh, years ago and um, its activities in uh, focus on uh, documentation of patients, identifying uh, new cases, uh, registration of new members, and uh, the service provision uh, uh, such as uh, consultation, um, uh, epilepsy management, rehabilitation, uh, and dental service for uh, epileptic uh, patients that uh, they, are, uh, they have difficulty with um, general uh, dental um, um, services that uh, maybe uh, doesn't accept them. Uh, financial and social support for members and their family, improving their quality of life, rehabilitation. Uh, uh, IEA have an um, educational program for uh, health care provider in health organization, education for members and uh, their families, uh, raising awareness in uh, the community with um, uh, different programs in med media, in um, um, different uh, programs that uh, have more imp uh, information for um, community, improving stigma that is very important for patients that um, um, more, more than the um, it, it disease itself, the patient is suffering from this stigma, a stigma in the society. Education for more medical and health related discipline for making uh, more um, better decisions and research. Uh, IEA have a collaboration with national and international organizations uh, such as IBE and ILAE uh, and um, um, in some uh, researches. Uh, last year we have uh, my colleague and I uh, in collaboration with Queen's University of Canada have uh, a study on uh, needs assessment uh, 
in uh, for uh, um, studying on uh, what is the uh, exactly needs of the patient and their uh, family members. Uh, study objective was uh, what are the needs of people with epilepsy and their caregivers from the perspective of people with epilepsy, family members, caregivers, uh, policy makers, practitioners, and people in community. Uh, we um, ha uh, have a quantitative st study, semi-structured interview with uh, participants as, uh, from um, the five groups and uh, have a ten, uh, yes, thank you. thematic uh, analysis of them. Uh, the result was uh, from uh, people with epilepsy perspective, they need to information, social acceptance, uh, marriage, belonging uh, issues, employment, financial problem, most of them have financial problems, family education and governmental support and uh, rehabilitation um, um, center that can help them. Uh, from a family member and caregiver's perspective, uh, access to a specialist and health services that um, uh, help them is more uh, in most important uh, need. Access to inform information, acceptance by the community, and support of the employer uh, was the uh, needs that they uh, said. Epilepsy management uh, from policy, policy makers' per perspective believes that uh, epilepsy management uh, must uh, improve and diag better diagnose, better um, uh, decision making, and better um, drug uh, or uh, medication, um, medication uh, choose for uh, patients uh, and uh, uh, decrease of um, polytropy uh, and going to uh, uh, monotropy in patients. Uh, meeting primary needs of the person uh, with uh, epilepsy, employment, education, social integration, improving social acceptance, improving stigma, uh, and uh, comprehensive management of the condition, including case management, family support, and preventing consequences, establishing international collaboration, providing opportunity for support group, support other services such as dental hygiene, art therapy, sub, uh, sport, and legal support, and managing comorbidities such as psychiatric disorder, that is comorbid with epilepsy, support uh, collaborative care, uh, and uh, finally, practitioner's perspective, um, uh, they, uh, from their perspective, uh, collaborative care, rehabilitation, personal and family education, overcoming false beliefs, and supporting physical activity was the uh, important needs. And people in community uh, that, thank you, uh, raising um, community awareness and education and uh, epilepsy first aid. Uh, the, some people said that uh, they are uh, scaring from uh, people who is, um, uh, have seizure because of they don't know what they can do for him or her. And the use of social media to support epilepsy education. Uh, Iranian Epilepsy Association uh, interested to, in um, uh, have international collaboration with, uh, in uh, epidemiologic studies in Middle East countries and uh, because of uh, we have a, a same cultural um, uh, background in, and uh, we have same um, maybe same problems that we can uh, with collab in collaboration with each other uh, um, have a find um, a solution and um, um, help each other. Cross-sectional and longitudinal studies on epilepsy management can be uh, in collaboration with other countries in this um, region. Uh, thank you for your
Thank you very much. That was very insightful. Uh, so the communication is open for uh, one or two questions or comments. If the idea can can wait, if yeah. Okay, thank you very much for the uh, excellent presentation. My name is uh, Harry Subianto from Indonesia. I am epilepsy surgeon actually. Oh wow. Uh, I have three questions. Uh, one for uh, Dr. Nami. As I saw in the EEG recording, it was di rhythmic delta activity. Rhythmic delta activity and then uh, there is also K complex. Usually in rhythmic delta activity, there is something in the brain. Usually there is something in the brain. Uh, do you perform any brain imaging for your patient, at least three patients that you have? So, because I, I just wondering to know, uh, is typical for yeah. uh, frontal lobe epilepsy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Thank you very much for yeah. pointing that out. So sometimes when we uh, go for the sleep EEG, then we cross-validate the data with the quantitative EEG, but we normally do not rely on one modality. When we're in doubt, we definitely go for FNIRS or functional MRI. And when, uh, when the case shows that we have focal hyperactivity within distinct you know, uh, uh, uh, state of uh, function, then we, we cross-correlate that with the clinical symptoms and then we come into conclusion. Normally, about this complex cases, I decide together with clinical neurologists. And then we sit together even with psychologists and psychiatrists. So it's a, like a panel of experts around the table, decide about the single patient and then pursuing forward. Yeah, your, your point is valid. Oh yeah, thank you. And then the other po for uh, Dr. Uh, Faisalas, Kaisalas, yeah, Faisalas, sorry. Uh, uh, what is your uh, uh, uh, what is your uh, opinion about ASL and PET scan? Uh, because uh, sometimes PET brain scan is difficult because we, we have to have uh, nuclear imaging and all. But arterial spin labeling, it's quite uh, easy to do. You once you have three Tesla MRI, you can perform and based on my experience, we have performed uh, around 100 and more. Uh, I, I see a uh, similarity between uh, arterial spin labeling result and the pet brain. Uh, what do you think about that? If I understood well, uh, you said that uh, we should perform ASL instead of f or something else. Uh, we usually uh, make protocol for arterial spin labeling, uh, yeah. pre-surgical examination before surgery. And we find that uh, arterial spin labeling are also showing some hypovascularity that is matched with uh, PET brain scanning. In PET brain scanning, it's also showing hypometabolism. Uh, do you also find the same result or? Uh, we, we don't have arterial spin labeling in this uh, machine. So we don't, that's why. We don't have the, the opportunity to perform it, first of all. And second, as far as I know from uh, the literature and from the papers, it is not a real correlation of uh, arterial spin labeling with hypermetabolism. And also, in the PET, in the PET studies, uh, it depends on in, in which, in which phase of epilepsy you are performing the PET, uh, the PET study. Yeah. If you're doing between the uh, seizures, then uh, as far as I know, you don't need any other uh, stuff to control if this hypermetabolism is uh, right or wrong. In arterial spin labeling, as far as I know from, uh, from studies, they don't have checked in which stage ASL is sensitive and specific for defining uh, such region as hypometabolic. And also, uh, from my at least uh, readings and uh, experience in, uh, with, with ASL in tumors, uh, the the disadvantage of arterial spin labeling is that you see only uh, regional cerebral blood flow. Yeah. And uh, this can be misleading sometimes. So you can see uh, lower uh, regional cerebral blood flow, and this because of an angiospasm, an angiospasm or whatever. So I'm not sure how sensitive and specific is arterial spin labeling. It, it, it needs to be. Uh, research and in, this, yeah. in the research and comparison with PET MRI and PET CT. So the optimal solution for me is if we had a machine in Greece, uh, a PET MRI all together in one session, uh, but and also to have a seven Tesla and then uh, 
co-register PET MRI with 7 Tesla and find even uh, depict uh, more accurately the uh, small focal, co focal cortical dysplasias. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, the basic uh, for ASL is for vascularity, uh, brain vascular, yeah, not, not metabolic, because metabolic usually we, we are doing uh, brain scanning, PET scan, PET scan, not ASL. In the case of epilepsy, usually if it is non-tumor epilepsy, there will be no uh, mass uh, expansion that affect the vascular. That's why we perform uh, arterial spin labeling and we also knowing that there is some uh, hypovascularity uh, in some part of the brain. And then we confirm this with the PET brain uh, scanning. It's also showing hypometabolism based on uh, PET brain. But uh, it's but different physical principles. It's different, yes, yes, I know it's different, different physical uh, principles. But for it's different principle, I know, yeah. but for uh, a country where PET scanning is quite expensive, it's quite difficult for us to, yeah. to get, to get uh, PET brain scanning sometimes. And I have an objection yeah. that uh, really arterial spin labeling doesn't describe vascularity. It describes a flow. Blood flow, yeah. It's not vascularity. So you, you can have low flow uh, related to other reasons uh, instead of a focal cortical dysplasia or any other epileptogenic lesion. So even in, uh, old, in elderly patients, you can see uh, decreased uh, regional cerebral blood flow because of atherosclerosis or whatever. So it's uh, debatable. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. So we're going to conclude the session now, and thank you for your attendance, your attention, and an interaction. So uh, we would just ask the panel and uh, the conference organizers to also count the important issue of epilepsy in the policy-making discussions tomorrow in a roundtable discussion so we get to have a roadmap how to materialize these important ideas into practice for the good of the people and patients. Thank you very much. Yeah, I got the privilege to invite Professor Neruzian for the next session, which is going to be on neurodegenerative disorders. So we're, we're going to skip the break. So we'll cancel the break, and then uh, we gently ask Dr. Prof Professor Neruzian to lead the next panel. Thank you. Good afternoon. I hope you have enjoyed the sessions. Now I invite um, uh, Dr. Mohammadian, uh, my colleague, uh, to present uh, her presentation on pand uh, the impact of COVID pandemic on the neurodegenerative disorders epidemiology in developing countries. Dr. Mohammadian is uh, assistant professor of neurology at Tehran University of Medical Sciences with very good reputation of scientific work. Thank you. Uh, hi, good time. Uh, everyone, I'm so glad to participate uh, in this summit, uh, and uh, I appreciate uh, Professor Carter, Professor 
Tahan uh, and my dear Professor Mariam Norzian uh, for uh, this opportunity. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about the COVID-19 pandemic uh, impact of the care of dementia patients, uh, especially in low and middle income countries and uh, my country, uh, Iran, our experiences in Iran. Um, uh, my talk, uh, first of all, I uh, briefly uh, introduce myself. Uh, I'm Dr. Pater Mohammadian, Assistant Professor of Neurology at Tehran University uh, of Medical Science, and uh, I'm co-working with Professor Nourzian at the fields of uh, dementia and neuropsychiatry. Uh, my talk will be in three parts. First, uh, dementia care in low and middle income countries before the pandemic crisis. Second, COVID-19 pandemic uh, effect on uh, dementia patients uh, and uh, the highlighted pieces in low and middle income countries, uh, dementia care in Iran in the pandemic uh, crisis. As you are uh, all aware, the worldwide, the worldwide growth uh, of the geriatric population should be considered as a challenge uh, in all country, uh, countries, especially low and middle uh, income countries. In these countries, one uh, in five people are going to above uh, 60 years of age and uh, Consequently, the incidence of geriatric-related and dementia syndromes uh, increased. Uh, nowadays, 44 million people worldwide living with dementia, and uh, we um, evaluate, uh, we estimated, uh, we estimate that reach uh, 75 million worldwide by uh, 2030. Uh, in this uh, picture, uh, we can focus on uh, dementia prevalence in uh, in uh, North Africa and Middle East, and uh, it was estimated that it estimated that um, about uh, two times greater than the um, uh, Europe countries. Uh, but unfor uh, unfortunately, due to lack of infrastructure and uh, sufficient epidemiological uh, study in the low and middle income countries, uh, and uh, the, um, these limitations could result in uh, underestimation of dementia syndromes. Uh, one of the um, limited studies uh, estimated that overall prevalence of dementia um, about age, and, uh, um, especially age standardized dementia prevalence, uh, about uh, 8%. Um, Consequently, dementia is under-recognized, under-treated, and under-managed in uh, low- and middle-income countries and due to differences in uh, the prevalence, information variances, and diversities in interview schedules, and also uh, variation in diagnostic criteria. Um, the, um, um, diagnosis uh, of uh, dementia uh, syndromes um, under, uh, was underdetermined. Uh, in um, low and middle income countries, uh, usually uh, we have lack of population uh, norms and also lack of resources to conduct detailed neuropsychological uh, tests. And uh, on the other hand, uh, we uh, have limited number uh, the cognitive neurologists and uh, neuropsychiatrists, uh, which uh, are inappropriate to a high number of different uh, type of uh, dementia. Mm, usually, in, uh, uh, in our country, symptoms of dementia uh, 
um, consider as a part of normal aging and uh, due to lack of awareness and uh, a stigma and also high tolerance to disability in the elderly and dementia patients uh, we um, diagnose dementia in the late stages, usually at the stage of uh, five and six, uh, staging fast, staging uh, five and uh, six. And uh, on the other hand, uh, we have the failure on the diagnostic system. Uh, and uh, I mentioned the limited number of um, cognitive neurologists. We uh, have the limited number, uh, number of uh, health personnel uh, at uh, multiple level. And uh, this failure of community program uh, across low and middle income countries uh, uh, ultimately uh, results in uh, underestimation and uh, under diagnosis the dementia uh, syndromes. Uh, technology in general was, con uh, was considered uh, a helpline, uh, but uh, when uh, we want to uh, utilize technology in elderly and dementia patients, we should uh, consider the limitation. Um, the elderly and dementia patients usually uh, struggle with technology due to uh, digital illiteracy and also due to physical uh, impairments. Uh, in this situation, uh, caregivers are often required to set up remote uh, meetings and uh, this limitation uh, was uh, um, more emphasized in low and middle income countries according to the uh, technology limitation, including limited a speed of internet and uh, also restri uh, restricted usability of correlated devices. Let's turn on uh, care uh, root heterogeneity. Um, it's a more emphasized in social support and uh, also social services in comparison uh, in developed country in comparison to uh, family member and care at home in the developing country um, due to the uh, mentioned reason uh, at the last slide. Uh, and uh, second part of uh, my uh, lecture is about COVID-19 pandemic effect uh, on the elderly and dementia uh, patients. Uh, nowadays, uh, COVID-19 pandemic has changed, uh, changed uh, all uh, uh, of uh, all life, uh, all our lives, uh, and. Uh, um, Elderly, due to uh, their vulnerability to infection, um, their life changed dramatically. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think uh, we could uh, categorize uh, the elderly uh, complications uh, due to COVID-19 pandemic uh, in uh, three sections, neurological complication of COVID-19, um, psychological issue, and also limited uh, access and uh, under diagnosis in pandemic uh, crisis. Um, we know high expression of ACE2 uh, in the um, lateral ventricular choroid plexus, this uh, could increase the possibility of uh, neuroinvasion of COVID-19 and uh, may silently, uh, silent uh, initiate uh, or uh, accelerate neurodegeneration. Uh, and also we know uh, COVID-19 pandemic <clears throat> affected the elderly with uh, high probability uh, due to increased, uh, increased physiological risk of infection, increased fatality, uh, and um, usually um, the elderly have medical comorbidity, uh, take uh, a lot of uh, medications, and uh, they have uh, paroxysmic pulmonary complications, which complicated their uh, infection, COVID-19 infection. We know the cognitive impairment of uh, complication of COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, usually elderly uh, experience uh, the uh, more cognitive um, impairment and uh, COVID-19 could uh, have the um, cognitive uh, impairment, uh, especially in uh, executive function in the uh, elderly. The vulnerability of patients uh, with uh, dementia to COVID-19 infection 
uh, was uh, demonstrated uh, in uh, a lot of uh, numerous studies. Uh, one of these studies, uh, among you, in one of these studies among UK Bubans, uh, participant who received at least one uh, positive test for COVID-19 pandemic and pre-exciting uh, pre diagnostic of neurodegenerative uh, disorders, including uh, dementia, uh, have a subsequent increased risk of um, COVID-19 and also risk of death and uh, death and neuropsychological uh, problems such as delirium. And now uh, turn to psychological uh, issue when the uh, elderly come, uh, being uh, at home uh, due to COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the um, levels of uh, stress and anxiety um, increasing them. Uh, the dementia patients due to COVID-19 pandemic uh, lose uh, many of their uh, routines in this uh, situation. Cognitive stimuli uh, are reducing uh, them and a lot of uh, sleep problems and uh, behavioral uh, change, uh, changes due to this uh, impact ultimately can lead to uh, their transfer uh, to a nursing uh, home. And uh, ultimately, uh, el uh, elderly um, have more challenges to travel to health uh, facility in our country, uh, and um, this um, could lead uh, to unconscious uh, interruption in the detection of uh, cognitive uh, decline, especially in the early stages of uh, dementia and mild cognitive impairment uh, phase uh, as a solution. Uh, online method uh, of screening cognitive decline in the elderly uh, could reduce the negative burden of the pandemic crisis on the patients uh, with dementia, but we should consider this method um, could not uh, replace the face-to-face uh, -face support and uh, could uh, lead to underestimations of the patient's uh, symptoms. Uh, and the third part of my uh, lecture, the highlighted piece in the low and middle income country and my country, uh, Iran, uh, I mentioned the uh, now variation in the dementia care before the pandemic and um, due to uh, COVID-19 pandemic crisis, uh, each country had different form and type of restriction uh, and um, consequently people living with dementia and uh, also caregivers face uh, different circumstances. Uh, we should consider that Middle East uh, is significant, uh, is uh, similarly affected by epidemiological, cultural, and uh, also socio-economic uh, issue uh, after the, uh, during and after the pandemic uh, crisis. Doctor, you have two minutes time. Okay. Um, in the investigation, uh, we uh, down uh, in uh, our memory clinic in I Iran, patients with dementia and also their caregivers uh, mentioned uh, these limitations. In the COVID-19 pandemic uh, crisis, uh, caregiver usually uh, about 90% of the caregivers uh, reported decline of cognitive and uh, physical health uh, and uh, also uh, they uh, reported uh, increased risk, uh, they reported um, deterioration of cognition in dementia patients, um, especially uh, in early stages of dementia and uh, MCI, uh, and we encountered differences between COVID-19 symptoms in dementia patients. Uh, usually the uh, dementia patients uh, have the clinically silent infection uh, with uh, more uh, symptoms of delirious state. Uh, and um, the caregivers reported a higher level uh, of behavioral symptoms in the dementia patients. Uh, about two-thirds uh, of uh, caregivers uh, reported uh, these uh, symptoms uh, and uh, agitation and insomnia uh, is the more emphasized uh, symptoms in uh, our patients. Um, 
I want to mention the limited access in uh, our society and uh, our country. Uh, due to COVID-19 pandemic uh, in our country, um, we uh, should uh, close the North Psychiatric Ward, uh, only feasible uh, North Psychiatric Ward in um, our hospital. And also at the beginning of the uh, pandemic crisis, uh, the memory clinic in Iran um, uh, was uh, closed. And this uh, could result in sudden withdrawal the dementia uh, care. But um, the limited number of our patients could uh, communicate uh, with their phys uh, physicians via teleconsultation and uh, Yadman uh, helpline. Uh, in this limited situ situation, the visit uh, could be considered uh, uh, an, uh, as an opportunity. However, the in, uh, internet penetration in the dementia patients and elderly in our country is underestimated. Uh, we know internet penetration in Iran is stood at 70%, but uh, we don't know uh, how vast the uh, elderly and uh, dementia patients and uh, we should consider telehealth uh, as an efficient method, but uh, before that global uh, globalization, we should consider optimized uh, standardization and utilization and also engage patients, caregivers, and healthcare uh, okay. providers. Uh, one minute, uh, please. Uh, I want uh, to... Uh, mention uh, um, a few points in caregiver and um, two points in caregiver and also physicians. Uh, we should uh, train uh, and we should have psychoeducational uh, programs in the caregivers um, to uh, globalize the uh, televisit and also for physicians uh, we need uh, virtual uh, training and dementia uh, training. In conclusion, uh, we uh, propose uh, that multidisciplinary team as well as, uh, as, well as uh, digital uh, uh, revolution are in urgent need uh, for globalization of uh, televisit and telemedicine uh, in low and middle income country and uh, also we could propose a hybrid uh, mixed use of face-to-face uh, -face, uh, and remote uh, um, connection and remote visit alternately uh, to uh, for uh, Thank you, doctor. better care for dementia Thank patients. You. Thank you, Dr. Mohammadian. Now I invite Dr. Mina Dehkani uh, to present her speech on cognitive impairment and brain imaging finding in patients with schizophrenia. Dr. Dehkani is the fellowship of neuropsychiatry at Tehran University of Medical Sciences. Doctor, please consider your time limitation. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, uh, I would like to appreciate my dear Professor Mariam Norizian to help and support me. Uh, my presentation is uh, about uh, cognitive impairments and brain imaging findings in the patients with schizophrenia. Uh, um, I'm Mina Dehkani, a fellowship of neuropsychiatry of Tehran University Medical Science. Uh, what is schizophrenia? What is schizophrenia? Schizophrenia is among the most disabling and economically catastrophic medical disorders, ranked by the World Health Organization as one of the top 10 illness contributing to the global burden of disease. These are four criteria. Uh, for uh, diagnosis of uh, schizophrenia, at least two or five main symptoms and, uh, and uh, duration of symptoms as effect is important, uh, important and social or occupational dysfunction. Uh, symptom of schizophrenia, three types, type positive symptom and negative symptom and cognitive symptom. Uh, worldwide epidemiology was schizophrenia 
Uh, the prevalence of schizophrenia in world averaged one person internationally, and in this incidence is about one to five per 10,000 people. Schizophrenia affects approximately uh, 24 million people, or one in 300 people, uh, 0.132 percent worldwide. This rate is uh, in this rate is one in 20, 20, uh, 222 people, uh, 1.45 percent among adults. Onset is often during late adolescence. Onset tends to happen earlier among men than among women. Approximately 2.4 million adult Americans have schizophrenia. Onset is all, uh, often during late adolescence. Onset tends to happen earlier among men than among women. Epidemiology of schizophrenia in the Middle East. Diagnose lifetime prevalent cases of schizophrenia in the countries under study will increase by 40% from 1 million to 1.4 million in 10 years. The average age of all diagnosed schizophrenia is 40 years old. Onset is often during late adolescence. Onset tends to happen earlier among in than among women. 52% uh, of all prevalent cases of schizophrenia are female. East Asia experienced the largest absolute increase in prevalence cases from approximately 40.9 million cases in 1919 to 7.2 million cases in 2016. However, the large percentage increases over their 1919 to 2016 period took place in a Eastern South Saharan Africa and North Africa Middle East. Epidemiology of schizophrenia in Iran. Various studies have already been conducted on the prevalence of mental disorder in Iran. According to mental health research in 2008, the prevalence of mental disorders in the population over the age of 15 years has been estimated to be 21% throughout the country. The prevalence of schizophrenia in my country was 17% in 2001. The prevalence of mental disorders in Tehran was 34% in 2100. According to another study, the prevalence of mental disorders in the country was 20-30%. The results of the late... According to uh, the research nationality to 2108. Uh, uh, prevalence of uh, mental disorders. Uh, all of the mental disorders uh, are all of all of the mental disorders. Yes, in population, all of the mental disorders that are yes, uh, but, uh, all of the mental disorders. Yes. Um, uh, Nur, Nurbala and Nur, Dr. Nur, Dr. Nur, for first. Yes, 
Dr. Nurbala prevalence, the, all of them, uh, not, uh, uh, not absolute okay, schizophrenia, yeah. not absolute uh, schizophrenia, Just all the of whole. the mental disorders, all of mental, uh, this mistake and in Thai, um, all of the mental disorders uh, in uh, research of uh, the, uh, Professor Dr. Nurbala is about 70% in 2001. Uh, the results of the latest national study of mental disorders in Iran in 2015 uh, showed that the prevalence of mental disorders in the country varies between 21% uh, and 34.2%. Um, However, out of every four Iranians is suspected to mental disorder. Related illness in people with schizophrenia. Heart failure, metabolic syndrome, cancer, COPD, and social isolation is uh, contributed to uh, schizophrenia. Heart failure is a um, burden of uh, uh, comorbid uh, schizophrenia, affects on heart and change heart rate, heart rate and rise risk of congestive heart failure. Uh, congestive impairment is a very frequent comorbidity in patients with chronic heart failure. Over 14% of heart failure patients exhibit signs and symptoms of memory in patients, concentration difficulties, and attention deficit. Importantly, cognitive dissection in heart failure is associated with poor prognosis. How does cardiac failure affect memory loss? Heart injury leads to reduced pump efficiency of the heart muscles and decreased general body flow. A common consequence can be insufficient oxygen supply to the entire organism, including the brain. Uh, di diabetes, the risk of uh, developing diabetes is two to five times higher in schizophrenia. How does diabetes affect the memory loss and uncontrolled diabetes by increasing the risk of experiencing cognitive problems such as memory loss? Higher than normal blood glucose level can damage nerve, cell, nerve cells, supportive glial cells, and blood vessels in both peripheral nerves of the body and the brain. There is 15% higher risk of certain cancers in rash, uh, uh, patients with schizophrenia. Um, common kinds of cancer in patients with schizophrenia, lung, breast, colon, etc. Uh, how does cancer affect the nerve system? Any cancer can spread to the brain, but the type most likely to cause brain metastasis are lung, breast, colon, kidney, and melanoma. Uh, metastatic brain. The metastatic brain tumor grow, they cre uh, do create pressure and change the function of surrounding brain tissue. Uh, sites um, uh, metastatic brain, uh, frontal common uh, brain metastatic site, frontal lobe, temporal, parietal, occipital, and cerebellum. COPD patients with schizophrenia have particularly high risk of chronic uh, obstructive pulmonary disease compared to the general population. COPD reduces the amount of air your lung taking, which over time can make blood flow in ox oxygen. Low level of oxygen to the brain may cause neur uh, neural damage. This could increase risk for memory problem. Metabolic syndrome as a, a set of cardiovascular risk factors is highly prevalent among patients with schizophrenia. It can also lead to cardiovascular disease and shorten lifespan. How metabolic syndrome affects the nerve system, the components of metabolic syndrome result in neurodegenerative disease like to dysfunction of the BB blood barrier brain. Metabolic syndrome also alters blood pressure and arterial stiffness, which in turn can damage the blood brain barrier. Uh, social isolation leads to rob robots, behavioral, neurobiological, and neurochemical deficit resembling several core symptoms in patients with schizophrenia. How does social isolation affect on the brain and cognitive? Isolation has been shown to cause brain shrinkage and the kind of brain change you see in Alzheimer's disease reduce brain cell 
connection and reduced level of brain de derived uh, neurotrophic factor, which is important for the uh, patient connection and repair of brain cell. Antipsychotic side effect, uh, uh, we use uh, two types of uh, antipsychotic in treatment of schizophrenia, um, typical and atypical uh, antipsychotic. Side effects of antipsychotic can include the following uh, this um, uh, side effect. Uh, uh, uh, contain uncontrollable movement of the jaw, lips, and tongue. This is known as authoritative dyskinesia, uncomfortable, restless, known as the akathisia, sexual problems due to hormonal change, sedation, weight gain, a higher risk get, uh, getting diabetes constipation. You have two minutes time. Uh, uh, Decreased brain volume with associated increased volume of the ventricle due to typical antipsychotic. And this is the difference between antipsychotic atypical and antipsychotic atypical. And increased gray matter volume in the prefrontal cortex and thalamus due to the atypical antipsychotic. Typical antipsychotic uh, in this researcher in uh, hold uh, in World War, Spanish research have identified inflammatory. A mechanism in the brain cause typical antipsychotic drive, which is turn origin difficulties in memory, attention, and task planning. But a typical antipsychotic uh, cause correctly reversible change in brain volume uh, that don't uh, reflect permanent solace of neurons and decrease the abnormality and return the brain to more normal function. Uh, uh, a range of cognitive domains can be comparison to schizophrenia, uh, attention, working memory, verbal memory, visual memory, reasoning, social cognition. Um, reduce gray matter volume in multiple brain region, uh, frontal cortex, temporal lobe, and insula is uh, in the schizophrenia uh, in the result. Superior temporal gyrus is common location of pathological brain aberration in patients with schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a severe mental disorder characterized by fundamental disturbance in thinking, perception, and emotions. More than 100 years of research have not been able to fully resolve to puzzle that schizophrenia. Even if the schizophrenia is not, is not a very frequent disease, it is among the most burdensome and costly illness worldwide. It is usually start in uh, adolescence. According to the global burden of this disease study, schizophrenia cases is a high degree of disability. Uh, can schizophrenia lead to dementia? Uh, and um, uh, it is unclear whether schizophrenia cases dementia or if the two diseases share some uh, other traits uh, that makes them more likely to occur together. Uh, challenge of uh, diagnosis. Okay, you can, Doctor. The time is over. Uh -huh. Okay. The uh, given the information provided by. Uh, question? Uh, it's not to me. Not to me. It's a, just a, by the way, one slide. Uh, cons conclusion and consequence. One slide. Uh, given the information provided about chronic schizophrenia, I face a few basic things need to be done. A detailed study of the prevalence and incidence of patients with schizophrenia in Iran and the Middle East. Evaluation of this patient over time and care and treatment of the disease and its complications and comorbidities. Follow of this patient in terms of dementia and investigation whether the cause of dementia is the nature of schizophrenia or due to comorbidities or both case of dementia. Thanks for, for attending. Okay. Excuse me, I think uh, we should have the uh, a question and answer uh, at the end. If, thank you. Uh, thank you.
Gentlemen, uh, thanks uh, of uh, my husband, Dr. Mansur Khatami, uh, due to supportive and help in the uh, ready it is um, topic. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Now I invite Dr. Tashtan to present his speech on gene editing in neurons. Doctor, please consider your time limitation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, you are very welcome to uh, our university. Today, uh, what I'm going to talk about that this neurodegenerative diseases uh, is also focused on the molecular biology techniques. So, in the uh, in the uh, couple of years, especially, we were working on the. Uh, gene therapies or gene editing techniques, especially for the cancer immunotherapy and the rare diseases. However, also in the Alzheimer, Parkinson, or other diseases, uh, these approaches can be used as a promising therapy application. So when we look at what is gene therapy, especially gene therapy is uh, related with the genetic engineering. Basically, in the laboratory, we are synthesizing uh, recombinant uh, genes and these genes can be covered by the viruses and after we produce the virus we can transduce or we can uh, inject this genetic therapy viruses into the uh, into the body either intravenous or intratechal or into the brain then you can insert or you can transfer whatever gene you are interested so these techniques especially used in the uh, many uh, rare, di rare diseases and the cancers. However, in that uh, presentation, what I uh, want to uh, present that we are also working on the neuron cells, especially to ask how we can edit, how we can uh, improve the uh, pathophysiology of the neuron cells, especially in the autism, Parkinson, or Alzheimer. So, uh, I'm going to show that how world or how the other uh, studies have performed these uh, approaches, especially in the autism. So when we look at autism, autism is a very wide spectrum of diseases. What is uh, related? Because when we look at the genes, especially uh, in the brain, we are uh, seeing that many different genes and the proteins are associated with Alzheimer's. That's why it is not easy to find a cure for Alzheimer's, especially for small molecule drugs or the genetic therapies. But in last years, what we have discovered that, what we have discovered that not all the Alzheimer diseases, but there is some subtype of autism uh, disease that uh, they are monogenic. Monogenic means that only one or only uh, one gene is affected uh, by means of any mutation. And in case of the mutation, these genes lose their function to produce a functional protein. That's why, especially in the Angelman syndrome, Red syndrome, or Fragile X syndrome, which are the, all the, under the autism diseases, we see that this disease can be cured by the genetic therapy or genetic editing uh, approaches. So uh, this is the first one uh, clinical trials uh, have been performed in the world, uh, especially in the Angelman syndrome uh, as an autism uh, diseases. And so when we look at this disease, especially in the neurological, uh, neurodegenerative diseases, what we see that molecular biology is important to understand the what is the role of the, this uh, patho uh, pathology. So when we look at Angelman syndrome, uh, we have seen that ube 3 a uh, gene is affected in this uh, autism disease. And however, we have a copy of this gene, uh, both from the pattern and the uh, mother. So when we, when we uh, have one mutation in that gene from mothers, so then we can look at for the, uh, the other gene copy from the fathers. So the first therapies are focused on this type and, and what, uh, what developed here that 
for example, understands oligonic dotted uh, approaches. So especially this approach is very uh, simple and easy to produce and it is just 20 to 25 nucleotides. So nucleotides, as you uh, know that, it is just uh, coming from adenine, timine, cytosine, and guanine, and you can easily regulate or engineer this type of uh, drugs easily in, for the uh, Angelman syndrome to attack any side of the gene. So the other technology is the CRISPR-Cas technology. As we, uh, as we remember that uh, in 2020, uh, CRISPR-Cas technology got the Nobel Prize, especially to be able to uh, genetically modify any kind of the organism. That's why here also uh, being used that we can modify the UBA3A gene, especially ATS gene, to regulate this gene uh, as functional. The other point is the crab uh, fused zinger, uh, zinger fingerprints, and this protein is also focused on the uh, promoter side to activate or to repress uh, the proteins that are affected in the uh, Angelman syndrome. So th these four different approaches is, are also produced in our laboratories in uh, Üsküdar University to, uh, to be implemented for all the uh, neurodegenerative diseases. So what we are doing now, after producing this type of technologies, then we are producing uh, almost 10 different recombinant viruses in the, our university and to be able to attack any kind of the tissues, either brain or muscles or neurons or the other uh, tissues like the blood or the stem cells. So you can see that especially the adenoviruses which are mostly used in the world to be able to transfer any kind of the gene uh, to the brain and then uh, you can just transfer your DNA to uh, start the synthesis of the gene of interest. The second example is from the red syndrome. For each type of the neurodegenerative diseases, this scenario is changing because the gene function is and when we look at the red, sorry. So when we look at the red syndrome, uh, our gene is um, uh, MECP2 gene, and in that gene, what we see that if there is a mutation in that gene, we lose the functional proteins, and then we got some other markers uprising or the, uh, decreasing. And when we able to transfer the synthetic copy of this gene into the brain, then we ask that maybe the uh, red syndrome pathophysiologies can be, uh, can be developed or can be uh, changed. And this uh, clinical therapy is also uh, started by the different uh, biotechnology companies, uh, especially after uh, we have the uh, synthetic copy of this gene, we can cover or we can uh, encode this gene in adeno associated virus, especially we have almost 12 different adeno associated virus, and uh, only a couple of them can be in fact to the brain cells specifically, so, so that it can transfer any gene to your brain. So this is the couple of experiments uh, have been done in the world showing that uh, it can be easily transferred into the brain. You can see the green fluorescent proteins is expressed effectively in the brain of the mice. And you can see that after injection of the transgenic uh, MECP2 gene, you can see that severity of these uh, mice goes down, which is showing that with the help of genetic therapies, we can reverse the pathophysiology of the red syndrome, especially in the uh, mice. The third example is coming from fragile X syndrome, and that uh, gene is very interesting because what we see in that there is cytosine, guanine, and guanine repeats, and these repeats have been uh, found in all humans, but around 50 times repeated. However, in, uh, in the patients, we have discovered that these repeats can be uprising to 200. So then, if we can decrease these 200 repeats 
up to the uh, 50, uh, down to the uh, 50, then maybe we can uh, downregulate the uh, pathology of this disease. How we can do this? We are using the CRISPR-Cas technology, and you can just cut the DNA of the brain, of the neuron cells. Then you can just cut off this type of the repeats, and to decrease the repeat number up to the uh, 50s, then to uh, reverse the pathology. And this CRISPR-Cas technology, that is the focus on our uh, laboratory. And uh, you can see here that the uh, mice uh, strategies have been done in the world, and you can see that after the CRISPR gene editing, the, bur uh, the burden is also going down, and the, some uh, physiological uh, effectiveness can be reversed with the help of genetic engineering. Along with this CRISPR gene editing, we are also working on the stem cells. So as you know, that stem cells can be differentiated in any kind of the cells. And that's why, especially uh, mesenchymal stem cells, we are working on it. And we, we can transfer any kind of the genes uh, into the mesenchymal stem cells to be able to uh, differentiate into the neuron cells. Uh, now we are working on also the central nervous system because there is spinal cord injury. And in spinal cord injury, we can use the mesenchymal stem cells as a neurological uh, backwards. So then we just insert three different genes into these stem cells, brain-drive neurotrophic factor, glial-drive neurotrophic factor, and neurotrophic factor three. These three different genes can be differentiate stem cells into neuron cells. So in, in the case of spinal cord injury, we, uh, we are hypothesizing to put this transgenic stem cells into the spinal cord so that it can, it can make the connection between the neurons because they also will differentiate into neuron cells. So that this stem cell, transgenic stem cell, is also promising strategy for the neurological uh, disorders. The last one I want to show that we are also wo working on spinal muscular atrophy. So as we know that spinal muscular atrophy, or in the short name, SMA disease, uh, is a neurological disease. There is a motor neuron cells, and these motor neuron cells can lose survival motor neuron proteins in case of mutations. So in the, in the world, uh, in, the world uh, in the first time, we have shown that after we, uh, we have performed CRISPR gene editing in the, uh, in the cells, we have shown that, you can see here that, after just changing one letter of the three billion letter in the our genome, we can show that all survival motor neuron can be, uh, motor neuron protein can be increased up to 90%. So this is all the recent uh, studies uh, performed in our laboratory. And in the next time, we are working on the uh, SMA uh, animal models. So in case of this neurological gene editing, uh, we are going to uh, want to go into clinical trials. And what we are seeing here that it's finished. So what we are seeing here that gene therapies, gene editing, or cellular therapies is the nearing feature of the, uh, of the uh, neurodegenerative diseases or neurological diseases. That's why in our laboratories, in our universities, not only uh, we are focusing on the uh, pathology of the disease, we are also trying to cure of this uh, molecular uh, biology side of the disease. So thank you very much uh, for listening to us. And is there any question I can answer now? Thank you, doctor. OK, sure. Thank you. OK. OK, the last presentation. We will have Dr. Nargis Radman. Uh, her speech is on the data registry for uh, the patient with bipolar disorders. Dr. Adman is the resident of psychiatry at Tehran University of Medical Sciences. Hello, everybody, and good afternoon. Um, my name is Nargis, and um, 
I am a medical doctor, PhD in cognitive neuroscience, and uh, currently a resident uh, of psychiatry. Um, I'm very happy to be here to present my well ongoing project. Uh, it's ongoing, and we are working together under the supervision of Professor Norizian and Professor Najati Sapa. So this is our hospital. It's a psychiatry hospital, a referral center um, in Tehran, uh, the oldest, um, actually, a psychiatric hospital. Um, we plan to start, um, well, actually, we have started recently um, a data registry of bi uh, bipolar mood disorder patients. Um, we will um, recruit patients and uh, actually collect their um, neurocognitive, uh, psychiatric, and also neuroimaging data. Uh, so this is what I will present in the few next few minutes. Okay, so um, everybody knows um, bipolar mood disorder here. So it's also known as a manic depressive disorder, uh, which is characterized by dramatic shifts and changes in mood, uh, energy level, and in, it can really affect the um, performance of people patients actually. It's very prevalent and uh, it's a lifelong episodic illness uh, which has variable course. It can affect the mm, uh, most importantly the, the young people uh, because I will show you, uh, well this is the course of the disease so it can be, um, oh, I don't have the, yeah. So. Um, this is uh, the changes in our mood in everyday life, in people without mood disorder. Uh, in bipolar mood disorder, patients uh, have sometimes uh, sub-threshold de depression episodes, sometimes manic episode, uh, hypomania or manic episode. So they have dramatic shifts and changes. And this is all over during their lives. Uh, the prevalence of um, bipolar mood disorder is estimated um, around 2.8% um, at the United States. Well, it's quite old, 2004, but it's not changed um, so much. So in Iran, at the quite same time, we had a prevalence of um, around 1%. Uh, it's not, uh, well, it's not new, and it is possible that, uh, well, not all the patients have been included or something, because, well, um, I will show you in the next slide that um, all over the world we have quite the same um, prevalence. It's not uh, culture dependent, it's not um, country dependent, it's uh, quite similar. In Arab countries also they have, um, according to a survey in 2015, they have the same prevalence of bipolar mood disorder. Um, and there are some concerns that maybe we have an underestimation of the, um, about the prevalence of bipolar mood disorder. Okay, you can see here, um, it's a graph showing um, the prevalence of the disorder um, based on the age groups. As you can see here, well, we have a similar prevalence in female and male. The overall is 2.8%. Uh, and uh, we have the, the main prevalence or the most uh, actually prevalence in the younger ages. You can see here, this is in uh, adolescent, and uh, at around 17 and 18, we have a huge surge in the prevalence. So this disorder, as I said, is mainly diagnosed in young adults and who are functionally and um, economically active. Um, 
it causes functional burden on the society. So, and uh, according to the WHO um, mental health survey, BMD or bipolar mood disorder is one of the main causes of um, day out of role in the population. Uh, but it's not only affecting the young ages. As you can see here in this graph, it accelerates the aging. So it's very uh, kind of significant to pay attention to this disorder uh, because it, um, besides biological changes in the brain and um, in the body, it also affects the functional, the cognitive function, sorry, it, uh, it affects, uh, well, in the majority of patients, we have disability and poor functional outcomes during their life. Uh, and one of the main components of these disabilities is functional uh, uh, cognitive impairment, actually. And this cognitive impairment develops at the early stages of the, dis of the disease. It's not at the end of the disease that we um, note this kind of impairment. So it's very important to pay attention to the patients from the beginning of their um, dis disease uh, course, actually. And um, the range of cognitive impairment varies depending on the individual, uh, according to the phase of the disorder, etc. So, as um, Professor Martin uh, this morning stated, there are different, um, actually, domains of cognition which are affected. But we cannot clearly say that this, um, this aspect is affected and this one is not affected so and, and there are many studies there are a large number of studies uh, on neuro uh, neuropsychological and imaging and um, psychiatric te techniques uh, in this patient but we don't have a kind of uh, consensus on the pattern of cognitive impairment in patients so as um, according to the um, studies, we have kind of psychomotor changes, uh, kind of changes in executive functions, mainly in attention switching, uh, inhibition control. Uh, we have memory impairments, we have attention impairments, and affective processing impairments. And there are, of course, many studies using MRI techniques and EEG techniques to show uh, kind of... Um, uh, actually biomarkers for this disorder that I will not explain because everybody uh, thought about this and talked about this this morning. So we thought that maybe because we have many patients in our um, hospital and our university and the data are not uh, gathered, they are not uh, collected uh, in a unified way, and all the data are scattered. Uh, so maybe it's a very good idea to start a clinical registry for patients, by bipolar mood disorder patients, to aggregate the data, to collect all the data, and perform follow-up uh, follow studies in our uh, patients. So. Um, what we will do is, this is my last slide actually, so we will, um, uh, we will um, actually collect our patients from our hospital, bipolar mood disorder patients, based on psychiatric interview. Then we will perform um, neuroimaging studies, EEG studies, well it should be EEG sign, <laughs> Uh, lab data, uh, there, uh, and we will also collect all their uh, um, actually medication history, uh, other uh, medical histories. After that, we will perform a uh, complete neuropsychological testing, uh, computer-based actually, and we will collect all the data in our data registry, data um, actually data bank, and then uh, we will perform um, 
at the next step, we will perform a data analysis, which can give us new insights in the um, diagnosis and treatment, and also new research methods for the patients. Thank you very much. And if you have any suggestions, I will be happy. Thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you. Okay. Um, if there is any question about Dr. Rodman's presentation, and as well as other speakers. Okay. <laughs> no question? Oh, one question. If do you want to say any comment? Do you want to say any Okay, uh, please use microphone. Uh, Dr. Dehani, you want to say something about your presentation? Uh, my presentation? About yeah, my yeah your back, presentation. Back. Yes. Uh, results uh, that we take in a uh, presentation, uh, results, uh, the correct of these results, 3, 4, uh, 1 point uh, percent of the population in the age group uh, 50 years and above suffer from mental disorder <laughs> in Tehran. Thank you. Thank you for the correction. Okay, no question. Dr. Sajjad, do you want to... S uh, you had some question. Go ahead. I have a question about the, the prevalence rate of mental illness in Iran, because it's a big climb, 25, about 25 percent in Iran suffer from mental illness. Yeah, the okay, doctor corrected the issue now. <laughs> Doctor, use microphone, uh, sorry. My question is how many people yes. did you enroll in your study? Because it's uh, very important when we calculate the prevalence uh, rate, it's a the numerator study. and the denominator. It's a big study. It's a big study in Tehran uh, and uh, in uh, tw uh, 20, uh, in above, in people above 40, uh, 40 years and above suffer. And results is uh, from mental disorders, 34.2 percent. Doctor, um, at, um, uh, three, seven seven zero five uh, participants male and one one six six five female participated in this study. It was not in the whole population, I think. But, but it it's was, okay. We can. Uh, uh, the, the different types of psychiatric, psychiatric disorders, such as bipolar disorder or uh, uh, personality disorders and schizophrenia, among various psychiatric disorders, 34% of the patients... Of the patients? Of the patients, or, of, yeah. or of the people? No, of the because patients. No. Uh, on the subject, uh, uh, 19370 subject, more than uh, complete the uh, 28 item version of the uh, general health questionnaire for the assessment for whole of mental disorder in Tehran. Among the population or the patients? Among among people, because it's very no, important when you when uh, you calculate the the prevalence rate. The numerator no. should I'm be the people with yeah. characteristic and the denominator, the, the all people, okay? I it's very important, the prevalence rate, and you should weight your cases because I think uh, it's, um, a, it's a big line. Okay, doctor. I think, I'm sure that it was not about the whole population. I know what is the survey. Uh, I suggest, Dr. Dehani, please, Please correct your slides and the definition and the statistics uh, after this session. And uh, at, if we have time today or tomorrow, please inform all of the participants, okay? I think it should be corrected. Yeah. 
Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any any question? No, thanks. So for the break. Thank you very much. kurumlara profesyonel bir iletişimci olmaya hazırlanıyorsun. Her şeyden önce yüzün burada hep gülüyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra reklamcı olmak istiyorsan bize katıl. Merhaba, ben Eylül. Üsküdar Üniversitesi Halkla İlişkiler Bölümü öğrencisiyim. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra halkla ilişkiler uzmanı olmak istedim hep. 
mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir halkla ilişkileri uzmanı olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Bölümde insanların neden ve nasıl iletişim kurduklarından başlayarak medyanın insan ve toplumlara etkisini, devletlerin, kurumların ve markaların işleyişini ve dev halkla ilişkiler kampanyalarının nasıl yapıldığını öğreniyorsunuz. Yıl boyu düzenlenen etkinlikler sayesinde sektörün önde gelen isimleriyle birlikte çalışma imkanı yakalıyorsun. Her şeyden önce burada hep yüzün gülüyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra haklı işleri uzmanı olmak için bize katıl. Merhaba ben Sezer, radyo, televizyon ve sinema öğrencisiyim. Önce mutlu olmak istedim. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir radyo, televizyon ve sinema mezunu olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Nitelikli bir akademik kadrodan ders alıyorsun. Ders gördüğün alanlar fiziki ve teknik donanımlı mekanlardan, laboratuvarlardan oluşuyor. Radyo ve televizyon stüdyolarında teorik ve uygulamalı eğitim bir arada görüyorsun. Yalnızca bugün değil, geleceği de dikkate alarak hazırlanmış bir müfredatın var. Kalifiye meslek insanları olarak yetiştirildiğini her an hissediyorsun. Yıl boyu düzenlenen etkinliklerde sektörün önde gelen isimleriyle bir araya gelme imkanı buluyorsun. Ü TV ve Ü Radyo stüdyolarında pratik imkanı oluyor. Her şeyden önce burada yüzün hep gülüyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra radyocu, televizyoncu veya sinemacı olmak istiyorsan bize katıl. Sıkılmadan eğlene eğlene, dört yıl genelden ödele, kurumsaldan uygulamaya, birbirini tamamlayan dersler görüyorsun. İkinci sınıftan itibaren genelde mek laboratuvarında oluyorsun. Alanında uzman, kalifiye meslek insanı olarak yetiştirildiğini her an hissediyorsun. Yalnızca bugünü değil, geleceği de dikkate alarak hazırlanmış bir müfredatın var. Mezuniyetten sonra artık sen ne istersen, ajans, medya, kurumsal. Her şeyden önce bu da yüzünü kırıyor. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra da iyi bir görsel ilişkili olmak istiyorsan bize kat. İstanbul'un kalbi Üsküdar'da Türkiye'nin beyin üssünü kurmak ve dünya çapında bir üniversite olabilmek için kolları sıvadığımızda her şeyi insanı anlamakla başlar dedik ve bu gayeyle çıktık yola. Sağlık alanındaki çeyrek asırlık tecrübeyle Türkiye'nin ilk ve tek davranış bilimleri ve sağlık temalı üniversitesi ünvanına kavuşmamıza uzanan yolculuğumuz böyle başladı. Kısa zamanda çok büyük mesafeler kat ederek ülkemizi bilimin ışığında parlak yarınlara taşıyacak gençler yetiştirmiş olmanın mutluluğunu yaşıyoruz. İnanıyoruz ki ulusal ve uluslararası ölçekte çağdaş, donanımlı, sorgulayan, araştıran, bilim üreten gençlerimiz de global platformlarda daha birçok başarımız, gururumuz olacak. Biz hayatın içinde bir üniversiteyiz. Bir üniversite beş yerleşke anlayışıyla İstanbul'un farklı noktalarından kolaylıkla ulaşılabilen yerleşkelerimizde öğrencilerimizin kampüs deneyimini şehrin dinamik temposundan kopmadan yaşamasını sağlıyor, onların hayata her an bağlı kalmalarına olarak tanıyoruz. Öğrencilerimize teorik ve pratik bilgiyi bir bütün olarak sunduğumuz, yapay zekadan farmakogenetiğe kadar pek çok farklı alana yönelik 70'i aşkın laboratuvarımız, televizyon ve radyo stüdyolarımız, ileri teknolojiye sahip dersliklerimiz ve daha birçok modern altyapı özelliğimizle dünya standartlarında bir üniversiteyiz. 6 fakülte, 1 sağlık hizmetleri meslek yüksekokulu ve 5 enstitümüzde hepsi alanlarında yetkin, bini aşkın güçlü akademik ve idari kadromuzla 4 temel ilkemiz olan eleştirilebilirlik, özgürlükçülük, çoğulculuk ve katılımcılığı yüksek öğretimin her alanında uyguluyoruz. Tıp, diş, mühendislik ve doğa bilimleri, iletişim, sağlık bilimleri, insan ve toplum bilimleri alanlarındaki lisans ve sağlık hizmetleri meslek yüksekokulu ön lisans programlarımızın yanı sıra bağımlılık ve adli bilimlerden tasavvuf araştırmalarına kadar farklı branşlara yönelik yüksek lisans ve doktora programlarımızla birlikte toplamda 22 bine aşkın öğrencimizde yüksek öğretimde çığır açmaya devam ediyor. 10. yılımızı geride bırakırken verdiğimiz 23 bin mezunumuzla da gurur duyuyoruz. Girişimcilik, üniversite kültürü ve yurt dışındaki birçok saygın üniversiteden önce dünyada ilk kez hayata geçirdiğimiz pozitif psikoloji gibi derslerin yanı sıra yüzlerce ulusal ve uluslararası çapta etkinlikle öğrencilerimizin iyi birer dünya vatandaşı olmalarını amaçlıyoruz. Türkiye'nin ilk bilim ve fikir festivali ve yüksek insani değerler ödülleri gibi geleneksel hale getirdiğimiz geniş kapsamlı etkinlikler ve sosyal sorumluluk projeleriyle kurumsal çalışmalarımızı sosyo-kültürel alanlara da yayıyoruz. 
Mutlu Yuva, Haydi Tut Elimi Derneği gibi sivil toplum kuruluşlarıyla sevgi ve güven dolu bir geleceğe katkıda bulunurken, bilim ve uygulama ortağımız NP İstanbul Beyin Hastanesi uzmanlarının desteği sayesinde başarıyla sürdürdüğümüz Aileler Üniversitede projesi ve benzeri çalışmalarla yarınlarımız için sağlam temeller inşa ediyoruz. Arge odaklarımızın yanı sıra Brain Park Teknoloji Transfer Ofisi, Silikon Türk Teknopark gibi teknolojik inovasyonlarla bilimsel çalışmalarda öncü rol üstleniyoruz. Dünyanın 80 ülkesinden 3 bine aşkın uluslararası öğrencimizle farklı medeniyetleri Üsküdar'ın bilim çatısı altında buluşturuyoruz. Yüksek öğretimde uluslararası kalite standartlarına büyük önem veriyoruz. Bu yöndeki tüm çalışmalarımızı Pearson, FedEx, ILAT, ISO 9001 gibi akreditasyonlarla belgeliyoruz. Kurucu rektörümüz Profesör Doktor Nevzat Tarhan'ın öncülüğünde G20 zirvesine ev sahipliği yapan ilk ve tek Türk üniversitesi olarak beyin konusundaki çalışmalarımıza küresel çapta devam ediyoruz. Geleceğin bilgili ve donanımlı hekimlerini yetiştirdiğimiz tıp fakültemizde afiliye hastanemiz NP İstanbul Beyin Hastanesi ile sürekli işbirliği içindeyiz. Ayrıca sağlık ve uygulama merkezlerimiz olan NP Fener Yolu ve NP Etiler Tıp Merkezimizde de geniş uygulama ve staj olanakları sunuyoruz. Üniversite tercihi gelecek tercihidir. Tercihini iyi bir gelecekten yana kullananlar Üsküdar Üniversitesi'nde buluşuyor, parlak yarınlara emin adımlarla yürüyorlar. Çünkü Üsküdar gerçek bir üniversite. Türkiye'nin beyin üssü Üsküdar Üniversitesi. Merhaba ben Asena. Herkes gibi ben de mutlu olmak istiyorum. Mutlu olmak için önce sevdiğim ve istediğim bölümde olmam gerektiğini biliyorum. Mutluyum çünkü Üsküdar Üniversitesi'nde tarih bölümü öğrencisiyim. Mutlu bir öğrenci olarak sizlere neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimi anlatayım. Bizde Türkiye'de tarih eğitiminde ilkleri yaşamanız mümkün. Bütün bir yıl sadece ders dinlemiyor, pek çok tarihi mekana, arşivlere, müzelere gidiyoruz. Ödevlerimizi sadece evde değil, bizzat sınıflarda, hocalarımız danışmanlığında yapıyoruz. Tarih öğrenimi için çok önemli olan Osmanlıca eğitimini oldukça yoğun alıyoruz. Derslerimizi grup çalışmaları eşliğinde sorgulayarak işliyoruz. Bu fakültede bulunan sosyoloji, felsefe, siyaset bilimi ve uluslararası ilişkileri bölümleri ile birlikte karşılıklı etkileşimle ders görüyoruz. Bir yandan tarih öğrenirken, diğer yandan multidisipliner bir bakış açısıyla hayata hazırlanıyoruz. Her şeyden önemlisi burada yüzün hep gülüyor. Sen de hem mutlu olmak hem de tarih okumak istiyorsan bize katıl. Medya ve iletişimden Sude ben. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra medya ve iletişim uzmanı olmak istedim hep. Mutlu olmadan olduğu şeyin bir önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir medya iletişim uzmanı olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Bölümde akademik ve bilimsel anlayış üzerine odaklanıyorsunuz. Bu nedenle daha çok alana akademisyen, araştırmacı ve bilim insanı yetiştirme misyonu etrafında biçimlenebiliyorsunuz. Üsküdar Üniversitesi Televizyonu, Radyosu ve Üsküdar Haber Ajansı gibi üniversitemizin medya organlarında görev alarak bu yıllarında medya ile iç içe oluyoruz. Bunun dışında yıl boyu düzenlenen etkinliklerde sektörün önde gelen isimleriyle bir araya gelme imkanı oluyor. Her şeyden önce burada yüzün hep gülüyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra medya ve iletişim uzmanı olmak istiyorsan bize katıl. Merhaba, ben Elif Nur, psikoloji bölümü öğrencisiyim. Hem mutlu olmak hem de psikolog olmak istedim hep. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir psikolog olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ne tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Davranış ve sağlık bilimlerinde Türkiye'nin ilk ve tek tematik üniversitesinden mezun oluyorsun. Pozitif psikoloji dersiyle hayata bambaşka pencereden bakma fırsatı yakalıyorsun. Üniversite Hastane İşbirliği modeliyle akademik ve klinik eğitimin iç içe olduğu bir lisans tecrübesi elde ediyorsun. Multidisipliner eğitim kültürünü oluşturma idealiyle dünya standartlarının üstünde bilim üretme hedefini bizzat hissediyor ve görüyorsun. Türkçe ve İngilizce eğitim olanı var. Kurucu rektörümüz Profesör Doktor Nevzat Tarhan Endülüğü'ndeki güçlü akademik kadro ile seni kariyer hayatına en iyi şekilde hazırlıyor. Her şeyden önce burada yüzüm hep gidiyor. Hem mutlu olmak hem psikolog olmak istiyorsan bize katıl. Merhaba, ben felsefe 3. sınıf öğrencisi Öznur Aynural. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra felsefe okumak istedim hep. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir felsefe mezunu olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni
Sokrates'in tercih ettiğinden bahsedeyim size. Sokrates'in dediği gibi, kendini tanı, yolculuğun burada başlıyor. Okumak, sorgulamak, araştırmakla donandığın dört yılın sonunda akademisyenlik, çeşitli şirketlerde felsefe danışmanlık, basın yayın organlarında ve yayın evlerinde editörlük, yazarlık, eleştirmenlik, reklamcılık yapabiliyorsun. Kamu ve özel sektörde, sivil toplum kuruluşlarında, hukuk, finans, tıp, medya, sanat gibi çeşitli alanların toplumsal hizmet projelerinde ve etik danışma kurullarında çalışabiliyorsun. Her şeyden önce yüzün burada hep gülüyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra felsefe okumak istiyorsan bize katıl. Merhaba, ben Ahmet Arslan. Sosyoloji bölümü öğrencisiyim. Hayatım boyunca önce mutlu olmak, sonra sosyoloji okumak istedim hep. Aldığım sosyoloji eğitim sayesinde her ikisinin de özdeş kavramlar olduğunu fark ettim. Şimdi size neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'nin sosyoloji bölümünü tercih ettiğimi anlatayım. Bölümdeki dersler toplumsal olayları açıklama, yorumlama, eleştirme ve çözme ihtiyaçlarına karşılık vermeye yardımcı olan bir içeriğe sahip. Bu ihtiyacı karşılamak için gerekli olan temel kuramsal konular ve araştırma yöntemleri kapsamlı bir sosyolojik literatür çerçevesinde alanında deneyimli hocalar tarafından aktarılıyor. İstanbul gibi bir metropolde sağ çalışmaları vasıtasıyla pratiğe geçirme olanağı sunuyor. Bu da bana mutlu bir toplumun nasıl inşa edileceği hususunda vizyon ve misyon kazandırıyor. Her şeyden önce hep yüzün gülüyor burada. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra sosyolog olmak istiyorsan bize katıl. Merhaba, ben yeni medya gazetecilik bölümünden Burak. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra gazeteci olmak istedim ben. Mutlu olmadan olduğun şeyin önemi yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir gazeteci olmak için neden Üstün Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Hepimizin gözlemlediği gibi internetle birlikte medya ve gazetecilik alanında çok radikal, yapısal ve işlevsel dönüşüm süreçleri başladı. Yazılı basın, görsel, işitsel medya gibi ayrımlar ortadan kalkarak bütünleşik dijital yeni medya yapılanması ortaya çıktı. İşte burada yeni medya ve gazetecilik alanındaki bu yeni duruma uygun bir profesyonel olmana odaklı eğitim alıyorsunuz. Dijital içerik üretebilen ve yönetebilen, yeni medyanın tüm özelliklerini kullanabilen bir profesyonel olma hedefleniyor. Ayrıca yeni medya okuryazarı direklerine sahip olarak medya içeriklerine eleştirel bakabilmeyi öğreniyorsunuz. Mesleki etik değerlere uygun davranmanın gazetecilik mesleği açısından ne kadar önemli olduğunu kavruyorsun. Her şeyden önce burada yüzün hep gülüyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra gazeteci olmak için bize katıl. Reklam tasarımı ve iletişim öğrencisi Zehra Güneş. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra reklamcı olmak istedim hep. Mutlu olmadan olduğu şeyin önemi yok çünkü. Ben de mutlu bir reklamcı olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğinden bahsedeyim size. Nitelikli bir akademisyen kadrodan 4 yıl boyunca eğlenerek, keyif alarak eğitim görüyorsun. İlgi ve yönelimlerine yanıt vermeye elverişli bir ders programın oluyor. Sektörle işbirliği içinde hazırlanan bir eğitim öğretim programı oluyor. Bu eğitim kapsamında hem reklam sektörüne hem de akademik çalışma yapmakta olan kurumlara profesyonel bir iletişimci olmaya hazırlanıyorsun. Her şeyden önce yüzün burada hep gülüyor. Sen de önce mutlu olmak, sonra reklamcı olmak istiyorsan size katıl. Ben Eylül, Üsküdar Üniversitesi Halkla İlişkiler Bölümü öğrencisiyim. Önce mutlu olmak, sonra halkla ilişkiler uzmanı olmak istedim hep. Mutlu olmadan olduğu şeyin önemi yok. Test, okay. Okay, nice work. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Now uh, we move to neurotransmission, neurotransmission, and because of time, maybe uh, this session will combine, continue with uh, the last uh, session, uh, uh, movement disorder session, and then uh, the question and answer will be at the last. So, uh, again, thank you very much for inviting us, a delegate from Indonesia, to join this program. Thank you, Dr. Kate, Professor Tarhan, Dr. Uh, Turker, for inviting us and involved in this program. So, uh, my topic is uh, about neurotrauma. So, this is a specific uh, cases in neurotrauma, uh, 
very limited cases, but uh, you know we have to treat this uh, very well. Uh, the management of head injury in uh, pregnancy. So yes, uh, this is uh, you can see here. This is the condition in our country. This is uh, uh, football uh, supporter hooligan. We call this, and then some of the pregnant mother sometimes use this, you know, riding uh, motorcycle. So the issue is, uh, you know, in uh, some older uh, or previous uh, research that uh, hormonal factors is also contribute as a neuroprotector, neuroprotector agent. So uh, that time we, uh, we uh, predict that uh, the pregnancy could be a, a best uh, neuroprotector for the head injury. So uh, I will show you that many uh, previous publications about this. So you can see here that uh, uh, many issues about the gender outcomes and also how hormonal status influence the outcome. You can see here, uh, TBA patient recover better than males for female and then also sex difference and the effect of hormonotherapy on ischemic brain injury on also the but the gender and gender and traumatic brain injury so you can see here do women uh, fare worse this is about gender too and you can see here about sex hormone and recovery so progesterone that time is you know for uh, in a laboratory research so some neuroprotective uh, uh, uh, property for you know for some uh, brain injury. So the uh, the other thing that you know you can see that uh, in pregnant women uh, they have a different physical condition, and uh, the management is unusual because we have to dealing with two lives. And yes, previous uh, study with different outcomes, and of course uh, it needs uh, require multiple surgery and then some conservative, and then uh, craniotomy alone, and only cesarean section <laughs> not to do craniotomy. So uh, it's really uh, uh, interesting. And also the outcome, you can see, uh, the mother and the baby alive, and also the mother and baby died, and also uh, most of the patient is uh, the GOS is good, so I don't know. Uh, uh, even in uh, severe head injury, the condition of the, the the outcome of the mother is good. I don't know. It is a hormonal factor, but uh, you know, in previous studies, no, no, uh, so no significant effect. And also, all mother and baby died, and also the you can see this very important too. IUFD, as I told you before, the hormonal. Uh, factor uh, also make some, you know, some uh, uh, related to the outcome. So uh, I'm very lucky because uh, there's the first uh, we dealing with this patient, we have some confusing. So this is uh, the algorithm that uh, uh, I, I use. Uh, I, I try to make some algorithm with this small uh, uh, series of patients. So the important thing is fatal distress. If we, meet, uh, if we face with fatal distress patients, so we have to consider uh, if this, uh, the, the, the brain with circulation or uh, no circulation. You, see, you can see here, and then we, can, we, we have to do simultaneous surgery. And if no circulation, so maybe just ICP monitoring. Consider maternal condition, fibro baby, high quality baby, and then we decide it. And one case very important that uh, one patient uh, in brain dead condition, but uh, the the baby is still alive, but it's, it's not viable yet. So we ask the neuro anesthesia, neuro intensive care doctor to treat this patient until viable and then deliver. So this is uh, this is our, that time is a very high value baby. So the, the, the, the, the family uh, asked to the doctor to, you know, to treat uh, how we uh, deliver the baby alive. 
very interesting. This is a case you can see. Uh, just I will uh, uh, quick to uh, with this slide because the time. You can see severe head injury. Just two days, it's wake up. I don't know. Yeah, and uh, we do the simultaneous simultaneous surgery, craniotomy and termination. So in ten days, it woke up. This is a severe head injury case. So this is uh, case two. This is also a uh, severe head injury. You can see here, but uh, they refer to our uh, center three days after the accident. So it's uh, a very late case. So I think the condition is getting worse. The problem is also, you know, we have to intubate the baby too because uh, have some, uh, you know, uh, this patient uh, came with fetal distress too, with and then uh, the baby uh, born. This is a simultaneous surgery, you know. We prepare the cranfumi and our college from obstetrics, Dikenogi, doing the cesarean section. We do the the the compression, uh, the compression uh, frontal decompression very well, but you can see the baby died in the first day treatment because of respiratory disease syndrome. The mother died six days later. And also, this is very important. The case three, you can see here. Yeah, I think this is conservative treatment. You can, uh, with uh, I think it's moderate head injury, never continuous in accident. So you can see uh, this. We will uh, treat it conservatively. I think. And uh, the the the interesting the interesting uh, uh, find is you know. The baby, uh, the, she lost of her, her pregnancy in the day of 21. You can see from my previous slide that uh, about 50 percent of moderate and head injury have some hormonal derangement. So uh, it uh, related with the the life of the baby too. So that time, obstetrician did cesarean surgery, and then just two days after uh, they did the termination. The the mother is wake up simultaneously, so uh, we don't know. But, so it's maybe the condition of the pregnancy related to the brain too. Yeah. And this is uh, the conclusion: the pregnant head injured patient present an unique challenge to the nursing because care must be provided for two patient, the mother and the fetus, and sometimes in acute circumstances may demand immediate, simultaneously, and multidisciplinary management. Even mild head injury during pregnancy can threaten either the maternal or the fetal life. The risk is associated with systemic problem and also cerebral consequences of high intracranial pressure. And progesterone has been shown to be have neuroprotective effect in multiple animal models of brain injury. But the efficacy and safety in patients with ABA remains con content use and so no benefit. Future study are still needed to better assess the role in the TBN patient. So thank you very much. And this is our hospital. Our hospital is the largest hospital in Indonesia. It, uh, we have uh, more than 1,700 beds. So it's a referral uh, hospital in our Indonesia. I hope you, we, you can visit our country in the future. Thank you very much. Please, Professor Norusi, you have 15 minutes. Mr. President, dear yes. colleagues, I am 
that is a joy and honor being with so many colleagues from around the world, across the world, and especially with Dr. Khatib, who is not there, <laughs> and Vicky. And now, after hearing so many nice and exciting lecture today in the morning or virtually in the neurosurgery. Now I must try to bring you and ground the reality in neurosurgery. And I hope that is possible. Now that is the reason. Good. My topic Oh, okay. Oh. No. cranial vertebral junction and spinal cord is characterized as an emergency in neurotrauma. This consists of several injuries like extra intracranial and CVG injuries and also spinal injuries particularly particularly spinal cord injury yes this management of management of traumatic head injury is the main goal of all is moving transporting the victim to nearest hospital safely that is uh, mandatory. Some, here is some aid at the site of accident. Please don't move the patient if it is not necessary. But moving and transporting the victim to hospital, please take care on head and neck being in the same level, not bending. Flexion, extension, bending to right and left. That is very, very important by transporting and check, checking the respiratory and cardiovascular status is a mandatory that must be done. Do, uh, done. And in asymptomatic patients, please take patients never to the nearest hospital. Here is an admission. The doctor, emergency doctor must make clear if there is a indication for cranial uh, CT or consulting with a neurosurgeon if there is some evidence for uh, uh, severe injuries which must be operated urgently. Here, notice a bone or bruise and scalp can be develop in about 24 to 48 hours to a severe head injury that is possible. And that is the reason why the patient must be remain under control for 24, even 48 hours in the emergency, in, uh, in the emergency center in spite of initial, initial, normal initial cranial CT that must be controlled here. Besides, there are some false localizing sign on symptoms like, like corneal, Waltman notes, phenomena 
with changing the mitriasis from one side, epsilateral side, to other side in contralateral. In 50% uh, of patients in about 30 to one hour. Presence, presence of a short loss of consciousness. LOC and post-traumatic amnesia are very crucial criteria for performing a cranial CT that is accepted by European and American authors. It's, uh, that is them. Uh, the other important sign is this lucid interval, 14 to 21 percent. But the problem here is that the patient after initial unconsciousness and short recovery remain consciousness until developing the intracranial hemorrhage and suddenly progression the symptom, medical clinical symptoms and become apneic and dead. The patient who talk and die in epidural and subdural hematoma is the case. The symptomatic study of head injury began in 1970 and established in 79, and the first report was 1991 for developing the GCS for adult and P. GCS for children. Traumatic head injury can be open or closed. In open injury, we must take care on injury of temporal superficial artery for controlling the blood loss. That is a very important. In the close is not so. Subgaleal hematoma is not so. Skull fracture. Skull fracture, sorry, I must. Skull fracture are different from penetrating and compressing the press fracture and the aesthetic and mixed fracture from different types. Emer the emergency of skull fracture is mostly the press or compression fracture, but that must be thicker than one centimeter, or the, the, or the uh, fracture diameter must be more than bone skull, or a skull bone. That is, that the dural and sinus injury must be dealt immediately, rapidly, because of strong bleeding and infection. If I come back, it's, it's, here is some. Mm -hmm. That can be a report. We back, back. Where we were? No, I am in other direction. <laughs> By yeah, no. Okay. The <clears throat> brain, different types of brain injury. Brain injury can be a mild traumatic injury or commotio cerebri or concussion. That is a new term, terminology. And you know, compressio cerebri, 
contusions cerebri, and even traumatic subarachnoidal brain injury. This may be occur primary or secondary. Primary is important because it's result of a direct impact to the head, head injury. This can develop different type of intracranial hemorrhage. That is why the head injury, head injury and brain injury are used interchangeably in the uh, uh, medical literature, literature in the world, world literature, medical literal, uh, literature. That is the cause because they are so close to each other. Head injury is the same or result. That is linear Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Okay. The fracture, linear fracture, the aesthetic fracture. Five minutes I have time. Okay, in the fourth. Brain injury. Mm -hmm. Okay. Different types of brain injury. We talk about this. Concussion. Concussion about this. By the way, the first mentioned terminology of concussion, that is a new one, was by Hippocratic. And, but the Persian physician, Muhammad Zakaria Razi, was the first physician who wrote and distinguished the concussion from other brain injuries in the 10th century. If you draw mathematics, that's very rare, 3 to 5 percent, about 5 percent, but very difficult to deal because of overlying and the transverse sinus and close to other sinus, superior, inferior, and such uh, as superior, inferior, and sinus. The most important act by the operation is taking suture, uh, dura, taking suture place to two to two, five centimeter interval and do not take up suture in the middle. That is, could be a case report. Admission was 6 p.m. and You see here, I put a probe. I had someone like probe, and at the beginning, initial CT showed only a very thin subdural hematoma along the tentorium and confluum, not more. After putting insert a brain probe, I let control it after two hours, and that's. Mamilla, corpus mammillaria is that both epidural hematomas. And I operated this, and after one week, transferred to normal stationary, and after 15 days to rehabilitation. Sudral hematoma are only an emergency case if it is thicker than one centimeter or the shifting of midline structure 
to other side is more than one centimeter. By traumatic subarachnoidal hematoma, only if there is an onset of severe headache, tender clap headache requires an urgent surgical intervention. Ventricle, ventricle semi, what, did, what I did before is necessary in general rising the intracranial pressure. Some photos, hmm. solid mass, intracranial blood, uh, blood uh, hematoma with shifting midline, uh, midline and subarachnoid. This is the reversibility of the Miller from Hood. Neurotrauma. I'm sorry, Professor. Can be the uh, last okay. two minutes. Yeah. Okay, good. Few mini, uh, days on the reversibility can be great one. Few hours, great two. Few days on three days. The severe fossa hematoma, they are very rare, but difficult is difficult point is crucial is that over drainage. We must avoid the over drainage because of a very rare upward herniation. That is very important in this case. Okay. See this is dead this injuries and there is a special rule, Cer cervical spine, spinal cord occupies one third and dense one third, and the remaining one third is free space. That is very important in dense fracture with the display displacement anterior, posterior, and like this. That's very important. Anatomical stability. This anatomical uh, structure of stability. Excuse me? I Okay, good, good. Okay. Yes. This is bone, uh, con uh, bone stability uh, and the uh, ligament group A, group 2. Okay. At length to service all, they are. CVC, and that is to date, it's very, very dirty, too. Okay. Different type of stall, or type one, so you can see. Thank you very much. You are welcome. Atlas fracture. Okay, thank you, Professor. So, uh, the next uh, presenter will be Dr. Donny Argy, and uh, he will present about the rural neurosurgical practice in uh, East Nusa Tenggara, Indonesia. Please, Dr. Donny, uh, you have uh, not more than 15 minutes. Please uh, save your time. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Thank you to the committee for the opportunities. I will present an overview of demographic limitations, strategies, and government approach to human resource planning and allocation, uh, rural neurosurgical practice in East Nusa Tenggara. East Nusa Tenggara is the southernmost archipelago province of Indonesia. There is a total of 34 provinces in Indonesia, and East Nusa Tenggara is one of them. The province is subdivided, sub, 
divided into 21 regencies with Kupang as the capital and largest city. It consists of more than 500 islands with the largest one being Flores, Sumba, western part of Timor and Alor. The area of East Nusa Tenggara is more than 47,000 km square with the biggest island is western part of Timor and Flores, Sumba Island, Alor and the others. There are total more than 600 islands located in East Nusa Tenggara. In 2021, more than 5 million people live in East Nusa Tenggara and most, people, most population located in South Central Timor. What is the nature of East Nusa Tenggara? The occupation as a fisherman, farmer, most local people plant corn and coffee. As we know, the East Nusa Tenggara is archipelago province. It consists of more than 500 islands. Local people use food as the main transportation. East Nusa Tenggara is one of the provinces in Indonesia that is still developing. Some aspects are still left behind, such as medical service and facility. There is a total of 49 hospitals in East Nusa Tenggara. Only two hospitals can provide the surgical service, and both are located in Kupang, western part of Nusa Tenggara, uh, western part of Timor, I mean. Only seven cities can distribute throughout East Nusa Tenggara. No MRI facility due to some issues regarding the electrical supply. Another aspect is poverty and low living standard. East Nusa Tenggara is the third poorest province in Indonesia. The living standard of the people is still low. The average income per capita for people in East Nusa Tenggara is about 140 US dollar per month. The infrastructure development in East Nusa Tenggara is still left behind compared with the other provinces in Indonesia. However, many changes have been made to improve the infrastructure on every island, such as the road construction to connect each agency in order to speed up the rehearing process. The neurosurgical service starts since 2014, initiated by one neurosurgeon, no neurosurgical service performed before 2014, all patients refer to the nearest institution such as Bali or South Sulawesi. We work with minimum resources, only one set of craniotomy instrument kit such as manual drill and giggly saw were available at the time. Advanced cases such as some skull based tumor, vascular, we refer to another neurological center due to limited resources. What is the biggest problem? Outnumber patients. Patients from 21 regencies and another province with no neurosurgical facilities were referred to us, so almost two to three operations a day at that time. Only one standard craniotomy set and microscope were available at the time with no advanced neurosurgical instrument. There are two CT scan and no MRI. The next problem is only one neurosurgeon was available at the time to handle all neurosurgical services. The patient refused to take neurosurgical service. Not all patients use public or private health insurance to pay the medical service. Not all patients are well educated about the role of the neurosurgeon. Most East Nusa Tenggara patients believe in shaman or other spiritual beliefs. Even in devastating condition, they still believe that the shaman can solve any disease, both physical and physiological. From our data collect between 2015 to 2018, neurotrauma is the most common cases that we found in East Nusa Tenggara, followed by neurovascular cases, neurooncology, neuropediatric, and neuroinfection. 
the other our data collect uh, in 2018 to 2020 traumatic brain injury still the most common cases that we found in the young age and male single traffic accident is the most common etiology and the patient came with mild KGS score epidural hemorrhage is the most common lesion type and 43% doing surgery and more than 70% in the good outcome so what progress the, that we have made until now we have some strategies and planning to accelerate better service in East Nusa Tenggara education and training for medical personnel every medical personnel must know about the management of conservative and operative in East neurosurgical cases what we do we do medical seminars routinely we also medical webinars visit and train medical personnel make communication with the head of uh, head of districts or head of uh, region and we collaborate with local state university to teach the medical clerkship students it is important to introduce neurosurgery since the earliest time to prepare a professional medical personnel promoting and educating people about the disease and the role of neurosurgery as a part of medical service is one of the pillars for better service using Instagram, Facebook, online newspapers, radio, YouTube, and television talk show. The next distribution of neurosurgical facilities only seven CT scans were distributed throughout East Nusa Tenggara and no MRI facility and until now. Despite of trained medical personnel, the craniotomy instrument kit are not distributed equally. For the example, in Flores Island, we have two hospitals provide a CT scan examination. In Sumba Island, we only have one hospital provide a CT scan examination. In western part of Timor, we have four hospitals. And what can we do? To overcome this issue, we can only keep sounding and promoting the importance of the, this equipment to the public health office and local government through personal meeting and news, although there has been minimum feedback and response. Surgical instruments like trepanation and gigliso are highly needed. There are still many hospitals that do not have these tools. We have collected data from several main hospitals and learned the tool we had in our center to be useful for every trained medical staff in its facility. We also broke in surgical tools distributors to note the tools needed. What kind of facilities that we have now in our institution, of course, basic tool with automatic cranial drill and cranial tomb, and so on. We also advanced to microscope, ultrasonic surgical aspirator, and aneurysm clip set, CM and DSR facility, and spine instrument set. In in a situation where the referral hospital cannot properly manage neurosurgical cases due to one reason or another, the patient can be referred to the neurosurgery center in Kupang. What is the biggest pitfall when referring a patient to our center? One of the things that must be considered the long distance and type of transportation taken to reach the referral hospital. East Nusa Tenggara is an archipelago province with hundreds of islands. This is more challenging until now. And the other point, island in East Nusa Tenggara are arranged by high and low land with uneven cross-regency roads. 
not only land roads, patients from Sumba Island and Flora Island also take sea roads by ship. It took at least one day to reach our center in Kupang. In a situation where the referral hospital cannot properly manage neurosurgical cases, we suggest refer to the neurosurgery center in Kupang. We allocated representatives at each of the main hospital to shorten the time in referring patients to Kupang. These re representatives will be facilitating the communication about patients we will receive at our hospital. It makes it easier for us to profit therapy by supervising the initial action taken before the referral process. Currently, we only have two neurosurgeons located in western part of Timor, not comparable to the population and number of neurosurgical cases that must be handled every day in East Nusa Tenggara. So, we are promoting new neurosurgeon candidate to support the equal distribution program of neurosurgeons, especially in East Nusa Tenggara. Our goal is in 2028, there are seven neurosurgeons that are ready to serve in East Nusa Tenggara. We also routinely make scientific rating to be published in several journals and scientific meetings to be noticed by the government college and own institution to progress that we have made and done. It is some uh, article we have just published in local journal and international journal. We believe good neurosurgical service cannot be separated from government intervention. In Indonesia, there is some program you that, have our, minutes. that our government approach. Contract agreement. Every neurosurgery candidate must, must take an agreement contract to serve in East Nusa Tenggara for at least three years after graduation. The government supports any candidates who are willing to serve in East Nusa Tenggara and that have a good skill and attitude with scholarship program. The promotion of Government health insurance will help people in East Nusa Tenggara community to get proper medical service without thinking about the cost that will be incurred. The government also supports the growth of the neurosurgical service in East Nusa Tenggara by help funding all the facilities and activities. No good service without good funding. What things that the government support? Seminars, webinars, surgical instruments, facilities for diagnostic studies. There is still some issues regarding the funding for MRI and help support other supplemental facilities to each referral hospital to provide better service for you for new neurosurgeon candidates. Conclusion Good neurosurgical service need good support from the government. Although there are still many limitations, neurosurgical service in East Nusa Tenggara will keep developing and serve the community. Collaboration with the government is the main factor to increase the, distrib the distribution of neurosurgical service. Scientific writing and publication are needed to show the progress that we have done. We commit to learn, educate, and serve people in East Nusa Tenggara. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Argy, for a great presentation. And then we move to the last uh, speaker of this session, Dr. Johnny, please. Uh, Dr. Johnny will uh, talk about the management of head injury in developing countries scenario. Please, Dr. Johnny, time is yours, and you have uh, 15 minutes. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good evening for all. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to participate in the very, very interesting moment. Dr. Katab and all of professors, all of uh, colleagues, and all of uh, scholars in Oskuda University. I will present about the traumatic brain injury in low middle income countries, including Indonesia. I want to present, uh, to introduce myself, I am uh, president of 
Indonesia Neurosurgical Society and opportunity director of Dr. Sutomo General Academic Hospital in Surabaya, the biggest hospital in Indonesia and staff of Department Neurosurgery. And when the pandemic COVID occurred in Indonesia, I am ahead of the COVID-19 Curative Task Force. We help a governor of East Java to overcome the pandemic of COVID. The problem of uh, traumatic brain injury in the low middle income country, we can see from this data that most of the traumatic brain injury occur in low medical income country, 80%, 85%. What is the problem? The main problem is uh, dying following several traumatic brain injury more than in the modern country and create the degree of the disability. This is the main problem. Why in the low medical country perform worse in traumatic brain injury management? According to the several literature that I already read, facility and access. For low medical income country, usually more limited access to neurosurgical care and critical care services, like Dr. already said before. Less developed rehabilitation, more limited facilities, like in our countries, missing data and for follow-up. Co inconsistent guideline. Guideline is very important, including in our country. Inconsistent practice of cervical immobilization. You know that immobilization of cervical in the head injury is very important. ICP monitor. ICP monitor is very, very important. But in some of the low-income medical countries, ICP monitor often skip it or inadequate, including in our hospital. Unclear referral system, like Dr. Adi said. Yeah. We can see from our research yeah, that the pre-hospital requirement improvement is very important. Transport of two hospitals, mostly with the private vehicle in low medical income country, including my country, showing a relative low involvement of proper pre-hospital care. We can see here that ambulance only 11%, private vehicle 43%. And the first responder, we can see from this data that almost 77% by uh, member of public. Yeah. Local medical officer only 12%. So that's why the prognostic or the management of the pre-hospital is very important. Distribution in Indonesia population by region, we can see that Indonesia consists of more than 17,000 islands, all of Indonesia. But 56% the population in the Java Islands. Dr. Adi, in this, so only 5.5% the population in Indonesia. So that's why the discrepancy of the population is also followed by the discrepancy of the facilities because uh, we are a very big country and we separate with the many, many islands. Yeah. Health disparities such as high morbidity, three a uh, disease of the brain that is a major problem in our country, head injury, stroke, and brain tumor. Yeah. In developed country, the relation between neurosurgeon and population, ideally one, uh, one neurosurgeon service to 80%. But in Indonesia today, one neurosurgeon should uh, service for 400 and 50 million, 50,000 people. We can see in the distribution of the neurosurgeon mostly in uh, big city like Jakarta and Surabaya. In the remote area, it's very, very rare. What are the cases in, our, in Indonesia? 10 cases in neurosurgical service in Indonesia, we can see that trauma, yeah, trauma, including epidural hematoma, traumatic subdural, and others, and then neoplasm. We can see from this data that the meningioma 
and the most common comparing with glioma. This is challenges for neuro-oncologists. Yeah. Meningoma in our country, more often than uh, glioma. So according to this disease, the surgical procedure or the procedure of neurosurgical services in Indonesia, we can see that craniotomy is more common. Craniotomy. This is our distribution of neurosurgeon. We can already see. Referral system is only a uh, problem, big problem in our country because communication is very difficult among uh, separated islands. We can. So, what should be done? How to overcome this problem? We want to explore opportunity and encourage neurosurgeon to practice in the remote area. We, we can see Dr. Adi in remote area and we can uh, he can develop the neurosurgery services. Introduce policy that reduce barrier and increase access to healthcare. Guideline in the neurosurgery diagnostic and procedure of the value of medicine. So we want to do the best for the, our patients. I want to present in this uh, opportunity, I want to present about my, our hospital. We have the biggest hospital in, in Indonesia, uh, opportunity, this uh, uh, academic hospital. We have the central diagnostic, MRI, CT scan, and others. And then we have an uh, emergency department. This is the green one, it's the, for COVID. Yeah. And then this is the common uh, emergency department. And we also have center operating theater, consists of 22 operating theater, including for neurosurgery. We have 1,701 beds. And this is the emergency service for uh, many, many diseases, like a subdural hemorrhage, intracerebral hemorrhage, acute subdural hemorrhage, acute epidural hemorrhage. This is intensive neurosurgical care and then many diagnostic tool and operating theater, and we also have uh, DSA for angiography and the situation of in our um, uh, central operating theater. And then we develop our guideline, especially for traumatic brain injury, including uh, traumatic brain injury in pregnancy that Dr. Asra already said. And I would like to present in this moment about how to uh, strategy, our strategy for uh, neurosurgery education during COVID and pandemic. We separate uh, with three, three parts of our residents. Today, we have uh, 62 residents. When the COVID occurred in Indonesia, we separate to three parts and they are only uh, one part in the hospital and the other uh, working from home and by telemedicine we can uh, educate them. Okay, thank you very much for your attention and our conclusion is illness are the teachers, people are our priority. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Johnny. Uh, as mentioned earlier by Dr. Kerr that we better move to Another session, and then uh, if there are qu uh, question, keep it in the until the end. Okay, please, Dr. Fahmi, you uh, will uh, chair the session, and then uh, you can go for. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we are now go to the last session. There is, will be uh, two speaker. Will be the first speaker will be Dr. Harry Subianto. He is a epi, epilepsy surgeon. Epilepsy surgeon. He specialist in epilepsy surgeon. He is from Dr. Stomo General Academic Hospital, Airlangga University. Please, Dr. Harry, you can start uh, the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good day, evening, everybody. Thank you so much for the committee for allowing me uh, to share our experience of developing a tertiary epilepsy center in Surabaya. Thank you so much for Dr. Turker. You are very, very excellent. It's, it's difficult for us to eat three times a day. 
<laughs> but you give me three times the meal. Okay, so uh, establishing a comprehensive epilepsy center in Surabaya, Indonesia. I would like to talk the challenge and opportunity. As mentioned before, this is our hospital, General uh, uh, Dr. Sutomo, General Academic Hospital, the highest referral hospital in eastern part of Indonesia, and this is uh, our private hospital, which we also working there to do our functional surgery. And as we know that epilepsy is the third most common neurological disease in this world, and it's affect on uh, around 1.5 to 1 percent population of the world, and around 20 to 40 percent of the patient with epilepsy will remain refractory to medical management, and that's uh, what we are going to cope with this situation. And uh, the other thing, epilepsy surgeries remain underused worldwide. This is also including in the USA. They said that the only less than 1% of the patient with drug resistant epilepsy are referred to the epilepsy center. And the delay is uh, more than 20 years. That is in a modern country. What about we are in low middle income country? That's the problem. Unless WHO has already launched the uh, a campaign, global campaign uh, against epilepsy to close the treatment gap among the countries, but it was launched in 2012, but we are already 10 years, but we still have many problems. As you know, this is Indonesia, the biggest country in the southeast uh, part of the Asia, uh, around 5,100 kilometers from the east to, to west, and then uh, from the south to north, around 1,800 is quite a huge part and with most population in the Jakarta. So we assume that there are around 2.73 million patients with epilepsy, which is 30% will be drug-resistant epilepsy, and could be 50% from this part, around 400,000 could be a surgical a surgery candidate. But on the other hand, we only have two epilepsy centers in Indonesia. We are in this uh, city, Surabaya, the second largest city in Indonesia. So uh, there are one paper also published uh, in 2019, Under Utilization of Epilepsy Surgery in Asian Country. This is also, we are in Indonesia, due to lack of expertise, lack of funding, and lack of facility. As we know that Ile has uh, said that Definition of drug resistant epilepsy, they have consensus that uh, somebody we call drug resistant if uh, drug resistant epilepsy may be defined as failure of adequate trial of two tolerated and appropriately chosen and used AED schedule, whether as monotherapy or in combination, to achieve, seizure, to achieve uh, sustained seizure freedom. We give one uh, year evaluation. So there will be no more confusion whether it is drug resistant or not because the guideline is there. And then we also know that uh, there is a paper, this is randomized trial published in JAMA in 2012, that they doing uh, surgery, best medical treatment, and then surgery with best medical treatment. And they follow up for two years and the result was 0% for medical group alone and 73.3% for surgery, two years. Uh, so this will be improve the quality of the life for the uh, temporal loop epilepsy. And this is also uh, published in New England Journal of Medicine. It was uh, uh, come from the place where I did my fellowship. So surgery with medical therapy in children and the medical therapy alone is 77% versus 7%. So that will increase the quality of life. And many people are afraid, including a soul neurologist, that if you going to surgery, you will have weakness on the left of the side. You will blind, and etc., and etc. So this is a paper published in Journal of Neurosurgery 2014 uh, about surgical complication of uh, epilepsy surgery. Uh, they uh, put into two periods uh, before 95 and uh, 96 to 2012, the group temporal lobectomy, extratemporal invasive electrode, they follow PRISMA guideline, and then the result was this is the transient deficit, permanent deficit, bone infection, hematoma, CSF related. For the temporal case, all almost decrease uh, before and after 95. So 41.8% decrease into 5 to 
to percent in transient dividend and all. So there is no uh, reason for uh, afraid of uh, sending patient to a neurosurgeon. In a good neurosurgeon, I think. So uh, our goal is not only seizure freedom, but we have to consider the quality of life. This paper also showing published in Epilepsia 2014, epilepsy surgery and meaningful improvement in quality of life result from randomized control trial. 80 patient, temporal of epilepsy, 40 medical, 40 surgery. So the significant is more patient in the surgical group achieve meaningful improvement in epilepsy specific measure of quality of life at 6 and 12 months compared to those in the medical group and the number needed to treat is 2, which is, is very significant. And what about cost effectiveness, effectiveness? Because most people are afraid you are going to surgery, uh, there will be many uh, pre-surgical experimentation and there will be many uh, money spent on that uh, uh, procedure. And this also uh, a paper published in journal Epilepsy 95 by Professor Samuel Wibi. Yes, at the beginning it's quite uh, costly, but that will meet at, the cost will equalize at 8.5 year, whether you are doing only med based medical therapy or based medical therapy with surgical. So we have to manage the goal and expectation for surgery, uh, which is the goal is increase quality of life, diminish discipline seizure, and less anti seizure drugs. So surgery will not, uh, I mean, after surgery, you don't need to take medication. That's false. That's usually what neurologists have in their mind that uh, after surgery, you don't need to take any medication. That's false also. So by that, we are trying to uh, build our comprehensive epilepsy center level 3. This is the service provided. We have to, we have electrodiagnostic EG and all, and then the personal also. And then uh, we are following this guideline. We, all patients with drug resistant epilepsy, we do MRE with specific protocol for epilepsy. And we are also doing video EG monitoring. Uh, when patient become, we found mesial temporal scoliosis benign to more where it is concordant between MRE, semiology, and then uh, concordant we do uh, surgery, but when it is not concordant, we do invasive uh, EEG with uh, scalp, uh, uh, el electrocortical EEG. And uh, this is also where MRI uh, not showing any concordant, we do repeat MRI with treated slab protocol. And I want to show that this is the work of neuroradiologists, this is the work of neurologists, this is the work of nuclear imaging, and this is the work of neurosurgeons. So there is no superman here. This is super team. That's why it's quite difficult to build this uh, third level epilepsy center. And then what are available in our uh, hospital? Uh, first, we have semiology. We have to analyze the semiology by home video that's sent by the patient. Uh, and then we proceed to extended AG, ital p 2 eg in epilepsy monitoring unit, and then we, are, we have brain imaging, MRI epilepsy protocol, T-Tesla, and also PET scan. And we are also doing neuropsychology test. When it's all concordant, we can proceed to do surgery. When it's not concordant, then we have to wait. Now, uh, this is our uh, team and facility. This is our epilepsy monitoring unit. Uh, we have five days in uh, a week. Uh, to do long-term ictal video monitoring, and we have also extended protocol for five to six hour evaluation. And then this is, uh, can we play this one? Because this is uh, quite important why we have to understand the semiology when it's come at the beginning, patient become uh, uh, see uh, inverted head inversion to the left, and then after that force to the right, we can see left hand automatism, and then we can see dystonic posturing of the right hand, and it's all concordant with the uh, uh, uh, seizure that comes from T3 and T5. This is important. This is uh, uh, this one important. This video is important. Uh, head inversion to the left, uh, automatism of the left hand, and then this left head inversion to the left, automatism at the left hand and then dystonic posturing of the right hand and it's all also concordant with both uh, games into uh, uh, EEG result and based on this this is our first uh, cases 2017 and 18 so based on that evaluation uh, 
the, we have uh, impact of, of long term. At, at least we can classify the seizure. And then the second, we can change diagnosis. And then the most important is anti epileptic drug modification. Medic, uh, modification. Uh, because by uh, extensive evaluation, we know that this uh, kind of drug is not, import, uh, is not suitable with this kind of uh, seizure, so we change. That's the impact. So this is not only for uh, epilepsy uh, presurgical evaluation only. And at, this, at, the first, at the very beginning, it's only three patients that we are proceed to surgery and we send to this long-term vital video EG monitoring. And what is the result? This patient are now almost five years with uh, seizure free uh, after surgery. And what due to very large area of Indonesia to cover, we ask parents sometimes to make a video, home video like this patient. Uh, this is typical of temporal uh, uh, seizure when patient has uh, oral, uh, oral automatism and then uh, left hand dystonic and right hand automatism. And then they send to us, and then we ask patient to do a specific MRI in our center, and we can find this is hippocampal sclerosis. And this is what uh, we, I, I call arterial spin labeling. We can see that there is uh, some hypovascularity, we call it, or, or sometimes in the right temporal, and we do surgery. And then the result also uh, two years uh, seizure free. Uh, we have also patient database file in Surabaya. We also have a microsurgery technique. Uh, to do minimal invasive because why it's important because sometimes patients uh, feel no cure to too high uh, very wide uh, incision at the scalp they feel i'm not cured anymore because do very large uh, incision area that's why we develop to make a small incision and it's only around eight centimeter incision and then two centimeter craniotomy but we can do uh, uh, normal excision, optimal excision of the uh, pathological substrate. Uh, this is typical for uh, epilepsy surgeon, but I think we can pass it because. Uh, and then this is, we, we also check the histopathology that showing focal cortical dysplasia type 1B. And one month after surgery, almost difficult to see where is the scar. So with this technique, Operation time become less, and then bleeding volume become less, risk infection less, uh, post-surgical pain minimal, and wound healing better. And scar formation minimal, and length of stay become three to five days in the hospital. We also perform palliative procedure for post-infarct, hemispheric cortical dysplasia, hemimic, should we bear, Rasmussen, hemiatropy, post-encephalitic. We are performing endoscopic hemispherotomy and endoscopic corpus callosotomy. This is a paper that we write together with Professor Sarah Chandra. Uh, for endoscope assisted uh, interhemispheric transcalosal hemispherotomy, where parents overall being expressed uh, express being very satisfied with the result compared to the normal endoscopic hemispherotomy with the open procedure, patient quite happy with the cosmetic result, less scalp swelling. They also express a subjective feeling of relief on small size of the scalp incision following surgery. And one minute, one minute left. Okay. Uh, we are also performing uh, uh, stereotactic radiofrequency thermocoagulation for hypothalamic hematoma, and this is surgery. And the challenge, what's the challenge? Challenge is insurance coverage. As we know, we have in Indonesian government uh, insurance, and then pay for service. Also, uh, it's quite difficult to have a scientific discussion among the department due to uh, every department tend to keep their patient. I tend to keep my patient because uh, government will pay if I have many patients. Once I send to neurosurgery for some reason, they are afraid of uh, uh, their, their uh, income will less than for. And then referral system, wet area to cover and then facility. Uh, but the other barrier in epilepsy surgery actually comes from the neurologist. We have one paper here to epilepsy surgery, a survey among practicing neurologists. Uh, it was published in Epilepsia 2020, where they said that uh, the majority of Italian neurologists have highly variable attitude toward epilepsy surgery, reflect in, reflecting in reflecting ambivalence and uncertainty, uncertainty toward this type of treatment. Uh, that's why. Uh, this mainly due to difference in handling pharmacologic treatment information regarding epilepsy surgery which affect their attitude. That's why we need to reinforcing the concept of pharmacoresistant and associated risk. So uh, sometimes we don't always get it right, process delay, 
uh, as we can see that this is a paper published in uh, epilepsy also uh, sometimes uh, patient and parents are sometimes are very slow recognition something is wrong and then searching and finding and then surgery a viable option usually they say that surgery is the last resort uh, uh, never test that surgery should be not the last resort but we have to offer at the first when a patient met criteria of direct accident epilepsy and then after we perform epilepsy surgery life now is uh, like a new life giving back life for the patient and family so we, uh, strategy we have purple day we have epilepsy campaign and then this is for neurologists and then this is for a, a community campaign and then uh, in our center we have extensive evaluation uh, 2017 to mid 2012 with total 421 we do extensive evaluation uh, with extended EG, ictal video EG, MRI and including PET scan and surgery is only 3% from the all uh, of the uh, population because we are we want to have the good candidate for surgery with with good result of uh, surgery. So the conclusion is epilepsy should be treated in a multidisciplinary team. Uh, start with a good prognostic patient, concordant among semiology, clinical neuro, electrophysiology, neuroradiology imaging, and we have to bridging the gap between limited resources country. Actually, I hope that uh, Dr. Katep will uh, give us opportunity to have uh, contact with uh, neuromodulation uh, like Medtronic or Livanova because it is important to do neuromodulation in epilepsy which is uh, very expensive uh, in our country. Thank you so much. Thank you very much Dr. Harry. And the last speaker will be me. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Tefzat Tarhan. Thank you, Dr. Katep, Dr. Turkar, for the and for the opportunity to share about uh, brain lesioning in Parkinson disease. Uh, as we know, like we know that many country that uh, avoid brain lesioning now in this era, many country develop the deep brain stimulation, not brain lesioning again. Yeah, but uh, we know the problem in Parkinson disease. Yeah. This is a physical problem, movement limitation like bradykinesia, rigidity, tremor, physics uh, problem, depression, anxiety, social unconfident, and others, economic and family problem, and other problem. Until now, there is no cure available for Parkinson disease, but we can decrease the symptom with medication, physiotherapy, psychological, exam psychological intervention, and surgery. And for the surgery, like uh, yesterday, uh, Dr. Akin already speak about uh, deep brain stimulation, and now I will talk about a stereotactic brain lesion. Medication limitation will be increased the dose by the time and frequency. For that, will be increased the cost, of, of course, yeah? and then by the time the Parkinson will be shorter on period by the time, and the Parkinson disease patient have dyskinesia problem if they consume the uh, medication for a long time. And how about deep brain stimulation? It is not new. Yeah? If we look in the journal in Neurosurgical Focus, uh, Marwan Harris uh, already write that deep brain stimulation between 1947 and 1987, there is untold story. It means there is DBS not new. The DBS have advantage to stabilize and lengthen the on period of Parkinson disease, decrease medication, dose and frequency, and the special ad, uh, ad, uh, advance of the deep, deep brain stimulation is adjustable. It is adjustable. By the time if the Parkinson disease decrease, it can still adjust. But deep brain stimulation have limitation. High cost, not always covered by insurance, better replacement, increase the infection rate, rejection, cosmetic, and implant problem. Uh, although it is rare, disconnection, shorting, connection, lead fracture, better exposed, and others. And how about stereotactic brain lesioning? It is lower cost. Yeah? No implant needed, shorter surgical time, no battery replacement, but it still have limitation. One set treatment or sequential, it means we cannot do it uh, bilaterally, bilaterally uh, one time. Uh, how, and it, it is still 
question about recurrency and it makes permanentation. It means must be accurate and precise like that. It is the history of Parkinson's disease intervention history. Uh, in the 19th century, early stereotactic equipment, and then 1950, uh, ablative surgery yeah, by Irving S. Cooper, and 1960, advent of L-DOPA, and then 1985, it is resurgence of pallidotomy because the effect of L-DOPA. And then late 1980, there is invention of the DBS by Alim Luis Binebit, and uh, 2010 century, there is a magnetic resonance guiding uh, focus ultrasound. I call this from uh, conservative lesioning to modern lesioning, still lesioning. It is the kind of stereotactic brain lesioning in PD. VIM thalamotomy for tremor, VO thalamotomy for focal dystonia, especially in the distal part, subthalamotomy uh, for Parkinson's disease, but it has effect adverse effect of like uh, hemibalism, hemibalism, and campotomy, yeah, campotomy, pallidotomic tract of 4 h one lesion, and GPA pallidotomy. And the most frequent brain lesion now, it is uh, GPA pallidotomy and film thalamotomy. This is the rationalization of GPA pallidotomy to decrease the hyperactivity of GPA that happen in Parkinson's disease. And this is the rationalization of uh, VM thalamotomy, one of the rationalization. Uh, in our center, there is uh, from 2013, we start this uh, surgery in Indonesia from 2013 and until now, there is nine years, we have uh, 2,158 patients with uh, 8,633 outpatient visit. But from that patient, we just have 12.8% for surgery and most of them 88% is brain lesion. How it perform? We do it with uh, a week, a week surgery. We give uh, stimulation, yes, stimulation, and then we give the trial lesion. It means temporary lesion. If the result is good, we continue to permanent lesion. It is 75 degrees Celsius in 30 seconds. This is the video during surgery. During we implant the electrode, micro electrode, before the lesioning, the tremor already, already stopped. It means we are in the right place. Yeah? And then after, if we sure the tremor already stopped, we give the, uh, we give the trial lesion, 45 degrees Celsius in 30 seconds. And then if the result is good, we continue to the permanent lesion is about 75 degrees Celsius in 30 seconds. We evaluate all of the response during surgery. This is before surgery, patient still tremor, and this is after surgery. The tremor uh, decreased. Yeah. Uh, and this is we evaluate during surgery too, this patient with uh, left, left hand tremor and dyskinetic tremor. We do the right uh, VO, VIM, thalamotomy complex to decrease the tremor. And this is another evaluation during surgery. We bring the equipment that patients have difficulty to do during the, the, during the activity daily living, and we test during surgery. And the result is good. Yeah. How about the, the target? The target for GPI, globus pallidus internus, is posteroventrolateral of the GPI. This is the optimal target, just above the optic tract. It means it must be very accurate and precise. Uh, in the 2013, we still do bilaterally, but now we avoid do this, doing this because uh, we worried about the complication. This uh, bilateral just above the optic tract. This is the lesion, millimeter lesion. It is before and after uh, pallidotomy. Before surgery, the patient have bradykinesia, rigidity, and uh, tremor. Yeah. Patient difficult to turn the body. Yeah, difficult to walk, and we perform this patient with bilateral uh, pallidotomy, but sequential, subsequential. It means now in the left and one year again in the in the right. It is after surgery. After surgery, the patient free movely, yeah, uh, free moving and happy, yeah, happy. The patient happy, no no rigidity, no bradykinesia. It's happened all of the day not just on and off. 
Yeah. If we know the patient Parkinson have on and off, but this is happen after surgery all of the day. Uh, and how about VIM thalamotomy that we have done for tremor? We do the thala thalamotomy like this. Uh, this is before and after. Before surgery, the resting tremor is very very severe, and this is after after surgery. After surgery, the tremor has dis disappeared, and we are now follow up the patient uh, about uh, nine years. And this is campotomy, or we call palidotalamo palidotalamic tract lesion Minute, yeah. in for H1. Yeah, yeah. This is my yeah. And this is after surgery. Yeah, yeah this is sekarang before surgery. Kiri. The patient have rigidity, yeah. and this Buka, is betul. patient send me the video from the Sulit, this mobile. Yeah. It is freely moving. Yeah, yeah. And for conclusion, brain lesion still has a role for Parkinson's disease in this era. I think yeah. uh, the result depend uh, patient diagnosis, treatment decision, target selection, accuracy, and adverse effect avoidance, and hope and reality. We must make a same expectation between the doctor and the patient because this is not cure the, par the not cure the parkinson but improve the quality of life every patient different it is an art okay thank you very much assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh dr fahmin thank you for that great presentation and we can get the question we can have the questions if there's any question and after the yeah after the questions we will be heading to uh, the shuttles to go to the uh, campus of our university central campus to visit the research centers for just 15 minutes. Then we will be driving to uh, the dinner to Nakash. So we have time for the questions. Dr. Fahmi, please. Yeah, uh, please, Dr. Katar. Actually, rather comment because um, pallidotomy is no longer done in the U.S. because, you know, the problem with pallidotomy is, as you said, if you do bilateral pallidotomy, you're going to have real uh, complications. The patient lose uh, ability to swallow and so on. So, and unilateral pallidotomy, if you go lateral, gives 25% coverage, as you know, on the other side. But uh, what, why don't you do uh, deep brain stimulation? Yeah, thank you very much. That is a good question, Dr. Kateb. It is. Uh, Deep brain stimulation come to our country is about uh, 2014, just come to our country. Uh -huh. We start the deep brain stimulation in two, 2 January of 2014, and it is now still high cost in our country, very high cost, yeah, the, the deep brain stimulation. Many patients cannot afford the deep brain stimulation, and some of them uh, in our culture, sometimes the patient didn't want to implant something to his body, uh, and the but patient still have an effort, adverse effect for the medication like on off. Uh, Sometimes the patient had uh, ten times medication. That uh, we are give a choose the pallidotomy, yeah, like that. But we still I offer mean, the, the DBS. The problem with pallidotomy is that uh, see when you're burning one side of the brain, brain plasticity occurs and actually the other side takes over. So the Parkinson's come back. A Ex clear example of that, that is pallidotomy is back is Michael J. Fox. You know, the, the, the actor. There's a big Michael J. Fox Foundation. They have $300 million for Parkinson's disease. So my recommendation to you, I mean, like, because for immediate is good, but then when you do this, uh, the patient cannot get DBS. So maybe we could put this on the agenda that you guys could talk to your uh, uh, World Bank person to get money to get you more uh, uh, DBS. But pallidotomy, I'm not sure it's a good idea. Yeah. It's cheap is, is, is possible, but that's just my comment. Yeah, thank you. I hope you can help to decrease the cost to the DBS. Thank you very much, Dr. Katip. Another you, question? Sir. Yes. Okay, please. Uh, uh, I'm going to ask a question from Dr. Azra. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Dr. Azra talk about the pregnant TBI cases. I have two suggestions. The first suggestion is that 
do, do you have any follow-up for your patients? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, do you yeah. have cohort even monitoring? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. For yeah. some patients, not all. Yeah, because uh, we have limited, you know, limited number, I think, is we have only 12 cases, I think. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, and you follow the children? For neurodevelopmental disorders. Oh yeah, yeah. For for the baby, no. Yeah, <laughs> we uh, just yeah. follow the yeah, yeah. The uh, my suggestion is is better okay, okay. you follow you. up the babies because yes. the mother traumatic brain injury can affect the neurodevelopment yeah, yeah. in babies. It's a very important. Yes, yes. Uh, and another suggestion Thank you. is Good point. that the, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, in your table I saw you report the live and uh, the, the live and this. Yeah. My suggestion is you can uh, add another parameter or another uh, another uh, variable. For example, epilepsy, quality of life, drug addiction, and and so on. Yeah. And um, my uh, uh, last question is that you said uh, you don't use the phenytoin for mothers, okay? But but. Uh, what is another drug that you use for? Yes, uh, actually, uh, uh, but uh, phenytoin, you mean phenytoin? Yeah, yeah. you phenytoin. mentioned we yeah. don't use the phenytoin. Yeah. But you use phenobarbital, valproic acid, and yeah. which one do you use? Yeah, you know that uh, the, the tri triatogenic effect of the phenytoin is, is the, the first trimester of the pregnancy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Three minutes. So we avoid that in the treatment. Try to avoid that. But if uh, it is necessary, so we have to save the mother first. This is our, our, uh, you know, our goal of the treatment. But if uh, there is uh, no strong indication to uh, use uh, uh, anti seizure, so we try to not use that. Yeah. Something Thank like you. That. I have a question oh. from Sabonchia. Okay, maybe Professor this the, the yeah. last question. Uh, what? Yeah, the what? last question. Yes, Please. yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, you presented the outcome of epilepsy surgery based on, on the literature, especially systematic review and meta-analysis. The outcome of improvement 85%, but it depends on different variables. For example, the rehabilitation and the case selection. Because sometimes in during the LTM long-term monitoring, we omit the, we, we we couldn't be able to select the the exact patient, and it can affect or your outcome. In Iran, um, uh, apart the neurosurgery, we follow the patient and help them in neuro rehabilitation. For example, nutrition, psychology, and so on. I think. If you can do it in your country or your institution, uh, your outcome can be better. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, the paper that I saw in my presentation is uh, for temporal lobe epilepsy, whether we are doing early temporal uh, lobectomy or late temporal lobectomy. So for the, uh, this randomized control trial, where th that is the highest level in the uh, scientific paper, so the result is 73.3%. And yes, uh, that's why our surgical uh, case, only 3% among all our uh, evaluation, among our, all our patient population, only 3% which has good candidate for surgery, and then we proceed to do surgery. And the outcome also showing ILE grade uh, A, 1A, 1A, which is no uh, seizure at all. That's why for the others, we can modify the drugs uh, choice and then we can uh, ask them because we also working with the neuropsychiatrist also we are working with neuro rehabilitation we are working with uh, dietitian uh, they will suggest they will uh, ask them to uh, to get ketogenic diet and all so in the uh, uh, uh, specific view of a neurosurgery uh, we have to choose the best uh, candidate for surgery not all a good candidate for epilepsy surgery and uh, that's why we are we have to build a super team, not superman. <laughs> because sometimes you will burn all the burden to a neurosurgeons because we already okay. have okay. at all. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. This is uh, closing the session. Thank you very much, all of the professor and all the of the doctors. It's a great uh, seminar. Thank you very much. I back to Dr. Turker, please, Dr. Turker. Okay, okay. We go to the in front of the building.
Yeah, Satal. Okay, thank you. Yok çünkü. O zaman mutlu bir halk ilişkileri uzmanı olmak için neden Üsküdar Üniversitesi'ni tercih ettiğimden bahsedeyim size. Bölümde insanların neden ve nasıl iletişim kurduklarından başlayarak medyanın insan ve toplumlara etkisini, devletlerin, kurumların ve markaların işleyişini ve dev halkla ilişkiler kampanyalarını 